Hello, my name is Jaru. Today I'm talking about Deltarune. There will be major spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale, so please play them both before watching this. Today I will be doing something a little bit different. Instead of discussing a theory, I will instead be doing a full lore playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 1. What's a lore playthrough? Well, it's like a regular playthrough in that I will be playing through the game and giving my live commentary, but in addition, I will be analyzing every tiny detail in Chapter 1 and discussing what it could mean for the greater lore, the story, and the characters, while also pointing out how all these details could fit into my own theories. I've made several theory videos on my channel, and while I am pleased with all of them, there were lots of tiny details and evidence that I failed to discuss or address at the time. So part of the goal of this playthrough is to fill in the holes in some of those theories while also reinforcing them with further evidence. But don't worry, even if you totally dislike my theories, I still give lots of interesting analysis during this playthrough that is completely independent of those theories. That said, something important to keep in mind is that this is a live commentary that I did while playing through the game, which means that while this intro sequence you're watching right now is in fact scripted, the playthrough portion of this video is not scripted. I think you'll find this enjoyable as I'm very relaxed and casual and have a lot of fun discussing the characters and story during this playthrough, but the downside of not having a script is that I do tend to ramble and stutter and have to rephrase things due to me being nervous. The good news is that since this is a very laid back and slow paced playthrough, you can absolutely just put this video on in the background while you do other things. Unlike my theory videos, this is designed to be casually listened to over a long period of time. It does not require your undivided attention. Also, this is my first time recording a playthrough of a video game using OBS, so if you notice any oddities in the audio, that's why. I think I did a pretty good job considering this is my first time ever doing this sort of thing, but I'll let you guys be the judge. With all that explanation out of the way, there's just one more thing I need to discuss before we get to the playthrough. Fan art! <laughs> After I showed off the fan art I received last video, you wonderful people absolutely buried me in new fan art, and I am extremely excited to show it off. First up is this piece in which we see Asriel puppeting Chris, which I really like. I love the way the strings are coming out of Chris's chest. They even included the jello knife, which is hilarious. And I think this might actually be hand drawn, in which case that's really impressive. Next, we have this awesome piece in which Chris is wielding the twisted sword while wielding the sky mantle. The artist designed the sword to look like a type of real life weapon called a Chris, meaning Chris is wielding a Chris. <laughs> I love it. Uh, next is this godly piece of art in which they took this picture of Link looking at a gaster version of Navi that I had in my last video and redrew it with Chris in their bedroom. This just makes me feel happy and I don't even know why. <laughs> Amazing work. Next, we have this amazing piece depicting Chris shortly after stabbing Asriel, and I just love this one to death. There's so much effort poured into this, it's insane. There's this posters of this cat and Ice E in the back, there's the chalk on the cupboard, Chris is wearing their demon horns, and Asriel is just straight up T-posing on the ground. Throw in Chris's huge eyeball, and this piece is one of the most morbidly hilarious things I've ever seen. It's also super bright and colorful and just really well made. Fantastic art. Next, we have some more hand-drawn pieces, including this first piece with Chris stabbing Asriel, which is great, and then a collage of various characters in this second piece, which includes Oberon Smog on the far right. I really like these, and I really respect the effort of doing this all hand-drawn. 
Next is this really cool rendition of the Twisted Sword, Sky Mantle, and Shadow Mantle. The colors on this are really pretty, the pixel art design is super cool, and I absolutely adore the Twisted Sword's design. The spiral blade just looks so sick, and I love how all of these have a pure crystal worked into their design. Really sweet stuff. Next, we have an actual animated gif of Chris wielding the Twisted Sword and Sky Mantle. Holy cow, man! How sick is that? I was already flattered to receive fan art, but fan animations as well? You have no idea how cool this is for me. Thank you so much. Speaking of cool, next is this set of drawings of Chris wearing the shadow and sky mantles, and can I just say, this art style is absolutely gorgeous. I'm super flattered that anyone would be inspired enough by my videos to make art, but to see someone make art this beautiful as a result of my silly theories actually gets me feeling rather emotional. It's such an honor, and I cannot begin to express my gratitude. And if all this wasn't incredible enough, someone actually used my Ganondorf icon as inspiration to design avatars for me to use in my videos. Look at all these! They made a ton of them with different expressions and even threw in a spooky Gaster avatar as well. And wh what can I even say at this point? This absolutely blows my mind. This artist didn't even ask for any money for this, even though they absolutely deserve it. Instead, they just asked that I link their Patreon, so that is exactly what I'm doing. Not only can you find it in the description down below, but here's what their Patreon looks like, so that way you know you found the right one. In fact, if any of you out there are looking to commission art, I would just like to point out that a sizable chunk of the artists I've featured thus far are willing to take commissions, and it would make me very happy if they could get some business as a result of this video. It's the absolute least I could do. And once again, I thank you all. Side note, this same artist also made a couple hilarious meme edits using my Ganondorf sprite as inspiration, so I'll go ahead and put those on screen. They're really freaking funny. <laughs> oh man. And lastly, if you thought me getting fan art and fan gifts and fan memes wasn't incredible enough, then how about a fan song? That's right. This beautiful human being made a theme song for Oberon Smog. They even have this cool music video in which they use the Oberon Smog sprite. How incredible is that? Music means the world to me, as I grew up in a very musical household. So someone composing a song in my honor is the most incredible thing anyone has ever done for me. I am speechless. I would really appreciate it if you guys could give this channel a look and give him some subscribers, as he makes a lot of awesome Deltarune-inspired music and remixes of existing songs, and they deserve far more support than they currently have. The link to their channel is down in the description. Please give them some support and tell them Jaru sent you. And with that, I've covered all the fan content that's come out that I've seen thus far. If anyone else would like to show me some fan art, you can absolutely send it to me on my Twitter or on my Reddit, both of which are linked on my YouTube channel. Thank you all again for all this art. I know lots of YouTubers get fan art, so maybe this seems like a dull topic, but to me, this art had me literally jumping for joy. So thank you. And side note, I recorded this audio early in the morning, so I may sound a little less enthusiastic than I should, but please know, I was absolutely ecstatic every time I saw a single new piece of art, from the most simple of, of meme edits to these music videos, all of it means the world to me, and I cannot thank you enough. And with that, it is now time for my lore playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 1. Please enjoy. The beginning.
I'm gonna turn down that audio just a little bit. It's a bit too loud. Legend of Light, the dark. This is the legend of Delta Rune, and we're gonna skip that. That is the very first interesting detail. The way that it says Delta Rune. They didn't do that in Undertale. So, oh, this song is so beautiful. Um, so, yeah, right off the gate, the very first detail that is worth pointing out is the fact that it says in a voice, Delta Rune, on the title screen. And that's interesting, because it didn't do that in Undertale, which would imply to me that that is a character speaking. Uh, who? I'm not sure. This could absolutely work into my uh, Gerson theory with the fact that uh, he is the only character in this series thus far to, to speak aloud the words Delta Rune. So it's entirely feasible that that is hinting towards him being the knight. Uh, the fact that, you know, it's spoken again here. Uh, interesting. Um, I'm not entirely certain how to get it to show the original save menu. Um, but the idea, the, on the original menu, it did not show the, this background animation with the characters and the fountain. Uh, instead, it just showed a black background with a green text that made it look like an old school computer. And even the reactions, like the, like, copy, choose a file to copy, it can't be copied. Like, it would say something different right there at the it can't be copied part. And it says it in a very peculiar way, the way it reacts to your commands. And... The consensus is that it sounds a lot like the entity that talks to you at the start of the first chapter. The entity that helps you build the uh, vessel. Um, so there's a lot of theorizing that this is somehow involving Gaster or like it's Gaster's computer or he's interacting with something through a computer or something along those lines. We really don't know at this point. Um, but... Yeah, I wanted to show you that, but I don't know how, so uh, we're just going to move on. <laughs> There's not much to say about it. It's interesting, but it's uh, it's gaster lore, which means there's not much we can deduce about it at this point. Uh, so let's just start a file. All right, here it comes. So this character... This character seems to have also been the one who took over Twitter or uh, Toby Fox's Twitter specifically, for a brief while. In which it talks about, it, it quotes Gaster a lot, which is why a lot of people think this thing is Gaster. Um, are we connected? That's interesting, for a variety of reasons. Are we connected across worlds? Are we connected through our souls? Are we connected through some sort of internet connection? What does connection mean in this context? We don't know, <laughs> but there's a lot of possibilities. We may be in. And the theory, uh, there's, oh, and I should probably mention the red soul. Uh, you saw that red soul there, the red heart. Um, there's a lot of theories surrounding what that, that heart is. Um, and the most, the, the fact that we're controlling this red heart in the intro sequence is used by a lot of people to assume and conclude that this red soul is the same red soul that is inside of Chris. And thus, since this soul and that soul are the same, that means Chris is connected to Gaster somehow, and and then Gaster is somehow connected to Kara, and then it just keeps going. But the issue with that line of logic is that we don't actually know whose soul this is. Uh, while it is possible that it's Chris's soul, um, in human civilization, there's countless humans with countless souls, and it's inevitable that there's going to be some souls that have to share the same color. And, in fact, uh, it's heavily implied in Undertale that both Frisk and Kara had the same color soul. Um, this is implied because Kara's coffin in the castle has a red heart on it. And it's all the other coffins have the correct color heart to match the souls that go with that coffin. So that would suggest that Kara's original soul was red. So 
right out the gate, even just in Undertale, that's two characters with the same color soul. And then there's Chris, who has a third. And then there's this soul. Uh, this soul might belong to Frisk from Undertale, Kara from Undertale. It might belong to Chris from Deltarune. Or it might be a completely different character. For example, this, this red soul could very well belong to the Deltarune version of Kara. Um, now, I know what you're thinking, but Jaru... Uh, this intro sequence immediately transitions from this to us controlling Chris. Doesn't that imply that these are connected somehow? Um, and yes, it would in another game. But, <laughs> but in this game, I'm not so convinced. Because in Undertale, which was also made by Toby Fox, uh, the beginning intro sequence of Undertale shows a flashback of... Uh, uh, of a human child climbing the mountain and then falling into the underground. And immediately after they fall into the underground, it cuts to us controlling Frisk. Uh, the implication and the intended effect of that intro sequence is to make us think that that was that Kara, or that that human who fell down into the mountain in that flashback was Frisk and that we were controlling them. And that was just our backstory for how we came here. But that's not the truth. In reality, that intro sequence in Undertale was actually Kara. That was Kara's origin story. And then, after Kara falls down, the, or the flashback ends, and we cut to the present day, where we're controlling Frisk. So, right out the gate, uh, that intro sequence uh, was a misleading. It was a trick. And uh, we know it was a trick. I discussed this at length in some of my other videos. But, uh, basically, we know it was a trick because it lists the date. Oh, I think it lists the date 1990X? Or maybe it was 21X. No, 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 it was 21, or yeah, it was 21X or 2000X. I forget. Point is that it lists a date with an X <laughs> at the start of that flashback intro in Undertale. And that date is later confirmed to be when Kara fell into the underground, not when Frisk. So, point I'm getting at is that the intro sequence with Kara had nothing to do with Frisk. So it's entirely possible that this intro sequence with the goners and the select the head you prefer, uh, it's entirely possible that this has absolutely nothing to do with Chris. In fact, I'm personally leaning towards that. I think this is very much meant to get theory crafters spinning in their spinning in their tracks, going down the wrong path. I think this is a this is a bait. This is a red herring. Um, well, red herring's not the correct term. I think this is important. I just don't think it's important in the way people think it is. I think it's more likely that this has something to do with the Delta Rune version of Kara or the Delta Rune version of some other human than it does to do with Chris at this point in time. Um, of course, that's just my opinion. But uh, point is, we don't know whose soul this is. We don't know if it's Chris's. We don't know if it's someone else's entirely. Um, although that does remind me, another theory that I often see people suggesting and which I don't agree with at all, is the idea that the player has a soul. Like, just, it's not a soul they're possessing or controlling, it's just their soul. And, like, that Frisk didn't have a soul, and it was just our soul. The red soul in Undertale is our soul, and the red soul we're controlling in Deltarune is also our soul. And that, that it's the same soul across game files and etc. Across video games. And I don't agree with that at all. I think that's misunderstanding the idea of what the player is in this game. The player is not a character. The player is not in this world. The player is the player. I am the player. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my soul is not up for grabs, no matter how much Toby Fox may pretend it is otherwise. Um, so it's I, I, the player is not involved in this world. We control things in this world because we're playing a video game. <laughs> but we're not in the world. We're not in the code of this game. Um, so the idea of us having a soul in this game feels wrong. Um, it's like it's the same reason that we have to control a character. We aren't actually in this world. So we have to pick a character to influence and manipulate and control because we can't do anything on our own. So there's that. Uh, let's progress. Uh, I'm just going to use the default option for these. Select the torso that you prefer. Select the legs that you prefer. Um, I will point out, it's something interesting about this, is that in the game files, it refers to this intro sequence as being 
uh, is being involving a goner maker. And that's actually really interesting, not necessarily for Deltarune, but more so for Undertale. Because in Undertale, we often encounter these black and white uh, monochrome entities called the Gaster Followers, and also there's the Goner Kid, and they all seem to be cut of the same cloth, but we had no idea really what they were. We barely knew what Gaster was, and we knew basically nothing about these Goners. So this actually does give us some insight, because now we know that these Goners are creations of Gaster, or whoever this person is. Um, they are entities that you can manufacture somehow. Like, this background that we're seeing, this warped, distorted, rippling aura, whatever this is, this is inside some sort of machine, presumably. Um, if it's not inside a machine, then that means Gaster is just conjuring this body out of thin air with some other sort of magical technology. Uh, whatever the case, uh, this is a creation, which is very interesting. And you'll notice in a moment, yeah, we'll say we accept it, uh, excellent. Apparently Gaster, or whoever this is, loves to say excellent. Create a wonderful form. Now, let us shape its mind as your own. Okay, so that's the next interesting detail. Not only can we control what its body looks like, but we can also control what its mind is. And that's very interesting. That says to me that these Gaster followers that we encounter in Undertale are, in fact controlled and programmed by Gaster himself. Um, which means that it's quite possible he has an army of underlings who are working to help him in some way. Like, we find one of them saying, holding a piece of Gaster in its hand, which could be implying that maybe these Gaster followers, these, these goners, have, are on a quest to reacquire all the pieces of Gaster and put them back together. Or something similar uh but either way since they're programmed gay by gaster and they talk about gaster it seems logical that they would serve gaster um which is very interesting uh and what's also interesting is that in undertale in undertale it made sense that uh Gaster only appeared in certain playthroughs because he'd been shattered across time and space. So his pieces only showing up occasionally made sense because he's only his pieces only exist in certain timelines or certain pieces only exist in certain timelines. But the Gaster followers were more confusing because we were like it was actually a valid possibility at the time to think that the Gaster followers and the Goner Kid were actually pieces of Gaster somehow. Uh, because we just didn't have any other explanation for what they were. But now we do. And now that we do, it actually implies that those goner, Gaster followers who just teleport away when you're done talking to them and only appear in certain timelines, it implies that they have the active ability to hop between realities. Or perhaps it's not an active ability so much as an involuntary ability. Maybe they have to, like, maybe they're, like, in a state of... Uh, temporal uh, instability, where they constantly are popping in and out of alternate timelines. Um, whatever the case, uh, having an army of minions who you've programmed, who are capable of hopping across time and space, that's a very powerful ability to have. Uh, a, pretty, a very powerful asset. So... Gaster clearly has a lot going on. Of course, that barely has anything to do with Deltarude. Um, although, I should point out that uh, the fact that we're making this character in Deltarune heavily suggests that there is a Gaster of some sort in Deltarune. Now, some people think there's just one Gaster, but I would have, since there's duplicates of all the other characters, it seems reasonable to me that there would be two Gasters at play here. There's the Undertale Gaster and the Deltarune Gaster. Some people theorize that uh, because Undertale Gaster was shattered across time and space, that every version of Gaster in every timeline has also been shattered. I don't personally buy into that. I think that attributes too much power to Gaster. But uh, even if so, that would still mean that there's two shattered Gaster's worth of pieces that could be reassembled, if not more. 
depending on how many alternate timelines are at play. Um, but uh, it's also quite possible that none of the that only that one gastro shattered, and that's why he's able to communicate with this world. It's because he's not tied down to that physical reality. Um, so, point I'm getting at is that one theory, and this is a theory that I find quite interesting, um, is the idea that there is a complete functional version of Gaster at play in the Deltarune timeline, and that this Gaster is also somehow communicating and interacting with the shattered Gaster from the Undertale timeline. Um, I think that's interesting. Uh, at the end of this intro sequence, we actually do see, it, it, it appears, we don't know, but it appears that there's a second entity. So it's quite possible that this entity that we're first talking to is one of the Gasters, and then the other entity is a different Gaster. The shattered gaster, or the complete gaster, or something like that. Although, to be fair, and I should clarify this, we don't actually know if the second entity is actually a second entity. For all we know, it's just this character that we're talking to right now, but talking in a different voice. Um, we don't know. Uh, oh, but yeah. Uh, another thing about that entity is that a lot of people theorize that this second entity is Kara. But not just any Kara, the demonic Kara from the end of Genocide in Undertale. And the theory goes that, you know, uh, that Kara said, let's move on to the next world after destroying that one. And the theory is that Deltarune is that next world. And that Kara, for some reason, needs a host. And so Kara is this red soul here. This is Kara. Or this is the. Or maybe it's not Kara. And it. But this is the soul that Kara is going to possess, and Kara is secretly possessing Chris. And that's why their eye turns red, or something like that. I'm not a proponent of that. I think the genocide Kara thing from Undertale is dubiously canonical at best. <laughs> like, that entity has no lore. We have no idea what it is, or how it is, or where it came from. Uh, it is extremely mysterious, even by mysterious standards. We know more about Gaster than we know about that version of Kara, or what it's capable of, or how it exists. So, I don't really buy that Kara has anything to do with this game, personally, um, but that's just me. Uh, what next? Um, oh, I guess I should discuss these options here. Sweet, soft, sour, salty, pain, cold. What is, your, what is its favorite food? This is... I, I've often poured over these answers and wondered for all these questions, if they have some sort of meaning. Like, maybe they represent the chapters of Deltarune. Like, in Chapter 1, it's sweet because we get lots of friends and there's candy everywhere and Ralsei's sweet. Uh, and then Chapter 2 is soft because... reasons? And then Chapter 3 is sour and Chapter 4 is salty because of the song from the sea or something to do with the ocean or something to do with Onion Sun or something like that. And then this chapter is pain because something terrible happens. And then this chapter is cold because the ending song says that when the light is running low and the shadows start to grow and the places that you... Oh, where's the line? Fantasy... There's a light inside your soul that's still shining in the cold. So, you know, it's like, if you want to, you could stretch and say, oh, maybe these are all tied to some sort of theme in the game or the chapters. But it's also entirely possible that these options mean nothing. <laughs> it's entirely possible that these options mean absolutely nothing. I'm just going to say sweet. And um, it's further implied with these later options because a a b b c d like i'm pretty sure these three are actual blood types but c and d are not but alternatively what if this is like is this like a joke because like normally when you're answering a quiz like in school you'll have like option a option b option c option d but like this doesn't seem like the kind of place to put a joke so, another option is that these questions are arbitrary, and that Gaster or whoever is asking them, but doesn't actually care about your answers. And so it doesn't bother to give you any believable options. Um, and considering that he discards these answers and discards our creation at the end of the sequence, it's also quite feasible that that's the answer. Um, I digress. Oh, another option is that these two cat are actual blood types, but they're just not blood types of humans. Maybe these are the blood types of goners, or maybe these are additional blood types for monsters. Um, 
Susie does later say that everyone bleeds, right? So maybe these are monster blood types. Um, not sure. Could mean something, might mean nothing. <laughs> uh, what color does it like the most? And this is the most blatant example of just complete arbitrariness. Like, red, blue, green, cyan. And cyan is just a different shade of blue. Like, this is... This is very strange. I mean, the only thing that kind of stands out to me is that cyan is, like, more or less the color of the light blue soul, and and that's also more or less the color of Chris while they're in the dark world. So it's... That might mean something. And, like, Ralse is green, and... I don't know. The heart is red. There's there's not much to go off of here, but it, this is another example of being completely arbitrary. It's like, why, where's purple? Where's yellow? Where's There's a lot of colors missing here, Gaster. Um, so I think this is pretty decent evidence of these being arbitrary. Like, it's he doesn't actually care about your answers, so he's not giving you any good options. Um, my personal favorite color, by the way, is blue, but I'm just going with the first option to be consistent. Um... Here's another thing where it's like, this looks at a first glance like it might mean something, but it's hard to tell. Because, like, kindness and bravery are the attributes of two of the souls in Undertale. Uh, kindness is the attribute of the green soul, while bravery is the attribute of the orange soul. Um, but these other three don't really, aren't, like, definitive. Like, you could still link them to it. For example, uh, the purple soul is was the one of the nerd i believe the one with the glasses in the notebook so maybe this is meant to represent them um ambition uh maybe this represents the yellow soul be because they had the ambition to challenge powerful foes uh, and then voice honestly i'm not sure um yeah, I'm not sure. It's hard to guess. Um, alternatively, another thing that comes to mind is that uh, voice could have something to do with Shiren, who lost her voice in Chapter 2. Um, and I've mentioned in my night video that I think Shiren might actually have more to do with this lore and with this story than people might think, because the song she sings in Undertale is completely unique to her. And she gets this whole intro concert sequence with her that is far more than most average characters are given. And that, like, Sans shows up to her battle. And that that alone makes it feel like, okay, maybe she's more important than you think. I think Sans might even talk about her in that Toby Fox Tumblr thing he did, where he played, he role-played as the characters. And I think Sans actually talks about Shiren. So it feels like, Shiren is important, and it's possible that the song from the sea, which is a song that the river person talks about in Undertale, and which Onion Song talks about in Deltarune, it's possible that the song from the sea is her song. And since Onion Song heard that song coming from underneath the lake, possibly in some sort of underground facility, uh, that could mean that this that Shiren's important. So when I see voice, I can't help but think of that. Um, and again, if we want to link these up to chapters, Kindness is the, ch the chapter where we're introduced to Ralse, and Ralse is the is repeatedly referred to as Kind Boy. Uh, and he's also color green, which is the color of Kindness, uh, or at least the color of the green soul. Mind, uh, we go into the computer world. It's a place of mind, in a way. Like, the queen is very intelligent, very big brain. Uh, she, she must have a big brain with a head that big. Um... And then maybe Ambition represents Chapter 3, because this is the chapter where we're going into a dark world that was born of Chris's ambition? Um, maybe? <laughs> uh, and then maybe Chapter 5 is the one where we confront uh, Shiren or talk to Shiren about something. And maybe Chapter 4 is the one where we uh, help Susie confront her abusive father or something. I don't know. Like, you could link these up with chapters or try to make sense of these. But there's just really not much room for it. Although I should point out something. You'll notice that the goner we're making has striped shirt. And striped shirts are given to children in the this franchise. So whatever entity we're designing here is meant to be a goner of a uh, teenager or a child. Uh, probably a teenager. Kindness. Let's go with kindness. Kindness is always good. Um... Uh, how do you feel about your creation? It will not hear. This is another interesting detail, because this pretty much confirms that this entity we're creating, this goner, 
has a mind and will of its own. Um, it has its own life. And that's interesting because that proves that because we talk about it, he talks about it being a vessel for presumably for this soul that's we're using here, this red soul. Um, also, I think that's further proof that this might not have anything to do with Chris because why would we need to design a vessel for a soul if we were just going to use Chris anyway? Um, it seems like a waste of time. And while Gaster is a lot of things, I'm not sure he's the kind of person to just troll someone and design an entire goner just to throw away that goner. Uh, but yeah, so this proves that this entity has its own will that's separate from our own, which means that this red soul we're controlling and this goner uh, are at a, at, at opposed to one another, or at the very least, they're not the same, um, which very much parallels Chris, because Chris and their red soul are also at odds with one another. So it's... It, there definitely seems to be some parallels here between this intro sequence uh, and this goner with this red soul and Chris with their red soul. And that honestly only just makes me further convinced that this intro is some sort of uh, flashback involving some other characters. Like, I'm I'm very much inclined to think that this red soul belongs to, like, the Deltarune version of Kara. Uh, maybe they were captured by Gaster or being used by Gaster in some way in this timeline. Uh, and... Just like how Kara paralleled Frisk in Undertale, I'm thinking that they might actually be doing that again in Deltarune. Or maybe this isn't Kara, and maybe this is some other human. Uh, but either way, I'm more inclined to think this is meant to be a parallel to Chris than it is to think that these characters and this soul and this goner have anything to actually do with Chris. Um, but that's just my opinion for now uh but anyway point is these goners have a will of their own independent of the one controlling them so that's interesting that might be why goner kid in Delt in undertale uh seems not isn't a gaster follower he he doesn't seem to be or they don't seem to be programmed to uh follow anyone's will they're just sort of hanging out feeling all sad um i digress uh so, uh, how do you feel about your creation? Love, hope, disgust, fear. Once again, very narrow options uh, for this. And, like, some of these, like, you, you could understand being referenced. Like, love is very important in this franchise. It's what monsters are made of, effectively. Um, love is also level of violence, so that's important. Um, hope, hopes and dreams. It's part of Asriel's final f boss fight. Um it's it's referenced a lot the underground's hopes and dreams so that's important but disgust disgust doesn't really come up like it occasionally appears like some characters are disgusted with frisk or disgusted with something or another but it's very rare and you would definitely not consider it to be a key theme in undertale or deltarune for that matter fear is uh, you could argue that something like omega flowey or just flowey in general is pretty terrifying uh, definitely the main source of fear in Undertale, although the True Lab, which is connected to Gaster, uh, is also a pretty spooky place. Like, it's some creepypasta um, RPG maker horror game type stuff. So, fear of being connected to Gaster could make some sense as well. Um, but again, we're kind of reaching desperately <laughs> for anything that even remotely connects these to the lore, because these, these answers just really don't seem to mean anything. Uh, at least, not obviously. Uh, we'll just go with love. Have you answered honestly? Yes. <laughs> uh, you acknowledge the possibility of pain and seizure. Does this mean anything? Is what I'm wondering. The way Gaster phrases this. You see, when Deltarune first came out and we had a similar message when you first booted it up, that was before we knew that Deltarune Chapter 1 was a was uh, actually a game. And we thought it was just a survey of some sort. That was how Toby Fox pitched it. And when it said that, it, it was almost a joke. It was almost a meme to say, oh, pain and seizure. But the fact that Gaster is phrasing it this way, I mean, or whoever this entity is, is phrasing it this way is interesting because that definitely sounds like something a doctor would say. I mean, and, and Gaster is a doctor. He's D Dr. W.D. Gaster. Um, or... Am I headcanoning that? Is he actually confirmed to be a doctor? I mean, he's a scientist, so... And I think they refer to Alphys as a doctor. 
So, yeah, that, that, that makes some sense. Um, but it is interesting because, like, pain and seizure are interesting. Because, like, at the end of Chapter 1, Chris seems to have, you know, something you might consider a seizure when they rip out their soul. And it definitely looks kind of painful. So it's like this could be foreshadowing of that. Or it could just be arguing that the sequence of fusing a soul with a body or fusing a soul with something that already has a will of its own can be painful and induce seizures. Um, or it could be a joke. <laughs> or this could be a huge grift and it means nothing. Uh, it's hard to tell. Understood. Name your vessel. Time for the memes. Oh, no, no. The vessel's name is going to be... Roxas. We called it Roxas. <laughs> we are Zemnus, confirmed. We're giving Roxas his new name. Uh, and what about the creator? My name is most certainly... Uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to put Sora, but I guess it would be better for... Uh, channel consistency sake that I just put Jaru. And if you're wondering why I named the vessel Roxas, it's because the whole idea of a soulless, heartless vessel being controlled by some other force or being created by some maniacal villain is very familiar. <laughs> it's very reminiscent of uh, Kingdom Hearts in a lot of ways. Um, Jaru. Excellent. Yep, you say excellent a lot. Truly excellent. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Jaru. Yep, that's my name. <sighs> this character definitely has a very unique speaking pattern. And it, the upcoming text we're about to see, the argument for it being Kara or being some other character, this text, uh, is because it looks slightly different in the Japanese. No one who can choose who they are in this world. Hi, Toriel. Um, that text in the Japanese uses different uh, writing style. Like I think it's like... Uh, oh, I don't remember now. But I, I personally don't put too much emphasis on the Japanese text. I don't think it means anything. I think that the fact that the Japanese text uses different characters or uses a different uh, like writing system than the normal text is just meant to do the exact same thing that seeing it in a different font in this game does. Because you'll notice that the font used by the Gaster person, whoever talks to us, the Mr. Truly Excellent, whoever <laughs> was talking before, they used a different font than the uh, uh, character who comes later, the one who says that uh, you can't choose who you are in this world. Um, so I think that the characters being different in Japanese is just meant to communicate more or less the same thing that those characters having different fonts is meant to communicate, which is that it might be a different character, and it's definitely that character's, you know, it might be a different character. Uh, now, let me rephrase. Uh, the issue, though, and I've pointed this out before, is that a character can change their own font. Sans does this multiple times. He'll be, he has a serious voice that he uses where he changes the font um, of his of his speech. And so that Gaster entity, who the entity who's probably Gaster, could have just it could have just been one entity speaking in different voices. Um, so uh, oh and the reason people think that that second character is the second character and that it might be Kara is because it uses the same speak like speaking not the speaking pattern, but it uses the same like alphabet alternative writing system thing that japan has for both that character and for post-genocide kara um but honestly again i don't buy it uh, i especially would not expect them to hide important lore in such an abstract place as japanese <laughs> as like j j japanese weird writing structure um so uh, i don't put too much stake in that um However, I do think it's interesting what they had to say. Uh, no one gets to choose who they are in this world. So right out the gate, that is the first instance of them making it clear that our choices don't matter. They discard our creation. They discard our answers, making it clear that our choices don't matter. And then they say, we don't even get to choose who we are in this world. Some people have argued with me that... Uh, 
that that's not the theme of Deltarune, that your choices don't matter. Um, and I disagree, <laughs> uh, obviously, um, because uh, some people have likened it to Flowey's, uh in this world, it's kill or be killed, where it, it, they pretend that's the, that's the moral, but in reality, the moral is that you need to overcome that. Uh, and that it's not a kill or could be killed war. The, the moral of the story of Undertale is that Flowey's wrong. Um, but the issue is that with Flowey, he's the main antagonist. Um, we're meant to overcome him. Uh, but by contrast, the idea of let's try to avoid killing each other is an idea that's repeated throughout Undertale. Toriel is the one who tells you, don't kill people. When you move on to, um, you know, um, Sands and Papyrus, they refuse to kill you. They're they're very against the idea of using extreme violence. And when you very quickly befriend Papyrus. Uh, eventually, you get to uh, Undyne, and she feels bad about it, and feels bad about trying to kill you and take your soul. Um, Alphys wants to avoid death, and like everyone, ultimately wants to avoid this philosophy or of kill or be killed it's an idea that the rest of the cast rejects um and flowey embraces because he's the villain by contrast in deltarune the idea that our choices don't matter isn't just one thing said by one character it's not just the villain's motivation or philosophy it's something that's repeated and demonstrated constantly um in our intro sequence here, our choices are thrown away. The character says we have no choice of who we are in this world, which not only ties into the fact that we can't decide who we control, we are playing as Chris, whether we like it or not, but it also ties into the philosophical fact that most of us are who we are because of how we were raised, the context we were born into. Um, we may have free will, but that free will can only go so far. In many ways, many of our core attributes were completely outside of our control. They were programmed into us by our uh, nature, by just our biology, and also by our nurture in the form of those who raised us and those around us. So even though, so not only is this a in-game fact, but it's also just an out-of-game fact. It's just a fact in real life that no one really gets to decide who you are. Like, I am who I am, and I didn't really get to choose to be who I am. Um, I've grown, I've made choices, but a large chunk of my life and a large chunk of everyone's life is outside of our control. And since our lives define us, that means a, a large chunk of who we are is outside of our control. So that, and that definitely seems like a philosophical concept that Toby Fox would want to explore, is that divide between free will and uh, the nature of our being and the nature that we are instilled with. Uh, and that is also reflected in the Gaster followers, where... They have their own will, even though we're programming them. Um, it's that conflict where there's, they're created for a purpose, but they're still alive and sentient. And so they have free will and have the option to grow and change. Um, so it's an interesting discussion there. Um, but that's not the last that we hear of not having free will. We'll see Susie reiterate that same thing uh, shortly when she says we don't have any choices. Um Toriel forces us to go to the school. We don't have any choice in that. We uh, then get dragged into the dark world. We are dragged by our nose through the plot of this game. There's no avoiding it. Uh, there's no divergent path. There's no alternatives. Um, and every time we're given an option in both chapters, it doesn't matter. The ending will not change. The path you walk will not change. It is almost always irrelevant. Um, even the weird route or the snow grave route in chapter two... That doesn't change the fact that you defeat the bad guy, seal the fountain, go back to the real world. Um, so in terms of the overall story, whether you're playing pacifist or genocide, uh, the ending of chapter one will not change. And the ending of chapter two will not change. It, it's very much an interesting discussion there because we know that the experience changed. The journey to the ending changed. But the ending, the outcome didn't. So there's a lot of philosophical discourse there, and I think that's very integral to the theme of Undertale, which is the idea that even if our choices change, can change, that most of our choices don't matter, and the, on the rare occasions where they do actually change things, it matters, it only matters to a degree, and ultimately it doesn't change the ending. Um, so overall, the 
the fact that that's one of the very first things, the very first concepts instilled in us. This is definitely different from Flowey's, you know, kill or be killed. This isn't just one character. This is the entire game. Nothing we do can change how this will play out. Um, which, of course, plays into my idea of it being a time loop where our choices can affect the, in the internal events of the time loop, but it won't change the fact that it will reset, that the angel will send us hurtling back to this very screen. Um, I would not be surprised, by the way, if the ending of Chapter 7, of the ending of the game, has us hurtling back in time, and we hear someone calling our name, and then we wake up in this bed with Tutorial calling our name. And then we progress for, like, a little bit, and then, it, like, as we're driving to work, the credits roll, and, like, different music plays. Um... Or something like that. Um, I would be very interested to see, and this is something that I've discussed in many of my other, uh, uh, many other contexts, is that it would be very interesting to see, since the angel is theoretically the one resetting everything, um, then that means that we it would be the one to remember everything. So much like defeating the neutral route multiple times gives you extra dialogue from Flowey in Undertale, um, I would not be surprised if completing the game over and over again um, might actually let you get new dialogue from the angel. Um, it might be curious about who this player is and what their intent is and why they're trying to inf infiltrate their world. Uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of possibilities there. So now we're at the very start here. Uh, very first thing I want to point out, it's Goat Mom. She's back. Um, Undertale has or Deltarin has most of the same cast from Undertale, which pretty strongly implies that this is an alternate timeline, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, it's it's whatever. The alternate timeline versus alternate reality debate, I think, is a little overblown in its importance. It's important in terms of discovering the ancient history of this world, because, you know, the, hu the history of humans and monsters. If it's an alternate timeline, then the history of human and monsters from Undertale would matter. But if it's an alternate reality... The, then the history may not matter as much, but it doesn't change the fact that the characters still act and think and behave and even dress the same way as they do in Undertale. So it ultimately really doesn't matter that much for theory crafting purposes. Um, even uh, I, I should point out that on Toby Fo on the Steam page for Deltarune demo chapter one and two, it describes uh, Deltarune as being a parallel story to Undertale. Um, which is interesting. <laughs> um, you could interpret that to be a parallel timeline or parallel reality or parallel world or whatever. And the specifics of the cosmology of this franchise have never been particularly well flushed out. But it is interesting, um, nonetheless. Uh, one thing to note about Toriel here is that she's wearing an out the same outfit or a very similar... I think it's the same outfit, actually, that she wears at the end of the True Pacifist route when she becomes a teacher. Um... Similarly, uh, although one detail of note, you'll notice that on her sprite, she doesn't actually have the glasses that she's wearing in her dialogue portrait. Her dialogue portrait doesn't have the glasses. Uh, but also interestingly, you'll notice that hanging around her neck is a heart locket, which is interesting because in Undertale, the heart lockets were worn by uh, Kara and Azriel. You can actually see that same locket around Azriel's neck in the final boss of, of the true pacifist when he becomes, uh, when he regains his body in his form. So it's interesting that she's wearing it now. That is a very intentional detail, and what it means, I'm not sure. Uh, does this imply that Kara existed and passed away and then Toriel held on to the locket in remembrance of them? Or what? Like, does this mean anything? What does it mean? It definitely seems like it means something. I don't know what, but it means something. Um, what else? Uh, Chris. Oh, and one thing, uh, when the intro was fading out, it said, uh, your name is, and then before it could give an answer, uh, we woke up and we see Toriel saying Chris. Um, now you might think, aha, that's connecting the intro sequence with with Chris. That proves Chris is connected to Gaster and Kara and blah, blah, blah. Um, I disagree. I think this is very reminiscent of Undertale, where there are times when Frisk falls down, uh, like, for example, when, she, when Frisk is chased by Undyne, they fall down a pit onto some flowers, and they have a brief dream flashback sequence. Or maybe that's not even them having a, a, a flashback, but we as a player view a flashback sequence of Kara and Azrael meeting, and then then before the introduction uh, can run out, 
uh, or before I think Azrael can say their name, uh, we wake up and we're back to playing as Frisk. So, like, that's an example of, you know, the dream had nothing to do with... Oop, hit the microphone. Uh, that dream had nothing to do with Frisk or Frisk's situation. Uh, it's just meant to make us think that it did. Uh, or make us think that it's somehow connected to Frisk when it wasn't. So it's entirely... So I think that waking up to Toriel saying, Chris... If I really don't think it has anything to do with Chris, I think it is meant to be something the player knows, but not Chris. Uh, for now, uh, let's continue with Toriel's dialogue. Chris, if you now wake up, we will be late for school. Oh, this is the very first hint, by the way, for my uh, my Ra Brian Ralsei theory that uh, Asriel's dead and uh. And that Chris has been staying up all night trying to research magic and find ways to resurrect Azrael. And this is the first hint of that because Chris um, is sleeping in, um, meaning that they stayed up late. So they're, they're, they're struggling to wake up on time for school. Um, and later on, we find out that Chris tends to sleep in class. So this is the very first hint of the fact that Chris does not go to, does not spend their nights sleeping. They spend their nights doing unknown things. I think they spend it researching magic um we know for a fact that they spend time looking up magic in chapter two but i think this is the first hint of that um let's progress yeah i don't think the heart locket is on her sprite either i'll be outside for you all right um yeah i don't think there's anything interesting in that dialogue and there's there's the mad, gender-neutral ch 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 Chad themselves. It's Chris. Um, <laughs> applause. Um, oh, Chris, you are an interesting character. Um, first thing I want to point out. Um, uh, this bed. You'll notice that it has two sets of stripes on it. Which is interesting to me. Because stripes are used to represent children. But... Uh, having four stripes is a lot of stripes like chris clearly has a striped shirt um and if i recall correctly asriel has two stripes on their outfit which makes sense since this bed has two stripes however you'll notice that it has two sets of stripes there's actually four individual stripes so if you really want to stretch it you could argue that this is foreshadowing that asriel is two kids in one due to them being fused together with chris so you know it's a bit of a stretch even by my standards but it is interesting nonetheless uh, let's look at some text it's your bed if you go back to sleep you may miss a lot of important things does this have anything to do with the lore probably not will you go to bed do not you can sleep in class. Oh, there, I'm glad I did this. Um, you can sleep in class. So there's another hint. Uh, I, I think this only is an option if you've already played through chapter one once. Uh, and this lets you skip the intro. But there you go. You can sleep in class. It is a it is a habit of Chris's to sleep in class. So further support for the idea that... Um, yeah. Do not. Um, it's stained. What kind of stain is that, do you think? Is it dirt? Is it mud? Is it blood? If if Chris has been hanging out in the woods or doing something mysterious like that, then maybe this is mud. Maybe it's the blood from when they rip out their soul. It's a mysterious stain, but I don't know if it means anything. And then, of course, there's the birdcage in the red wagon. It's a red wagon with a rusty birdcage in it. Um... The fact that it's rusty either implies that Chris found this outside somewhere and has just been using it since, or it implies that Chris has spent a lot of time outside with this birdcage. Uh, and not just outside, but in the rain with this birdcage. So, and that's why it's rusty now. Um, it's interesting, though. It's red, and it later contains the red soul. Maybe that means something. Looks like it's seen quite a few crashes. That's interesting. Because there's so many ways to read this. If you follow my theory that uh, Chris has been possessed for some time, then that would mean that Chris has uh, been on, been you know, removing their soul frequently in order to gain control of their own body. Um, and you'll notice that at the end, whenever Chris rips out their soul and throws it into this birdcage, that it's very violent. It's very intense. Um... 
and very, uh, uh, you know, you could call it a crash is what I'm getting at. So maybe these crashes that it's referring to are the, the impact of the soul being thrown into the birdcage, which could imply that, you know, Chris has been removing their soul a lot. Uh, uh, in fact, just the fact that this line exists and this birdcage exists and Chris is so clearly ready to use it to contain their soul later suggests that Chris has been possessed for some time, which is, in my opinion, the strongest is pretty well, maybe not the strongest evidence, but definitely strong evidence for <laughs> a third entity being involved here because the player only takes control of Chris right now. Chris was not in control or... Rather, Chris was not being controlled by the player until this very moment, this morning that they woke up. We were not involved in this reality. I have only just now started controlling Chris. Um, so this pretty much, if you interpret this to mean that Chris has been possessed for any period of time longer than the the player's involvement, then this you have. Then that's what this means. Is that the, this is what this birdcage and cart have been used for um, maybe chris used it for other purposes like torturing small animals <laughs> i hope that's not true um like this immediately reminds me of ender's game and that's not a good thing uh but i don't act, i think chris is actually a good person so i'm choosing to believe that they haven't been putting small creatures in this cage and then throwing them down hills because that jesus christ <laughs> that would be pretty horrifying um so i i choose to assume this is exclusively about the soul um, and yeah, just the fact that the player only involves themselves now seems to be proof that Chris is not, or that Chris has to have a third entity controlling them that isn't the player, um, in the form of the soul. And of course, obviously, I think it's Azrael. That's my theory. Um, people, some people think it's Kara, some people think it's Gaster, some people think it's, I don't know, Metaton, <laughs> who knows. Um, but, uh, I think it's Azrael. And, uh, that's interesting. Um, I apologize. I'm going to ramble. That's just going to be the rambly nature of this thing. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Is uh, What's the next line of dialogue? Oh, no. It's Red Wagon. Throws your in it. Looks like it's seen quite a few crashes. Um, oh, and the last thing was that uh, just the fact that Chris is able to rip out their soul at the end of this chapter, that's not something you just do. That's something you have to figure out. That's something you have to have experience with. So the fact that Chris was able to do that and implies that they've done it at least once before. I refuse to believe that Chris just out of the blue goes, I feel like I'm being possessed. And then ripped out their own soul and just on a whim and just knew that would work. That's I don't believe that at all. Not even a little bit. Um, uh, so I think that we have to believe that Chris has been possessed for some period of time. And that that period of time extended to before I, as the player, was involved in the story. So I think third entity theory, <laughs> as much as of a meme as it seems to have become, uh, is like, it seems pretty canonical. Like, I, I really have a hard time buying that there's not a third entity involved here. Um, so that's interesting. Oh, speaking of... Uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, which, um, you'll notice the angel is right here on the floor one of the very first things we see in this game is the delta rune sitting right here on the floor with the angel and the three triangles uh, you'll actually see multiple variations on this where the, sometimes the triangle is are in different orientations and sometimes the wings are more stylized like you'll see it on the front of toriel's house um and you'll see a different version of this design in uh certain character designs like it's like slightly different from um I want to say it's different from the design, some of the designs we see in like Undertale, um, but it's it's always more or less the same. It's always the winged entity above the three triangles. But I do think it's interesting because if my time loop theory is correct, then we'll encounter this angel. It will reset us back to this day, and what will be the first thing we see? We'll wake up to Toriel saying, "Chris, with her standing right on top of this, <laughs> right on top of this rug with the angel." Uh, so we'll end the previous loop with the angel. We'll start the next loop with the angel. What a, what a crock. What a, what a, what a scam. Uh, and like, that's another thing is like, every time I play through this game, I have to look at it through the lens of what does this mean the first time you play through? And what does this mean if this is your second playthrough? Like, what if this is like, you're playing through the game after the time loop happens? What does it, what do, they, do these, do the meaning of these things change? Close drawer.
Like, you'll notice that Chris has nothing to say, or assuming it's Chris talking, <laughs> narrator. Um, like, there's nothing, Chris has nothing to say about their drawer. It's just like, that's where my clothes are. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. Birds are singing. Flowers are blooming. Um, yeah, beautiful day, huh? Speaking of beautiful day, you'll notice that there's a flower on the wall over by Azrael's bed. In fact, you'll just notice like there's stars and moons. Like the stars are very reminiscent of the stars Azrael uses in his final boss fight. Um, the moon is kind of random, but the, the the tons of trophies because Azrael is a Chad um, who is just a pro gamer and a pro video game designer and also good at sports. Uh, speaking of which, the drawer is mostly empty except for, and this is interesting because what they say next in this line, this this line is the only line that changes depending on which save file you're using because you have three options for your save file and uh, which, you know, the fact that there's three save files could also be hinting that we're, there's three entities involved with Chris in the form of Chris, Asriel, and the player, but I digress. Point is, uh, Depending on which save file you're using, it will say something different here. We're using the number the, the top save file, which is the most common save file to use, obviously. So it says a school cross country shirt with a tear in it. Um, however, if you do one of the other save files, it says something about like a coupon book, which is a reference probably to uh, uh, burger pants or pizza pants, <laughs> because Azrael's friends with pizza pants and was probably given a coupon book for Icy's pizza. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, I guess I should probably take a brief moment to see if my recording is looking good and see if I've messed anything up. Um, all right. Uh, where was I? Uh, so yeah, uh, this uh, had to pause recording for a moment there. Sorry. Uh, this uh, drawer's contents varies from file to file, so that's interesting. Um, this particular line of dialogue um, is uh, <laughs> is well. Not only does it further confirm that Asriel is just an all-star super chad. Um, who also competed in cross country. It also supports the idea that Azriel was murdered because their shirt has a tear in it. Um, it's almost like uh, it's almost like Chris uh, took the clothes that collapsed onto the ground after Azriel died and uh, hid them, <laughs> uh, hid them in the drawer here. Uh, or maybe it's just that Azriel was a rough and tumble kind of guy, and he uh, <laughs> and he got a tear in his cross country shirt that he didn't repair, and that Toriel didn't offer to repair. Apparently, um, this is a, this is one of the stranger uh, lines of dialogue. Uh, let me see if I can find the other um, the other dialogue for this uh, Azriel's drawer. something to do, do, do okay um it's crushing a very old school idea a very old school id with an embarrassing haircut is the second option for the drawer uh there's school idea with an embarrassing haircut um not sure what that means One option, and this is interesting, because this is something that I didn't bring up in my other videos, but which is actually a very good point, which is that we don't actually know how boss monsters age. Like, we don't know how long a boss monster stays a child or a teenager. Um, for all we know, Asriel going to college is, like, you know, they might be 100 years old, for all we know. Like, they, 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 like they may... Uh, boss monsters like Asriel may stay a teenager for decades. So... The fact that this says a very old school ID with an embarrassing haircut could be hinting at that. Um, it could also be hinting that this is a, I don't know, just a very old, like if it said an old school ID, that'd be one thing, but a very old? That that almost feels like it means something. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, it could be hinting at the 
age of Azrael and the fact that he could be very old um, as a boss monster. Um, and then the coupon book. Every coupon is for half off a large pizza. That is a dang... Dang, I wish I had that coupon book. <laughs> That's awesome. Half off a large pizza? That's amazing. Um, I digress, but... Uh, that's cool, nonetheless. Uh, so, there's nothing useful in the drawer. So, coupons, a cross-country shirt, and uh, an old-school ID aren't useful to Chris. Interesting. And then there's the bed. There are CDs under the bed. Classical, jazz, religious ska. So, once again, we're saying that Asriel is an all-star super chad. He has very diverse music tastes. Uh, religious ska because he's well established in this continuity to be a fairly religious uh, person. Um, classical because he is a refined and sophisticated person apparently. Uh, jazz because he is a cultural uh, I don't know how do you describe someone who's into jazz? <laughs> he's got a diverse interests. I don't know. I don't like jazz. So I'm a you like jazz? Anyway, um, so that's interesting. There's also a game console. It has one normal controller and one knockoff controller. I wonder if this is, means anything, like if this is a metaphor, because if my theory about Azrael controlling Chris is true, then and then there's also the player controlling Chris, then that's two controllers, if you want to look at it that way. So maybe the player and Asriel represent a normal controller and a knockoff controller. It also could be reflecting the nature of Chris and Asriel's status in the family and in the town, where Asriel is a perfectly normal monster, whereas Chris is this kind of knockoff dreamer. Uh, Chris isn't a real monster you know, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, it might mean nothing. It might just be going. Oh, look how relatable they are. They 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 had to use a hand me down controllers and stuff like that. Uh, but it probably doesn't mean that much. Nothing else in there. Um, and then there's this cursed dialogue. Um, you'll notice that this is a fairly modern computer. It's a flat screen monitor. It's actually very similar to the one I'm using right now. Um, You'll notice that there's pens in a cup on the desk. I think those are pens. So that could very well be hinting at the fact that Asriel is also an artist. I wouldn't be surprised if he's the one that drew this flower up here. Uh, of course, there's a flower because flowery, and you know that's what he is. Uh, you'll also yeah. You'll also notice that there's a some sort of plaque up there, but it's probably just another award. Although this almost looks like a degree, like a like a doctorate. Or not doctorate. Uh, what the? What am I trying to say? Like a like a college degree. So maybe this is Asriel's uh, high school diploma or something. I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah. So like this is a fairly modern computer. It's like uh, it's much more advanced than the computers in the uh, in the public library. Um, so that's interesting. It, which makes some amount of sense. The public libraries typically have pretty old. Uh, tech compared to the whatever's cutting edge because it's publicly funded. Um, it's a computer desk. There are many boxes under it filled with old books. This is interesting. I mentioned in my uh, video discussing my theory that uh, it's possible that these old books are books on magic and that Chris has collected them and uh, you'll notice that it doesn't say that they have dust on them or anything like that. It just says that it's old books. So it's not that the books have been sitting there for very long and collecting dust, it's just that they're old. Um, so that could be because they're old, because they discuss something ancient and mysterious like magic. Um, and maybe Chris has been collecting these from the library or other places uh, in order to study up on magic to resurrect Azrael. Um, alternatively, you could argue that this is further evidence of Azrael being a total chad, because I guess maybe Azrael is also just a history buff. <laughs> um, what this means beyond that, I'm not sure. I think that's almost everything in this room. Now, the other thing you'll note is that the right side of this is... Huh. I wonder what these are that are sticking out at the bottom of Azrael's... I mean, they mentioned that there's CDs and a games console down there. Right, CDs. So presumably that's that, and it's not like something else. 
Um, <laughs> this just reminds me of that fan art I saw of, of Chris flailing around Asriel's corpse, and it's like, <laughs> there's there's his feet, <laughs> there's Asriel's feet, he's down there. <laughs> Um, the other thing of note is that Chris inside the room is very bland and empty and hollow and monochrome, um, which could absolutely be further hinting at the fact that Chris feels very inadequate compared to Asriel. Um, it, it seems like these were like top of the line purchased for Asriel, whereas Chris was something of a surprise and they had to scrounge together um, stuff for them. And also they're not an achiever like Asriel. They don't have any trophies or anything of the sort. They don't even have pictures on their desk. They don't even have a clock. Uh, so this 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 just this one scene paints a very depressing picture of Chris as a person. Um, like Asriel has a computer, Chris has a bird cage that's rusty, and there's stains and it's interesting. Yeah. No matter what ends up happening in this game, I'm pretty sure Chris is just gonna break our hearts. I'm pretty sure he's or they are a very depressing character. Um Cactus, there's not much to say about it. This is a different from Undertale, where the character says that the cactus is Sundari, um, which is some anime stuff. Um, there's not much to say about it. This could be hinting that Chris is just not as energetic or flamboyant or as excitable or creative or whatever as uh, Prisk, um, which is interesting. And maybe that could be hinting the fact that as that you know Chris is eternally depressed. Probably because they killed their brother. Um, their crayons in the drawer, their labels have long faded, and there's no green. So this is interesting. Their labels have long faded implies that these are very old crowns, uh, which could, again, be implying that Asriel is very old. That Asriel was a child a long time ago and was and stayed a child for a while before becoming old enough to go to college. And that's why the crowns' colors are all faded. Um... There's also uh, the fact that there's no green, and Ralsei is predominantly made of green. So maybe gr this crayon is part of what makes up Ralsei, or maybe a drawing was made of Ralsei, and that's what becomes Ralsei. Um, notably, at the end, I think of Ralsei's uh, manual, there's a drawing of Ralsei. So maybe Ralsei had access to that crayon and used it to make uh, his, uh, his uh, manual. So that's an interesting possibility. Um, Alternatively, if you want to get really meta, like, dark on here, it's like, green represents kindness. So maybe that's saying that there's no kindness in this world, or very little in the story, or in Chris, or something like that. Hmm. There's a different line that gets said here in Chapter 2 that's interesting, but uh, I'll, I'll save that for when I discuss Chapter 2. It's only you... Yeah, I'm pretty sure Chris is depressed. I'm pre like I don't think it's even much of a wild accusation to say that Chris is depressed. Uh, the completely normy interpretation is that Chris is depressed uh, because their best friend left for college. But I think the much more Chad interpretation is that Chris is depressed because they murdered their sibling on accident. Um, the door is locked. Um, we later find out this is actually Toriel's room, or Toriel and Asgore's room, or Asgore's former room. Um, and that Toriel keeps it locked to keep Chris out of her stuff. Um, something funny you'll notice is that the mirror doesn't actually reflect Chris's sprite correctly. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of funny. Like, Chris's legs aren't correct in the mirror compared to their actual sprite. That doesn't mean anything at all. I'm just pointing it out because I can. Um, there are many books. Tales of Snails, a storybook. Snails do not have tails, a scientific refutation. This is just all a callback to Toriel and, and, and Asgore loving snails back in the day. They, they ate snails because they're goats. Can snails help your garden? Um, not really. And a signed copy of The History of Humans and Monsters by Gerson Boom. Whew. I'd like to point out that the first name we hear in this game is Chris. And the second name that we hear in this game is Gerson Boom. Flat out. We don't hear Toriel's name. We don't hear Asriel's name. Uh, we don't hear much of anything until this moment in term for, for a name. This is the, the first character we're introduced to in terms of their name. Chris, the protagonist. Second one, the antagonist, Gerson Boom. Or, you know, a version of Gerson, I should say. Um, 
<laughs> it's an interesting possibility. Um, but uh, the fact that it's a signed copy shows that Toriel or Asgore knew Gerson, um, meaning that uh, just like in the Undertale timeline, Gerson was friends with the Dreamer family. Um, and the history of humans and monsters, Gerson Boom. So Gerson Boom is a historian in this timeline. I mean, he was always involved with history. He was an architect or not architect, uh, an archaeologist in, in Undertale. And he's a historian this time around, as well as a writer. Um, God, I wish I could read this book. This book would help my theories so much. But just the fact that there's a book with the exact same title as a similar book in Undertale really only makes me further inclined to think, yeah, this is, uh, this is an alternate timeline. But... Uh, interesting nonetheless there's no time to read anything right now i say as i spend 20 hours analyzing just the dialogue in toriel's house um yeah you'll notice on top there there's two chests one's large and brown one's slightly smaller and greenish um that might be like asgore's trunk and uh toriel's trunk or it might be chris and asriel's um hard to say I'm trying to see if there's anything else I'm forgetting. These this hit this portrait could be like a hint or like a like a callback to like the hills that uh, we see in the intro of Undertale, or it could be nothing because it's not everything has to mean something. Uh, but I have to point out things just in case they do mean something. Let's start with the bathroom. You looked inside the sink cupboard. There's. A can of icy cool boys body spray spray for the boys flaming hot pizza flavor. <laughs> I forgot how funny this game is. Um, it just reminds me of like Heat's Flamesman or Flamin' Hot Sky or whatever. <laughs> spray for the boys. Um, I noticed that. It seems to be almost entirely full. Well, you know, it's interesting because it that implies that it's been used like once and then it was never used again. So I see two possibilities there. Either someone got this as a gift for Chris or and then they were like, they tried it once and were like, this is awful and they never used it again. Or this belonged to Asriel and it's almost full because Asriel left for college and didn't get to keep using it. Um... I'm almost inclined towards that option because it specifically says for boys and Chris has no confirmed gender one way or another. Um, so that's interesting. Um, <laughs> probably means nothing. It's probably just a joke. Um, a can of Icy's Cool Boys body spray spray for them. Although I should point out, this is technically the third name that we're introduced to in the form of Ice-E. That is... Uh, that's interesting. I see seemed to play like was like a, he appeared once in Undertale, and it was only because of Sans, which is super sus. Um, and in this game, I see seems to have branded everything. Like there's I see's pizza. There's I see's cool boys body spray. There's I see's. Uh, Oh, I'm sure I'm forgetting something right now, but like, the, if I see is a person, then damn, I see is the, just the most prolific entity in this universe. It's toilet, flush it. Yes, you flush the toilet. Flush the toilet. Chris, is everything all right in there? <laughs> you know, this is very unrealistic. It takes so much longer for the toilet bowl to refill with water once you flush it. Zero out of ten, unrealistic video game. Chris. What are you doing? You did not put a bath bomb in the toilet again, did you? So this is some of the first, uh, some of the early characterization of Chris. Uh, putting a bath bomb in the toilet is pretty mischievous. It's pretty, like, it either shows that Chris was curious what would happen, or more likely it was a prank. It was just 
like putting cherry bombs in toilets, but slightly less destructive in the form of a bath bomb. So bath bombs, for those who don't know, are like these things you throw into your bath and then it like fizzes and gives it a bunch of bubbles and uh, uh, it's just meant to make your bath. Actually, what the? I feel like I'm not being accurate. Let me look up bath bombs real quick. Bath bombs. Uh, bath. <laughs> what is a bath bomb? Only the best bath fizzy you'll ever experience. Taking bathing to a whole new level with gorgeous colors and intoxicating scents. Uh, uh, bath bombs are concentrated form of bubble bath. Uh, okay, so that's the idea: is that it overflows it with bubbles, and that's why the toilet uh, clogged. So it just sort of further characterizes Chris as being kind of mischievous, not in a super destructive way, just in a harmless prank kind of way. I forget if there's any more dialogue. Oh, yep. Yeah. Chris, if anything bad happens, you are paying for the plumbing bill. <laughs> uh, so Toriel's clearly sus of Chris, implying this is not a this this is a reoccurring habit of Chris's to uh, <laughs> look at that face to suspect them of doing some semi destructive pranks. So that's interesting. Um, I think she has no more dialogue. It's good to conserve water. Does this mean anything? Probably not. Can of apple scented shampoo and a gallon sized container of pet shampoo. With the idea being that, you know, Toriel is a giant furry ghost, ghost monster, not ghost, goat monster, uh, and therefore needs pet shampoo and a lot of it, as opposed to Chris, who just needs a little bit of apple shampoo. And here's the window that you can't interact with, which isn't important for this. Um, you'll notice that the towels seem to have a stripe on them, whereas the shower curtain are polka dot. Uh, polka dots are reminiscent of clowns. Maybe that's a reference to something. The stripe could be a reference to children, or it could be nothing, and it's probably nothing. And there's this table down here. They can't interact with. Although this does show me the very first instance of something very interesting, because this is showing that there's more to this room than we're allowed to see. This section of this house that we're looking at here, uh, there's more. Like there's a there's space behind this couch, and there's where this table is. So like we know for a fact that there is more to this house than we are able to see. Which is very interesting, because this is not the only time that you see this. This happens a lot in the hometown, too. Like, you'll go up a street, and then it will jump cut to you appearing somewhere else. Uh, so there's entire sections of this world that we are not allowed to see as the player. And it's just a mystery to us. Like, Toby Fox could be hiding an entire town's worth of mystery on streets that just, the game just doesn't show us. Um, and then it could just suddenly decide to show us that in a future chapter. Uh, maybe the, maybe it'll show us something in this house. I doubt it. But I could totally see, like, streets that we normally just auto-walk past in, like, a transition uh, actually being unlocked to us later. Um, there's a photo on the fridge. It's you, your mother, and your brother. So it's Chris, presumably Chris, uh, Asriel, and Toriel. Um, notably, they don't have Asgore in that photo. Um, rip. <laughs> Rip Ascor. There's some white fur stuck in the drain, just like an Undertale, because they're furry boss monsters. Um, there's some cinnamon battery caked on the stovetop. This is also a reference to Undertale, although interestingly, in that game, the stovetop was clean because of fire magic, which is this is another piece of solid evidence to support that there's not magic in this uh, in this game in this timeline, or at least not in the surface world, uh, or rather the light world. Cookie cutters for gingerbread monsters and gingerbread humans. This is a running joke that I find very interesting because in Undertale there weren't really such things. I think there's gingerbread monsters. I don't think there's gingerbread humans. Uh, or there's like just one or the other. So this is further implying how like in this world humans and monsters live together peacefully. And so you have gingerbread monsters and gingerbread humans for the respective species. And, to and at the end of Chapter 2 they actually reference that again with the... With, uh, 
Susie mentioning that uh, she prefers the giant monster movies over the giant human movies, which is a hilarious joke, but it also further demonstrates that this is probably a timeline where humans and monsters just live together in peace. Um, I know some people like to theorize that maybe the monsters sealed the humans underground in this timeline and that Chris is a, the one human, uh, but I don't actually believe that. Not only does it seem out of character for the monsters to do something like that, but I think evidence like this further supports the notion that um, this is just a timeline where humans and monsters get along. It's a trash can. Somehow it's emitting a pleasant floral scent. At first glance, you might think this is like a fl- like a scented trash bag or something, because that is a thing. Uh, but it's no, it's because Asgore's always sending Toriel flowers, and she throws them in the trash. Um, because it's not a Toby Fox game if Asgore isn't suffering. Um, it's a landline phone, but you already have a cell phone. Oh, thank God. That reminds me. Let's see. Where's the button? There we go. So you'll notice the item is actually grayed out right now. Um, stat. Chris. Uh, Notably, we are labeled as Chris in the menu here, uh, which is interesting because that's not the name we chose. Uh, We didn't, we're not being called Roxas or Jaru, we're being called Chris, whereas in Undertale, you are called whatever you name the character. Um, So that's interesting. Um, You'll notice that attack and defense are 10, which is actually huge. Compared to Undertale, that makes Chris light years more powerful than Frisk. Um, like, Frisk has to equip some top-tier weapons and armor to get close to uh, Chris-level stats. Um, so, I think that's actually pretty strong. And it's specifically the defense that's obscene. Like, it's impossible to get as high as 10 defense in Undertale um, on Frisk. Whereas, I think you can get above 10 attack with the right weapons. But defense being that high um, is impossible without... Like, I think even... I want to say even if you level up by, like, going the genocide route, I think it's still either impossible or very difficult. I don't have the sheet in front of me right now, uh, but it's, like, extremely difficult to get that high. And Frisk is nowhere near that at level 1. So uh, I think it was, like, max level Frisk doesn't have as much defense as level 1 Chris. So I think that is evidence of Chris having absorbed Asriel's soul. Because now Chris is more durable than a human is supposed to be. Um, And this is further evidenced by the end of the game when Chris rips out their soul and there's blood. So implying that they literally stab their own chest and then they're just fine. Um, So, you know, and they just bounce back and it's no big deal. So, yeah, I think Chris is definitely more than human. Uh, They have a weapon. Their weapons are a pencil and a bandage. The bandage implies that, uh, you know, they're rough and tumble which we already kind of knew, was already implied. Uh, but the difference is that we're in, in Undertale, Chris or Frisk had a bandage, but that was sort of implying that Chris, or excuse me, Frisk was a rough and tumble, or the implication in Undertale, and I discussed this in my Who is Chris video, is that Frisk uh, had a really rough life um, and that that's why the bandage was reused and gross. Um, but by contrast, uh, Like, Frisk was probably, like, an orphan or something who was, like, wandering the streets and was abused. Um, I go into more depth on that in the video. I won't bother with it here. But with this game, Chris is obviously in a much happier, safer environment. So the bandage being here just implies that Chris is just so rough and tumble that they probably regularly get bandages put on them. Uh, They use a pencil, which is very similar to Chris, or or Frisk, who used a wooden stick. And they have two money. Uh... Interesting, though, that it's money. It's not gold. Um, in Undertale, they use gold as a uh, currency. In this game, it's uh, money. It's like Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. Ring, ring. The phone is ringing, but you can't get it. You're already on the phone, after all. I remember actually going around and using this in the different rooms in this house. Um Let's see. So, Cultorial. Hello, Dreamer Residence. Who might this be? So, it's interesting because this is a little confusing, actually, because the implication we know Toriel has a cell phone. We see this in later chapter, um, and that, that's what we call. But, but right just a moment ago, we saw that we actually call the Helm line. So, that implies, unless that they've got some sort of like 
network thing going on where there's just one phone call and it rings on both phones, which is the thing. Um, but unless that's what's going on, that implies that Chris is automatically choosing a phone number to call. So that's interesting. Another case of us not being able to see an element of what's going on. Uh, Chris, do not make me come over there. I don't think she says anything. Yeah, same dialogue. Um, I'm pretty sure she says the same thing up here. Yeah. Um, I'll check in here just to be thorough. Yep, same stuff. Um, back on track. So that's interesting. You'll notice that there's these figures in the window, like these stick figures. What those are, I don't know. It's interesting considering Chapter 3 is going to be making a shadow world of those figures, so um, whatever they are, they might come into play in some way. Um, so that's interesting. It's Cherry All, the beloved living room chair. Psst. I love how it doesn't even look like it fits in with this aesthetic. It's just so out of place. Um, I just noticed this red... Uh, this red thing sitting under the television. This giant freaking television with its old school antenna. It's interesting. And then there's a heart on the wall. You'll notice, if we assume that this is meant to be the layout of the Dark World in Chapter 3, um, that implies there's going to be some giant heart thing on the wall. <laughs> that might be where the uh, fight is for the Dark Fountain. Like the final fight, it might be up there. Um... Although it's interesting because, like, maybe the uh, Dark World will just be in this, like, living room area. But it's also possible that the Dark World will include the entire house. Like, that Dark World might actually be huge compared to the previous Dark Worlds. Um, nothing to say about this chair, apparently. Um, it's the TV. Doesn't even, doesn't seem to even be plugged in anymore. Now, this is interesting because it's been brought up that it is plugged in in Chapter 2. Which seems to imply that Chris may have plugged it in. But we don't actually know who plugged it in, or if it was plugged in, because you'll notice that the choice of dialogue here is doesn't seem to even be plugged in. So it's not saying it's not plugged in, it's saying it just doesn't seem to be. Um, so it's possible that it is plugged in right now, and that this isn't part of Chris's plan. And I'm inclined to think that is what's being implied here, is that it's already plugged in, and Chris is just like, eh, it doesn't seem to be. Because it's so dusty. Because I think they say that in the next line. No? No, they don't say it. Um, but it's interesting, nonetheless. It doesn't seem to be plugged in. Because, honestly, the alternative that Chris intentionally plugged in the TV as part of some grand plan of theirs... I mean, it, it would work for the time loop theory if Chris is somehow able to remember this stuff. Um, that's an interesting possibility. We don't actually know if Chris remembers the previous time loop. Uh, I'm inclined to think that Chris probably doesn't because the angel is powerful enough to reset the memories of even characters like Chris. Um, but it is possible that Chris remembers. Um, is there anything with the couch? Nope. It's a book of hymns. All right. Uh, this will be an automatic cutscene. Um, so I won't point out too much. You'll notice that, uh, I guess I'll point the things out ahead of time because it'll very quickly go through them. Uh, there's another angel Deltarune symbol on the front of Toriel's house, which looks slightly different. It's, it might mean something. Um, and also, uh, when driving through town, you'll notice that there's these cuts where the like when, when Toriel drives through a loading zone, <laughs> uh, the tops of the roofs that you see there are not, the, they don't fit the buildings that we see after the loading zone. So that just further supports the idea that uh, this is not... Uh, that we're not seeing the whole town. That some of it's being hidden from us. Uh, whether that means anything, I don't know. Uh, and lastly, you'll notice that all the people wave at us, so clearly Toriel is popular. Uh, the Dreamer family in general is pretty popular, which makes sense. Interesting. You'll notice there's yellow flowers in the flower bed in front of the windows. There's a heart, a red heart on the front of the house. 
Toriel drives a red minivan type thing, which is very on brand. Uh, and you can't see right now, it's covered up by the text box, but there is the Deltarune symbol above the door. Yeah. It is a beautiful day today, is it not? I hope it stays this way when Asriel visits next week. He won't because he's dead! Um, but I wonder, after the excitement of university, will he still enjoy coming home to this little town? There's all these characters. We'll analyze this stuff later. Transitions! Uh, yeah, and like skip stuff. That's not a good example. They actually skipped the stuff that I was talking about, but I'll show you later when we get back to the hometown. Um, oh, that little Undertale trill. Oh, and there's the Deltarune on the front of the school again. I... Oh, listen to that. That Undertale tune. This game's gonna destroy us. The later chapters, like, with this music... They are going to break our damn hearts. It's going to be rough. Uh, so does everyone have a... Mm. Oh, Chris. We thought you weren't coming today. Um, not much to say on this part. We're doing group projects this month. Oh, the group projects. Oh, hey, anyway. Um, group projects. <laughs> Eh, interesting. I feel like those the group projects are going to be a, a notable plot device for informing character decisions uh, this month. It's interesting because we don't really know what time of year it is. Um, it's in the school year, but we don't know if the monster schools follow the same school patterns as modern schools. Also, all the clocks are broken in the school, you'll notice. Um, like, they don't match each other. Like, it says 2 p.m. right now on the clock, and obviously it's not 2 p.m., it's obviously early in the morning because school's just started. Um, which is very interesting to me. Because it almost seems like Toby Fox is trying to hide how much time passes in the Dark Worlds. It's a theory that's been budding in my mind that the Dark Worlds experience time at a different pace than the Light World. Because sometimes just too much stuff happens in too brief of a time for me to buy that it just happened r recently. Because, like, in Chapter 2, like, the Queen and her plan gets underway so quickly. Like, even if you think she had a whole day, that's only one day to, uh, to like, pursue so many paths for so much to happen. Um, same thing with the Dark World and the Castle Town and so on. It's just, like, it fe like, I'm beginning to think that time passes a lot quicker in the Dark World. Which is to say that you can have, like, an entire adventure in the Dark World that lasts hours and hours and hours, but then come back to the Light World and only a few minutes has passed. Or only, like, one hour. Like, Chris goes into the Dark World and has a whole adventure in this chapter, and then comes back, and it's just afternoon. Like, it's, like, it's not even nighttime yet. It's still, like, just, you know middle of the afternoon and it's, it, it feels like there might be a, some time warpy shenanigans going on there which you know makes sense if my theory that it's that the dark fountains are tied to determination and determination warps reality so it, determination specifically is known to mess with time or i guess technically it doesn't i mean it messes with time in the sense that it messes with reality but anyway um Walking around by an okay? Uh, you'll notice that uh, Alphys's uh, glasses are square in this timeline, whereas in Undertale they're round. Um, you can you check the time. It seems to be time for class. Hoi hoi hoi. Chris, that the hope is that you uh, choose someone in the class. All the paper is a running slideshow of nature images. And rarely in the middle of two buff superheroes embracing blessing. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you don't want to let that be in your image rotation. It's a bunch of roses. Interestingly, um, you can pretty easily tell where Asgore's been by whether there's flowers. Um, he gives flowers to pretty much anyone he even remotely cares about. Um, and that includes Alphys. Um... Uh, and Toriel, of course. What? What am I watching on my phone? It's schoolwork, of course. Animated schoolwork. 
Yeah, Alphys is still an anime nerd. <laughs> Nothing's really changed. Uh, hey, Chris, have you chosen a partner yet? Don't worry, Mew Mew. You'll always be my partner. Alphys, why are you such a degenerate? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, anyway. I feel bad. <laughs> I know that a lot of the community hates Alphys, which feels bad because, like, I don't know. If I was an Undertale character, I'd probably be Alphys. Sad face. Um, don't worry, Mew Mew always be. So this confirms that Mew Mew Kissy Kissy Kill Kissy Cutie still exists in this reality. So that's interesting. You'll always be my partner. God, gosh darn it, Alphys. <laughs> why, why are you this way? Looks like motivational quotes from various literature. Try your best, Astral Wolf, even in your darkest hour. That's probably a Star Fox reference. Because Astral. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely Fox, trust your instincts, that sort of thing. Um, all right, here's the squad. Um, here's the class. It's interesting. One thing to point out is that only some characters have dialogue portraits. So, like, Snowy here does not have a dialogue portrait, which would seem to hint that Snowy doesn't matter, actually. Like, some characters have dialogue portraits like Alphys, but she's a holdover character from Undertale, so, like, she might just be sort of grandfathered into having a, a dialogue portrait. Um, because, like, there's no reason to exclude a dialogue portrait when you already have one, you know? It gives the character's personality. But when it comes to new characters, they didn't bother, even though they're in Chris's class. Because, you know, Bradley and Noelle are important, um, and they have dialogue portraits. But Bradley, or uh, not Bradley, uh, uh, Snowy here doesn't partner her i hardly know her because he's still a comedian what do you think of that one funny right no nope. well i got news for you pal i already got a partner scram uh we do not stand snowy by the way snowy is trashed here chris i got the good partner and we're going to be laughing all the way to the bank because i need money and i'm also very funny why are you, why are you like this, Snowy? Um, I mean, to be fair, your mom's dead, so maybe that's why. <laughs> maybe that's why. Um, and then we have Monster Kid, and even though Monster Kid's grown up and has a whole new design and like a mohawk and looks pretty cool, they still don't get a, a dialogue portrait. So it's like I think Monster Kid is still not important in this story. Um, Yo, Chris, show up earlier next time. I end up having to part with Snowy, huh? Um, so that's interesting. So that seems to imply that Chris is at least somewhat friendly with Monster Kid. So that's interesting. It also further demonstrates that Snowy is at the bottom of the totem pole in this society because he's annoying. He's doing like, howdy partner like a cowboy. I guess that's in... I guess the howdy partner thing... Hmm... You know, I was going to say I think it's a joke based off the fact that Monster Kid almost looks like they're wearing like a cowboy style poncho. But but uh, a actually Asgore and Asriel are known for saying howdy as well. As well as, you know, Flowey. Um, but so maybe this is Flowey's way of mocking the dreamers. Like, this is, fly, or not fly, this is Snowy's way of mocking the Dreamer family, who used the term howdy. I'd rather be partnerless than this. <laughs> Understandable. Then there's T uh, Tim and Crisp. Oh, a very sorry. Does Tim already have partner? <laughs> I don't even, I don't even know what to say about Timmy. Or Tim. Black and white hard-boiled egg. Sadly, seems like it already has a partner. It's interesting that Tam is like the knowledge, knowledge, the one who has knowledge of eggs, and that's like a holdover joke from Undertale. But then there's also the, the mystery man who gives us eggs. So it's like, are you important, Timmy, or is your egg important? Like, what is going on? It's black and white hard-boiled egg. Yeah, I'm not trying to talk to the to the egg. Let me talk to Timmy. Tam partner with egg. Yeah, I don't think Tem is important, but it's hard to tell sometimes. Ah, Chris. Okay, so say Bardley has a portrait. He's a new character who's given a portrait, even though he doesn't matter until Chapter 2. So it's like, it feels like the characters on the right side of the class just don't matter. Um, ah, Chris, late again, I see. Hmm, you need a partner? 
Sorry, I'm already partnered with the second smartest student. So they were like setting up Birdley's character like well in advance. Um, so that's good. Though, wait, Chris, now that I think about it, your unique skill set might help us a lot. And I am back. Sorry about that. I had to pause the recording for a moment. Um, let's see what we're we talking about here. Your unique skill set might help a lot. Um, <laughs> no, no, I just want to get an A. Um, I should, sorry, uh, just, <laughs> I should clarify something for future reference. Uh, sometimes I, due to the obscene length of this recording, I do end up having to pause to take care of various things. And uh, so if I if I ever pause while in the middle of a ramble and then I come back and just don't resume whatever I was rambling about, then I apologize. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'll touch back on whatever it was uh, if I interrupted anything. Uh, we want to get an A? Ask us what Chris actually want to get an A. Maybe your mom will be your partner again. So that's interesting because uh, uh, Monster Kid here talks about saying that he would or they would have been cool with being Chris's partner, but Birdly says that Chris's mother, or Toriel, has been their partner in the past. So I'm not sure what that means. Um, I guess it just means that uh, in this instance, Monster Kid would prefer to be partners with Chris over Snowy, but in general. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a little hard to, di to, to dissect. It might just be Birdly being a jerk. That's that's the bottom line, is that Birdly's a jerk. Um, and then here's the best character. Chris, you know Jockington and Caddy are always partners. Um, I remember someone in a different video pointing out that in the game files for Jockington, there are a bunch of different dialogue sprites, like his, uh, his character portrait up there on the top left, and... Like, that's true with all the characters with, with portraits. They have a bunch of different expressions, right? But with Jockington, they're all just duplicates of that face. So he's got, like, five or six character sprites, or uh, dialogue sprites, and they're all just the same <laughs> for some reason. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious that this character is just a joke, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's a pretty good joke. <laughs> I, for He's so throwaway, but everything about him amuses me, so... I wore the ultimate academic when I was in first gym class. It was hula hoop day and she ran hoops for us, so she's being sad. That's her origin story. Seem different, but me and Kenny have a ton in common. A meta ton? No. Uh, we both like breathing and unhinging our jaws. Oh my god, how do I not remember the dialogue in this game? It's so funny. Um, I don't think. Do cats unhinge their jaws? I don't think that's a thing. I just noticed the caddy has an earring. <laughs> Click, click, tap, tap. Taken. Interesting. Oh yeah, and Caddy has a character portrait, um, which means that literally everyone who is not on this side of the class, because Susie hits, sits here, right? So these first two columns are all characters with character portraits, or dialogue portraits. I really don't know what to call those. Uh, I should just call them dialogue portraits. Um, but yeah, they don't. these characters all have dialogue portraits, where none of these three do. That's kind of... I wonder why. I mean, presumably it means these three aren't as important. Um, but that, in but like, is Monster Crid really less important than, than, uh, Jockington? Actually, now that I think about it, we don't know Monster Kid's name. Wow, that just occurred to me. Huh. Yeah, I guess they're not as important. They're still just Monster Kid. They're not even called Monster Kid yet in this game. You have to look in the game files. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> and then here's the best character. Um, I just noticed that she has a tail. Isn't that... I think that's what that is. That's funny. Um, hey Chris, what's up? Did you lose your pencil again here? Are you want you know, the candy cane one or the one with the lights on it? Um, now this is interesting because someone actually pointed out something to me. <clears throat> and now that they've pointed it out, I can't unsee it, but candy cane pencil? Anyway, um, what was I saying? Uh, oh yeah, candy cane pencil. Uh, pencils become swords in the dark world, and a candy cane has the two stripe patterns, so the red and white stripes spiraling each other, and someone pointed out, 
uh, especially since Noel's tied to the Snowgrave route or the weird route, uh, that it's quite possible that the candy cane pencil she's talking about here is the twisted sword. Because you have to use the thorn ring, which is a ice elemental thing, and you have to use a pure crystal. Um, I don't know how the pure crystal ties into it, but just the fact that candy cane sword could very well, like, if that was a real sword and had a, a sprite, it might actually look like a, like a spiral sword, like a twisted sword. So, that's interesting. I don't know if that's actually canon, but until it's proven otherwise, that is my headcanon, because that kind of, it makes a little too much sense. Um... And then the one with the lights on it. A pencil with lights on it. That's interesting. Um, I wonder if that's a reference to, like, the... Hmm. Maybe there's some purified version of the Twisted Sword. Or maybe there's just a good path, like a pacifist route sword that's glowing. Um, something like that. Interesting. Not sure. Or maybe those are both references to some sort of weird route weaponry that we get at some point. Or maybe it's not a reference at all. We want to be partners. Sorry, Bradley. Oh, <laughs> and that's another thing. Um, the only person willing to be our partner is, uh, even though she already has a partner, um, is Noelle. And who do we go to to turn into a serial killer in Chapter 2? Noelle. So uh, just the fact that she, he's al or, uh, Chris is already trying to um, involve themselves with Noelle is interesting. Uh, Group of three, I'll ask if you're sure. Uh, the group of three is kind of funny, considering that in the dark world, the party is group of three. Don't know if that means anything. Um, I think I've already talked about everything. Honestly, I've already, this recording has already gone way too long, considering I haven't even gotten to the first save point yet. So I think I need to pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, not a ton, mind you, but at least a little. Yes, ask. Also, I like the... Uh, like, look at this option here. Yes, period. Ask, period. Uh, it, it's very blunt. Uh, so, that's interesting. Also, it just occurred to me that we have this little soul cursor. I don't think that quite looks the same as the soul cursor in the intro with Gaster. I could be wrong, though. I don't have them side by side. Um, but it, it is interesting to point out because in the Sans... Uh, boss fight in Undertale, uh, he can actually attack your soul while it's in the menuing. So that means that, in theory, the if, if the rules still, you know, if the rules continue to apply, then that is literally our soul right there. Um, just something I note. Uh, but yeah, Chris being super blunt and minimalist when it comes to dialogue seems pretty on brand. Okay, so Miss Alphys, um, is it okay if we have a group of three? Hey, what? No, I do not approve this. Support. But what? But Chris doesn't have a... Well, what are you saying? She was just saying we'd be fine being alone. Oh, nope. I just wanted to know. What is this dialogue font? You know, I just thought about this, but Toby uses this to indicate that a character is speaking quietly. Huh. I, the only reason that sticks out to me is because Andrew Cunningham did a whole video on uh, uh, on uh, the di the narrator, and something he pointed out was that when a when the dialogue's in parentheses, it doesn't necessarily mean the characters are whispering. Sometimes it means the characters are thinking. Sometimes it means other things. Huh. I'm just wondering because like there's moments in the weird route where Noelle says things, and then Chris overhears it and she's like, oh, did I say that out loud? Um, implying that she thought she was just thinking it. And if this is her whispering, not her putting it in parentheses, then then she wasn't whispering. Assuming it's consistent, which it might not be. But uh, assuming the dialogue, the way the dialogue behaves is consistent, then that would imply that this is her whispering, whereas putting it in... Uh, Parentheses is thinking? At least with Noelle? Eh, maybe. Noelle, can you please speak up? Hey. Hi, Susie. It's the girl. Man, y'all are gonna have nothing from me when it comes to dissect dissecting Susie lore because she is 
like she is a, in, in many ways i love Susie because she is a simple freaking character she is just like yo what's up i'm here i'm hungry i'm gonna kick your ass like that's that's Susie. um Choosing partners for the next group project, and mm. oh, and you know another thing that occurs to me is that you could argue that Chris already has a partner because they have you know the player and or Azriel and actually not and or just they have the player and Azriel, so you could argue Chris is already in a group of three. Susie, you're with Chris. Great. I've heard people argue whether Susie's a horse or not. Is that a meme? Is that just a meme? I haven't looked into it. Um, I don't know any purple horses. I don't know about you. Then again, well, I mean, there are yellow lizards like alphas out there somewhere, and everyone else is more or less. Or the 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 like the reindeer are brown. There are bluebirds. I don't think there's purple horses. I'm gonna go on a limb and say there's probably not purple horses. All right, the assignment. Susie's just standing there for some reason. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, while I'm thinking about it, I should probably point this out, because a lot of people were confused by this in some of my other videos. Um, uh, sorry, this is totally random, and it's awkward because the music stopped. But uh, the roses on Alpha's desk are definitely from Asgore. And it's funny, because a lot of people... I pointed out that Alpha's has a crush on Asgore in uh, Undertale. I know a lot of people were really offended. They were, <laughs> they were like, um, that's erasing uh, uh, lesbian representation, and uh, I was I was a little dumbfounded because it's uh, canon that she has a crush on him. It's literally like it's referenced a lot. Um, uh, apparently, not enough for people to remember, but uh, most notably in the Metaton quiz when you first meet Metaton, uh, what, when you, when he asks what who does Doctor Alphys have a crush on, she says. Uh, if you pick Asgore, he goes in depth about how she calls him Mr. Dreamy and, like, she built Metaton to impress him and Alphys is blushing the whole time she's talking about this. It's pretty obvious. I don't know. I just wanted to point that out because I, I almost forgot about it. Um... Oh, whoops. I skipped over that. Anyway, it's not important. How about this? If no one speaks up, everyone gets in trouble. Best teaching tactic ever. Notice that Alphys is sweating, implying that monsters can sweat, so... I don't know. They, they could sweat in Undertale. Maybe that implies they also have blood. Who knows? Hey, there might be a box in the supply closet. There's all the white out Susie and I. Oh, man. I like how both Noelle and Birdly end up simping for Susie, and it's pretty funny. <sighs> Oh god, the lack of music is deafening. I can just hear my own thoughts, and it's awful. Don't worry, Chris. I've always thought Susie can't be so bad, you know? I'm sure everything will turn out fine. And if you have time, could you say hi to her for me? You see, that's her whispering again. Chris, did I saving late was a bad idea? Hmm, it's almost as if you should have, as they say, listen. Man, alas, Chris, I already tried to help you. You are... I hate you. <laughs> I don't actually hate Birdly, but he is kind of a total jerk. Click, click, tap, tap. Don't die. Uh, thank you, Caddy. I mean, she's better than... Uh, I think she actually likes Chris. They studied the occult together, so... Um, that's probably... like it's. She's smiling, but I think she actually would prefer if Chris didn't die. Chris, if I had harms, I would take off this cool hat in remembrance of you. Um... <laughs> Thanks, Jockington. Uh Chris, don't listen to him. It's not that bad. You'll probably survive Susie beating you up. You're just gonna fail when she doesn't do any of your project. It's like we always say, Sis, Chris, you sues, you lose. Uh, that's not very reassuring, huh? Uh, hey, Chris, if you die, can I have your brother's CDs? How do people know about this? How do people? Why does Azrael have a famous CD collection? Is that just his thing? Like, does he? Is that why he has such a collection? Does he not even listen to the music? Does he just collect CDs? Is that his hobby? Yo, Chris, I'm sorry, I just wanted to be your partner. When, and then kick the butts of all those little pieces. Um, Chris, just keep running and don't look back. Mm. 
That feels ominous. Within the context of the Chris killed Azrael theory, this is a really ominous line. Sue's very mean. Sit egg, never hatch. Honestly, Susie's like, give me Susie over Birdly. Like, Susie's like rough, but I mean, she doesn't act as annoying as Birdly. Birdly is malicious. Chris, what's the hold up? Go out there. You're helpless. You're, 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 you're unhelpful. Oh, the egg. I forgot. I almost forgot the egg. The horrible egg emanates a feeling of pity towards you. Man, I've been watching the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, and the narrator in that and the narration in this have... There's some overlap in terms of the, like, style of humor. Uh, I'm just reminded, the bucket emanates a feeling of pity towards you. Like, <laughs> uh, please play some music. Okay, yeah, it's just ate some chocolate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's move on with the story. I'm so self-conscious about how long this video is running now. I'm just like, oh, God. It's going to be here for 12 hours. Chris didn't see you there. Probably because you got hair in front of your eyes. Hey, you didn't see anything just now, did you? I mean, you both have hair in front of your eyes. Hmm. They have very similar posture. No, she's actually a little slouched, isn't she? Chris stands ramrod straight. Can't even say. <sighs> do, 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 do. Chris. Oh, this is an instance of Chris backing away without our input, which is interesting. Um, you'll uh, Chris actually does this a few times against scary people like. Uh, Spamton. Uh, but it's interesting. Chris seems much more likely to back away from an opponent when Chris is by themselves. Whereas when they have friends or wish to protect someone, they're more willing to move forward. So, I mean, I mean that just makes sense. That's not very deep lore characterization. But after the whole genocide route in Undertale involving stepping forward when the player didn't command it, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm a little sensitive to characters moving about. Let me tell you a secret. This is actually pretty important dialogue for establishing some stuff with Susie's character. Quiet people piss me off. Uh, because later on, the Spade King echoes this exact sentiment, which is an interesting parallel, because it's heavily implying that the Spade King and Susie are similar in some key ways. Um, which, okay, there we go. Thank God. Oh. Uh, I think just because you don't say anything... I can't tell exactly what you're thinking. Um, that's ironic um, in so many ways. Um, so the parallels between Susie and the Spade King are interesting because they they both have... I mean, the Spade King has, like, hardcore abandonment issues that lead to violent outbursts. Um, so that could be implying Susie's similar. Like, maybe she was... Maybe, like, if the Spade King is meant to re reflect someone in the real world which is a possibility, then it could be that Susie has some sort of, like, unhealthy home life. Like, maybe her father is abusive or something like that. Uh, or m maybe her mother walked out on her, and so Susie has abandonment issues. I'm, I'm just trying to piece together what kind of backstory Susie might have to justify giving her this parallel with the Spade King. Um, and it's very... I mean, just the fact that if they're compared... Makes me sympathetic more so towards the Spade King than I think I would be otherwise. Because it implies that, you know, in in a different timeline, Susie would have ended up just like him. Um, I can't, oh yeah, just because you don't say anything, I can't tell you anything. This is interesting because this seems like just like a petty threat right now. But throughout both chapters, Susie frequently demonstrates that they actually can read Chris like a book. It's a little intimidating. Um, but more importantly, it it's... It kind of leads into something else that I've been noticing um, about Chris. Uh, and it's part of a theory I'm working on, but uh, I'll get to it later. It comes, it'll comes, it come up again. It's over. I caught Susie eating all the chuck. This was her last dance. Now she'll finally be expelled. Haha, <laughs> come on, Chris. Don't act shocked. You know it's true. Everyone's waiting for it. Although, ironically, in this moment, she's... This doesn't feel like she's actually reading Chris. This feels like she's projecting... Uh, her own fears onto Chris. She, or rather, she's projecting what she thinks everyone else thinks onto Chris. So, hmm. I guess it's more like prior to becoming friends, Susie and Chris 
are kind of neutral in that regard. They like, or like, or Susie isn't actually able to read Chris super well, but once she spends more time with them, uh, they're able to, uh, she's able to read them. All right, Chris, you got me, I'm done for. Just let me say one little thing. Seems like a waste to get expelled just for having a snack. Oh, and this ties in further to her tragic story, which is that she's always hungry, which implies her family doesn't feed her. Um, so that's sad. She's a very sad character. Uh, trigger. Why well, don't just get expelled for some real carnage? Chris, how do you feel? About losing your face. Scary Susie face. <laughs> I love how Chris just collapses like a sack of potatoes on the ground. Look, look at Chris right now. <laughs> he, <laughs> Chris looks like a ventriloquist dummy. Uh, Ed. Chris, you've got a good mother. Oh, here comes a very, like, hard-hitting line in the context of my theories. Uh, it'd be a shame to make her bury her child. Yeah. Okay, right out the gate, um, this is a, like, hardcore callback to uh, Undertale because she buried both her children in that game. Um, so right off the bat, it's like, oof, uh, true, it would be a shame. But also, if my theory is right, uh, then this is a really, like, like, Susie does not understand what a harsh line this is to say to Chris if Chris is really, is truly responsible for Asriel's death. Because, holy cow, this is, like, imagine playing through the game not realizing that's the lore, and then you come back for a second playthrough and you see that line, you're like, oof, that hurts. <laughs> Let's get this over with. We'll get more chalk, mosey back to class, and then Chris, you'll do our project. How's that sound? Don't bother answering. If you haven't gotten it all right now, your choices don't matter. So there's the, uh, the theme. So if your choices don't matter. Now, some people, you know, I guess you could argue that it's not that the theme is your choices don't matter. It, rather, it's the theme of when you are limited in terms of your significance in the world, um, what is the value of your life? Like, how do you find value when your choices don't really matter all that much or don't matter at all? Um, I think that's the real thematic discussion here. Because in Undertale, your decisions mattered infinitely. Like, they mattered way too much. Like, uh, like Chris or Frisk really, like, flat out dis decides the fate of the entire universe. It's actually kind of insane. Um, whereas in this game, I think that this is meant to kind of flip the script. It's meant to be like, you know, like, if Undertale's like, believe in yourself, pursue your hopes, pursue your dreams, and with enough determination, uh, you could succeed. Whereas this game is uh, kind of more meant to be, like, tackling more fatalistic questions or more cosmic questions. Like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, of, in the grand scheme of life, in the, in the grand scheme of the universe, uh, any individual's choices aren't really going to matter. Um... So how do you come to terms with that? How do you accept that? How do you live your life with that reality hanging over you? Let's go, freak. Hmm. It's interesting, because this is the first time Susie just outright insults Chris. Like, the rest, like, she threatened them. <laughs> she threatened Chris plenty, uh, but she didn't necessarily insult them until now. I think there's like special dialogue if you hurry really fast. You look through the frosted window, a blurry yellow object can teach a bunch of blurry bored looking objects. Yep. Locker is locked. The locker's lock is locked. The lock's locker is locked. The locker's lock's locker is locked. The locker's covered in Jockington memorabilia. I can't believe. <laughs> Jockington. If there's not Jockington uh, stickers for sale, then that is a missed opportunity. Ready for the Sadie Hawkman's dance? At this dance, all the chaperones wear giant hawk heads and excruciating students that make contact while dancing. Um, that seems to imply that there are hawk monsters that exist that we've never seen um, on a 
if, if you treat this as being, you know, if you ignore the joke of this line, which is, it is very much a joke, uh, th that seems to imply there might be hawk men or hawk women or hawk people of some variety. Um, but if you don't know what the joke is, there's a thing in real life called the Sadie Hawkins, not the Sadie Hawkmans, uh, dance, which is just a dance. It's like a school dance type thing. Um, whereas this is making a joke on that. Um, they make contact while dancing. Although that part is actually kind of true, because like at school dances, there'll be like chaperones hanging about, be like, oh, you're too close to each other while dancing. That's too intimate. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Make room for Jesus, you know. <laughs> That's not an insult, by the way. I went to a Christian uh, elementary school, a private elementary school, and they uh, they banned Harry Potter from the library. It was pretty funny. They drank from the water fountain. <laughs> People put their mouth in that, you know. That wasn't encouragement, dumbass. <laughs> nope, Susie sweats. Um... Um, Chris, what realized the baby classroom was better fit for you? Hey, actually, I should come with you. Maybe I'll find a better partner in there. Uh, actually, let's not. Wrong way, Chris. Wrong way, Chris. Uh, like, I have, I have a hard time analyzing. You're just going to skip school? What, am I supposed to snitch on you? That'd be rich, huh? Nah, I wouldn't. Get back here. So this is interesting, because it's just sort of establishing in Susie's character that she ain't no snitch. <laughs> uh, so... I wonder if that'll come back later. Maybe she'll be pressured to turn on her friends or, or, or tell the truth about her friends, and she won't. Um, she also is, has a habit of keeping secrets when it comes to like keeping secrets from the world at large. Like keeping the dark world is just a secret between them. Um, if you screw your mom, will have a heart attack. That's interesting because it kind of like they establish very early on that Susie gives. Uh, uh, Susie cares about Toriel, um, which further fuels my theory that she doesn't have a mom in her life, and that her mother may have skipped out. Like I, I'm, like I've already kind of built this headcanon that Susie has a pretty mediocre or bad dad, and so her mom, not wanting to be with bad dad, skipped out, and that left her with abandonment issues, which is why she has a parallel with Spade King, and. Uh, that's also why she has this attachment to Toriel and doesn't want her to be unhappy. Um, also, this is another line that double that hits extra hard. If you uh, if like if you're looking at the world through Chris's perspective, like why would Chris care what Susie says? Why would Chris follow Susie? And this line really kind of hammers home why Chris would change their mind about skipping school. Um, it's because you know they're terrified of upsetting their parents. Um, and their mother specifically. Uh, f and furthermore, if Chris skipping school would give their mother a heart attack, then uh, accidentally killing their brother uh, would probably have a similar, uh, a much worse reaction. Um, she might, she might be reduced to atoms. Um, so you know, just, just this could very easily be argued to be evidence of why Chris would keep secrets from their parents and their family uh, is because they don't want them to be upset. Yeah, so. God, can you walk any slower? Why? She actually says something different if you rush through this. Um, not used to walking without someone holding your hand. Come on, freak. Uh, yeah, you're so nice, Susie. Well, here's the closet. Too bad. We were just starting to have fun. This is interesting, because something people point out when it comes to the whole timeline I listed out in my night video regarding when the cyber world is created, they point out that when we enter here, we're actually able to walk around for a bit before the floor collapses and we fall into the dark world. Um, and there's not really any explanation for that. And we don't know if that only applies to this dark world or if it applies to all the dark worlds. Does it only apply... Um, for a little while after the Dark World was created? 
Because in the future, when we come to this classroom in chapter two, it doesn't let us walk around in there. We just jump right in. So that seems to imply that um, it's only something that can happen once or maybe only something that can happen when the dark world is new. So either that is implying that no one has been in this closet since this dark world was created or... Uh, well, no, that's it. That's what seems to be implying, is that no one's been in this dark world since this fountain was created. Um, or no one's been in the supply closet. So that's interesting. Um, we don't know how frequently people go up to the supply closet, so this could be days, weeks, or months. We don't really know. Um, within the context of my Chris killed Azrael theory, um, the idea that Chris created this dark fountain in a moment of, like, uh, determination, like of extreme determination, um, is an idea that I've considered. Um, and I think that actually works semi-decently. Um, especially, you know, your, uh, is it really dark in there? You'll notice in a moment that Chris... Are you gonna go in or what? Yeah, Chris backs up. That's not us, that's Chris. Chris doesn't want to go in there. Um... And within my theories, that would be explained by the fact that Chris doesn't want, uh, I mean, for, for what, doesn't want to go back to the site of their trauma, but also doesn't want to go to the place where the evidence is. Um, and furthermore, um, it actually kind of would explain, because within the context of my Dark Fountain theory, the idea that these are holes in reality that lead to... Um, this other plane of existence where the angel sealed all of the magic and used determination to do that, then the idea of the dark fountains is that they're like little holes through which water is spewing. But like, it's not water, it's darkness or magic or determination or some combination of those things. Um, but with the grand fountain, they say it's, Rasse says it's pure darkness. And what the best way I can interpret that is that it's just a larger, grander fountain that was or rather it was maybe it was created using a greater force of determination so like instead of being created by some monster like gerson who only has a little bit of determination maybe it was created by a human who has a lot more or if chris really did kill Azrael and then absorb their soul then they would have the determination of two entities so that could be why the Grand Fountain is as powerful as it is and as unique as it is, is because it was created by a unique entity. Um, so that's interesting. If you're going to be a wimp, then I'll... And of course, the, uh, the layman interpretation is Chris is a scaredy cat who doesn't want to go into the spooky dark closet, and uh, Chris was also a scaredy cat when it came to Susie approaching them just a few moments ago. So Chris standing up for themselves near the end of chapter one could you could argue that that's some sort of like bravery arc for them um so you could argue, you could look at it that way have you noticed that chris's hair doesn't have a black outline but susie's does it almost makes chris look like they're a different art style interesting also christ i just noticed how huge susie's hands are like, she could just palm your entire face. What? Terrifying. See, why are you so scared? There's nothing in here but old papers. I have I have pondered back and forth what these old papers are. Um, and, like, whether how it ties into my theory. Well, just the fact that she calls them old suggests the idea that whatever was stored in here, like, this isn't just a closet for, like, supplies. It's a storage closet where they keep old things. And that's why no one comes by it very often, because people don't need these old, dusty papers very frequently. Um, alternatively, like, I tried to find a way to fit this into my theory. Like, maybe the prank that Chris was going to pull involved these in some way. Like, maybe they are, because, uh, you know, maybe they were, like, prank flyers or something i'm not sure uh, chris if you leave me here uh, yeah uh but i'm not sure i think just the fact that she calls them old i think the only real lore i can dig out of that is just that the stuff kept in here has been kept in here for a while that's weird i can't find a switch guess it's further in and that's another thing because if you actually notice uh 
<laughs> if you notice how deep this closet goes, it goes unreasonably deep. Like, this is already several times longer than the entire depth of the unused classroom or any of the rooms in this, in this building. So this is already impossible. Like, this is already impossibly huge. Yeah, as Susie just said. Um, Chris. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. Um, that's interesting. So, I'm pretty sure if you call in the hallways, it does the same thing. I should have tested that before I came in here. I've done it before, but I don't remember. It, it's probably, I'm pretty sure it's nothing because I don't remember it being anything. But just the fact that this doesn't work further proves that we're not already. Or rather, just the fact that the cell phone works but doesn't give the gaster noise shows that at this point we're still in the light world. But at the same time, this closet is impossibly huge. So that suggests we're already in the dark world. So there's some shenanigan... Sh shenaniganery? Shenaniganery? Sh 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 there's some shenanigans afoot. Hey, Chris. I think this closet's uh, broken. There aren't any walls. Yep. Well... We've worked hard enough. If Alice wants Shaksu Macha, she can get it herself. Let's split. Whew. What the? Hey, this is playing on own. Let us. And then it collapses. Also, who closed that door? Because it was clearly the sound of a door closing. Like, that wasn't, oh, and then the dark world swallowed them up before they could escape. That was, someone closed the door. Um, unless we're implying that it was pulled closed by the wind or... But, like, the way Susie says that makes it sound like someone closed it and there's someone to talk to. Like, she's talking to someone. She's saying, let us out. So she clearly thinks that someone closed the door on us. But who? Hmm. I don't have a good answer for that. Like, the Roaring Night? Because if, theory, if my theories stand as they are, then the Roaring Knight could very well be like Rousey and be able to traverse the light world without being seen. So that would explain how they would close the door. Although why they would want the Lightners to come into this dark world is unclear. Alternatively, it could have been Rousey. Rousey might have been the one who closed it. Um, hard to say. That might be a, that might be a mystery for a later day. I'm sorry, Chris falls like such a weirdo. <laughs> like, Chris is so weird. Oh, this is interesting. This wind sound. That wind sound is very interesting to me. Because... That implies some things. Um, I'm pretty sure the only other place you hear that sound... I, I don't remember if it's the exact same sound... But it's a very similar sound to this, the wind that blows after you destroy the world in a genocide route of Undertale. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Let me, let me check something real quick. Hmm. That could be some sort of hint that, uh, that this has something to do with the end of genocide. But it might be a hint to some other scene. I don't actually know off the top of my head. Um... Oh, echoey footsteps. So it's interesting that there's so much just dark abysses throughout this er earlier area. And, like, the implication is that this is already in the supply closet. So it's part of Rousey's world. Um, I guess we should comment on Chris's new design. They're wearing armor. So transforming into this version of themselves, they have gained armor. Their skin has turned light blue. And that's interesting. The, one of the things I always found very fascinating about Chris changing to light blue is that none of the other characters change color when they enter the light world. I mean, they change color slightly, but it's not like they, like, it's not significant. Like, Burnley's still blue. Noelle still is, like, you know, her, her hair being that color and her skin, this, or fur, or whatever, the same color. Uh, Bur uh, Noelle, or <laughs> Susie still turns purple. Uh, they just get slightly more vibrant. Or, like, there's, like, a slight shift, but it's not significant. Um, like, you wouldn't be blamed for thinking that Poop, uh, Su Susie's the same color of purple in both worlds. Uh, 
they're so similar. But with Chris, this is a drastic change. And that implies to me that there's a reason that they look so different. Um, I mean, even their hair changes color. It's not brown anymore. It's blue. It's like this dark, dark blue. And why? And some people would use it to connect them to the light blue soul. I discussed that in my Who is Chris video. But I would argue that it might have something to do with them absorbing Azrael's soul. Like, maybe the Dark World is trying to compensate for the fact that Chris isn't... Like, Chris... Like, it, it, it's trying to transform them into some sort of alternate version of themselves to make them look more vibrant, but it doesn't understand that they're not a monster. Uh, like, it's trying to understand... Like, it's trying to transform them into something more vibrant than either Ralsei or then either Asriel or their base form in, as Chris, but instead they end up looking blue. So maybe that's why is because Chris isn't human. They're like, a, they're more than human. They're a human with a monster soul um, in addition to their own soul. So that might be an explanation. This red, like, s like scarf or like cloth Chris wears on their shoulder is also interesting. It's like a cape or something. And here we get the first menu change. Notably, the menu is different in the light world than it is in the dark world. Um, here are the controls. Please ignore the sound of that car. Um, power. And the power menu is interesting. Here's Chris. Level one, human. Body contains a human soul. Um, some people point out that this might contradict my theory. I disagree. I think the idea with the human soul is that... Uh, is that when a human absorbs a boss monster soul, it's not that there's two souls. It's that the boss monster soul is sort of integrated into the human soul. Like it's like refined or disintegrated or uh, or just fused together with the human soul. And since human souls in general are more powerful, what you end up, a human plus a boss monster soul is still mostly just a human soul. Um, uh, so that's why it says it's a human soul here. Um and this this title here in on the character screen, I like how they abbreviate it to care, like with C H A R, because if it's just said Kara, people would lose their mind, um, or Kara, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, interestingly, Chris's attack is still ten, just like in the Light World, but their defense has dropped down to two, which is actually a much more appropriate stat. Like it, it puts them a lot closer to like characters like uh, Frisk. But it doesn't necessarily translate because the characters in the different worlds don't, uh, in the light world and the dark world, the stats are not comparable. Like, you can be level bajillion in the dark world and have a bunch of attack and defense, but when you go back to the light world, it defaults back to whatever your normal light world stats are. So, like, yeah, so I don't think these stats translate. Um, you'll notice that Chris's special stat is guts, so it's establishing right there that uh, Chris has bravery as a concept uh in their character um or it's implying that they have extra quantities of organs um i do think it's interesting that the guts symbol seems to be represented by a fireball which is reminiscent of the dreamer fireballs that they cast uh asriel and asgore and toriel all use fireballs so uh, that that's fuel that's fodder for the asriel and chris are combined together theory um all, uh, more importantly, though, Chris, you'll notice, has zero in their magic stat. And when you hover over act, it says, do all sorts of things. It isn't magic. Like, that is the most blatant, important, like, this is important. Toby Fox wants you to think this is important. Like, foreshadowing that you will ever see. It isn't magic. They want you to know that Chris, whenever Chris acts in any way, it's not magic. So whether they're using like special super axe in the boss fights or whether they're just using regular axe, it does not matter what it's they're doing. It's not magic. Um, even when Chris shines their soul on other characters to enhance their magic, that's not Chris casting magic, but that's Chris using their soul to empower other people. Uh, and then they do whatever they want. So even then, it's not magic. So that's interesting. Chris, once again, wooden blade, a wooden practice blade with a carbon reinforced core. This is referencing the fact that it used to be a wooden pencil, um, and in the center there's a lead core. Um, huh. I mean, that is a reference to what it is that's a pencil, but it just kind of like occurs to me that lead, 
I don't think lead's made of carbon. Or is pencil lead made of carbon? One second, I'm gonna look this up. It's made of graphite. A form of carbon called graphite. Okay, interesting. So it's called lead, but it has nothing to do with the actual substance of lead. It is graphite. <laughs> That's such. That's so stupid. Why, why is it called that? Uh, but never mind. So uh, Toby Fox is not stupid. Toby Fox is quite smart and correctly cr described this as a carbon reinforced core. Uh, so that's funny. That's interesting. Um, it can be used to make calls. You try to call on the cell phone. But it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, so uh, I have actually tried using the cell phone in every single room in Chapter 1. Like, I, I literally did a playthrough where I tried it in every single room. And then I forgot one of the rooms, and then I reset my save to make sure I got that room. And, uh, spoiler alert, it does nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that the, the sound you just heard, for those who aren't aware, the sound the cell phone makes has been long affiliated with Gaster. So that further... But, well, it's interesting because... It may not be that that sound is associated with Gaster. It may be that Gaster is associated with Dark Worlds, and therefore that sound is is associated with Gaster as well. So it, 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 we might actually be reverse making some assumptions. So like rather than this entire Dark World being somehow tied to Gaster, or all Dark Worlds being tied to Gaster, or Chris's phone being tied to Gaster, instead it could just be that Gaster is affiliated with, with Dark Worlds. And since Gaster is a heavily technology-oriented person, their technology making that sound would make sense. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest Gaster in Undertale might have had something to do with Dark Worlds. Um, their famous uh, darker yet darker uh, photon readings, negative. Um, and I actually pointed out that some of the totems in the core, which Gaster created, uh, are referred to as darkness totems. Um, and there's even like, I'll, I might put it on screen right now, but there's even this shot here, which looks very reminiscent of the... Um, the double doors that lead into dark worlds. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that just Gaster is tied to dark worlds. So that cell phone making that sound doesn't necessarily mean that dark worlds are connected to Gaster. It may just mean that Gaster is connected to dark worlds, which is a difference. Oh, and then there's this. Oh, this is very interesting. The, the save point is white instead of yellow, which is very interesting to me. Um, some people theorize this proves that it's some sort of non-determination based power and that there's a different power that lets you save. I don't believe that for a second. I think it would be absurd to introduce a second cosmic force in your plot that does the exact same thing as an existing cosmic force. That seems absurd. So instead, I think what's more likely and what I think is very interesting is the idea that this save is not a Chris save, or rather this is not like your save file is some, like these save points are things that only you can see. So they represent your determination manifesting in order to uh, warp reality to make a save point. So in Undertale, when you used a yellow save point, that was you, that was what Frisk's determination manifesting made it look like. Uh, these aren't just like in the world, these are your characters manifesting their determination in order to um, make a save point or make a save to their save file. Um, so in, since, uh, so the reason this is white could just be because it, Chris is not Frisk. Um, alternatively, it could be because this is in the dark world. Uh, of course, that raises the question, why aren't there save points in the, in the light world? Um, of course, my angel theory would argue that the reason there's not any in the light world is because that's the angel's world. That's the world the angel has complete power over, and since it has power over that reality, that means that you can't save there. Its determination is the most powerful, and only the entity with the most determination can control saving. Um, by contrast, the dark worlds seem to warp time and space and warp reality in various ways. That's why a simple broom closet can be expanded into an entire kingdom. Can be expanded into an entire kingdom. Um, so maybe reality is so warped here that the angel can't actually control it fully and so or it, it can't passively control the timeline here and so as a result you can save um, but it's like this janky like reality broken kind of save and so it turns white 
Uh, but that those are options. My favorite uh, interpretation, though, is just that it's white because that's what a monster's soul, uh, determination looks like. That's what a monster's save point would look like. And uh, Chris has absorbed the soul of a monster. Uh, and so as a result, um, Chris has their save. Chris has absorbed all of Azrael's determination. And therefore, um, this is what a save point of a human fused with a monster looks like. Um, at times, you see it flickering light only you can see now this is interesting because this confirms assuming this isn't talking to the player which i don't think it is that this is talking to chris and that they have seen it multiple times in the past but if it's not talking to chris it but well let me just ex move forward by second nature you reach out and um, it says empty here because I have, in fact, played through this game multiple times already. So it, it says empty. But normally, if this is your first playthrough, um, it says Chris and it says zero on the clock. Uh, and that is interesting to me because that confirms that even though Chris has a save file, they hadn't used it because the time said zero. So if the time says zero, like if I click save here, Jaru, level one, 602, 16. Um, I've had this, like I said, I've been recording for a little while. Um, then, like, what's up with that? Like, because the implication, like with, with, it's the amount of time, presumably, it's the amount of time since you gained access to your character or your world or your, maybe just your determination. Um, so if that's the case, then that implies that Chris had only made one save file and they made it when they first unlocked their determination. Um, however, at no point does Chris go back to that save file, um, or rather to be more precise, there's no point where Chris saves again. They never save twice. Chris saved once or rather maybe they never, it's actually possible that Chris didn't save at all. Because if you'll recall, um, Flowey, when they first died in Undertale, they automatically resurrected themselves at a point where they unlocked their determination for the first time. And for Flowey, that was in the, in the garden. So it could be that Chris didn't realize that they had access to determination. It's just like how Flowey didn't realize they had access to it. And as a result, Flowey's 000... zero, zero save the one that they made when they first unlocked their determination was in the flower garden and chris well we don't really know where chris's save was um but wherever it was they act when they first unlocked their determination they their save file was generated but they never saved again um implying that at no point did the topic come up um Again, there's no save points in the light world, so it's possible this is proof that Chris just hasn't been to the dark world since they unlocked their determination. Um, within the context of my theories, uh, I would argue this proves that whenever they killed Asriel and absorbed their soul, um, they, as a result, uh, got access to more determination than they should have. Uh, just like how when Flowey first woke up, they had access to not only Asriel's determination, but some of the determination that had been injected into him from the human souls. So that's interesting. Um, so maybe the same thing is what's happened with Chris after they absorbed Asriel's soul. Or maybe they were just so upset by the death of Asriel that their determination w awoke. And that's why they, they got their save file when they did. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so I think that is I I what that, that, I think that's how that works in my theory, in my interpretation of the, of the lore is that Chris made their save file the same day that they accidentally created the dark fountain in this closet. Um, they, uh, the, when they absorbed Azrael's soul, they had an overflow of, uh, determination and that determination not only created a save file, but it also created the castle town dark fountain. Um, it, maybe Chris knew about that, or maybe they didn't. Um, maybe they fled, because if it was at nighttime, they might not have realized that there was a dark fountain pouring out of the ground. Um, 
then again, maybe they did know and they've just been trying to avoid it. Maybe that's why they avoided coming to this closet or they like backed away from it. Um, there's lots of possibilities. And you'll notice that uh, it says by second nature. Um, so that's interesting. By second nature. So since Chris has Asriel's soul, you could argue that their second nature is Asriel. And one moment. All right, let us continue. Spooky audio. There's a lot of mystery surrounding this place and what it represents. I've studied these things for hours trying to, I shouldn't exaggerate. I've studied these things and spent time trying to figure out what they are and what they might represent in the real world or the light world, I should say, and what why are they in the closet? Is this entire space in the closet or isn't it? It's very confusing. Up in the top right, we're going to see Lancer for a brief moment, I believe. Yep. And it's interesting looking at these black pools of liquid and the face shapes on the side. And by face shapes, I mean like it looks like the holes almost form like an, two eyes and a mouth and it's drooling black liquid. And those antenna are like part like antenna on its heads. Within the context of my Ralsei theory, I suppose one option is that this represents the remains of Azrael. If monsters bleed, and if they bleed black blood, as I theorized they might, it's too dark to see anything, then it's quite possible that this is all just um, what remains of Azrael, his dust and a little blood. Um, alternatively, it could be that while the majority of his essence was transmuted into into Ralsei, the remainder still held some of that strange monster power. And so you get ever so faint hints of life in the form of these melty, craggy, black, liquid-spewing cliff faces. These eyes are interesting as well. Oh, and side note, um, you could totally... <laughs> You could totally argue that if my theory on Ralsei is true, then by too dark to see anything, you could argue that uh, my theory is so dark that no one would believe it's true, and so they cannot see it. It is too dark to see. These eyes are interesting. What do they represent? Do they represent the angel? We see similar eyes on the titans that form. When, when you see Rousey's flashback sequence, or his uh, roaring sequence. I've also, I've actually run the audio, like I went and found the file for these like uh, doodads and listened to their audio file and compared it to some of the other sounds in the game and in, and in Undertale to see if I could find any similarities and uh, it's too dark to see anything. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find anything. Uh, nothing obvious. There's Lancer still. Oh, and it is interesting that the first Darkner that we encounter is not Ralsei. It's actually Lancer, uh, which is interesting, considering Re that, you know, Lancer... Ralsei is obviously important. Ralsei is on the title screen with the rest of us, or with Susie and Chris, that is. But Lancer is more is a little interesting. I'm wondering if he may have some grander significance in all this, because... I mean, he is a prince from the dark, after all, and he is also the first Darkner we encounter, which could be significant. Um, this is the point of no return. We can't actually go back. Um, we can't go back up this cliff once we go down it, but I don't think there's anything worth going back and looking at down here. One possibility, especially regarding those eyes, is that the Titans... If this, if these, if the dark worlds were truly created as a side effect of the angels sealing away all the magic and all the determination, then it could be that the titans, and the reason they're so big, is that when you break down the barrier between light and dark, it unleashes a deluge of, um, of magic and determination onto the world. And a side effect of that is that it starts resurrecting, or not resurrecting, but bringing to life, animating things. Just like how darkness are objects brought to life, maybe the Titans are like 
mountains brought to life, oceans, like large pools, like large inanimate objects are turned into colossus-sized um, darkeners. And then there's this. Ugh. This is very interesting for my Ralse theory because it's like a pile of dust. Dust like a monster. Monster dust. And, you know, some people theorize it has something to do with the roaring. And, well, for my theory, I think it's just the little piles of dust left over from Ralse. In the light world, this would just be a little pile of dust. You wouldn't even give it a second glance. But in the dark world, due to its unique essence and attributes, it's moving and breathing almost like if you look at that middle darker part of the pile as being almost like a mouth you could easily draw similarities between this and the um and the amalgamates because uh, the amalgamates were white pure white entities of like melted and turned into gooey breathing piles due to the fact that they still had some sort of determination injected into them. So in many ways, this there's a lot. If this truly is Azrael's dust, then uh, this this little pile here in the dark world being imbued with life by the dark fountain is very similar to an amalgamate in that regard. Here's another goofy looking face. But I mean, just looking at this, like discussing my idea of the oh, there's another dust pile. Discussing my idea of the titans being landscape brought to life by magic and determination um this is literally a cliff like the, literally the side of a cliff with a face on it so this could absolutely be foreshadowing of the nature of these titans oh wrong button meant to click sprint um and then there's these weird dancing things hmm no, I still don't know what those are. They're very strange. The little wiggly doodads. There's something glowing inside. This is very reminiscent of the hole where you find uh, Jevil, or Jevil's tail and the shadow crystal in chapter two. Don't know if it means anything. Take it. Yes. You got the glow shard. It's dark inside. It's dark inside of Chris's soul. <laughs> um... A shimmering shard. Its use is unknown. You can't even use it. Hmm. Its use is unknown. There are occasions where you can actually use this in combat to affect the enemy's sparing ability. It's very rare. You have to use it in very specific context, and it doesn't actually say much about the nature of the glow shard. But it is interesting. It's possible that it has something to do with the shadow crystals. Oh, here's a very interesting part. Not many people know about this. I'm going to show it to you. You can actually die here, by the way. Um, uh, you might think, oh, but you can't because there's not enough of these things. Hmm. Chris's soul looks really weirdly big right here. Maybe their soul is abnormally, abnormally large because it absorbed Az Azrael's soul. They always do nine damage. I doubt that means anything, but... Um, okay, let me just show you something. Um, when you click on this, hopefully this doesn't uh, just, you know, break it once I do it once. You bathe your body in the light. A power shines within you, breaking through the darkness. Hmm. A power shines within you, breaking through the darkness. I mean, you could read that a lot of ways. Um, the idea, namely, being determination, breaking through the darkness. But the darkness is the roaring, and the roaring is going to consume the world. Um, <laughs> a, a light shining in your soul. Uh, very reminiscent of the lyrics at the end of the game. The pain you had melted away, HP fully restored. It doesn't actually say that if you have taken no damage. Um, save. You may notice that there are extensive pauses between recording sessions. Um, so if I go over here and then come back, you bathe your body in the light. A power shines through you, breathe through the darkness. Any pain you may have had melted away. Before it says any pain you had melted away, now it just says you may have had because we haven't actually taken any damage. By contrast, here's some interesting stuff. If I get hit by that, 
Oh, and it missed. I am wasting time. I'm terrible. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and let these hit me a few times. Uh, I might cut it out. I'm not sure. Editing me will let you know if I end up cutting this. Oh, I got. I missed it again. I'm terrible at this game. You have to be a little low on health for this to do what I'm trying to show you. Not quite dead. All right, one hit away from death should do it. Um, okay. For some reason, you punished yourself with the spores. You see, that's an interesting line. I like that's a line where I wish I had more information on what it means, but I don't. Even though it looks like it feels interesting. Like, obviously, within my theories, I would say that Chris punishing themselves for killing Asriel makes sense. Um, Asriel punishing Chris for killing him makes sense. Um, but it's also an interesting little bit of lore that whatever those things are, they shoot spores. And that interests me because it reminds me of Flowey. Because Flowey spits seeds, not spores, but seeds and spores are very, like, basically the same thing. Uh, or they're very similar concepts. I've looked it up. I looked at this line before and looked up spores to try and deduce what it means. But it does mean, at least in this context, the light relieves you. <laughs> it does mean, at least in this context, that, uh, that these things, whatever they are, they are alive. They are presumably plant life of some kind, or fungus, perhaps. And of course, you know, given that I think this entire place is covered in the dust of Azrael, and Azrael became flowery in a different timeline, it is uh, interesting to see hostile plant life in the opening segment of Rousey's world. Um, and I'm going ahead and uh, going to die here in order to show the game over. You die, and this happens. It appears you have reached an end. This only happens if you have yet to reach Ralsei's castle town. Um, if you die after that point, uh, it gives you the, the standard Delta Rune game over screen. But if you die any earlier, you get this. Will you try again? If you click yes, you'll go back to the uh, uh, to the main menu. Or not to the main menu. It'll go back to your save file. And if you hit no, uh, it will. the screen will go dark. And it will play an interesting song. A very sad song. And I'm... Uh, man, this is probably going to destroy my recording somehow. But I'm going to go ahead and play it. Then the world was covered in darkness. Here it is. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna let this whole thing play out. Um, I'm. I might have to talk over it a little bit, just so that way you know copyright doesn't happen. I have had copyright issues before on Undertale music. Um, it's just this really quiet, sad tune, but like sadder than the typical game over music. Da, 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 da. Like, I, I'm such a... I'm trying to read a story into this song, and I feel like there's something there. Like, within my context of the time loop theory, this whole song feels very appropriate for something to be playing at the very end of the game. Whenever you're facing down the reality that you're dealing with and now it's gonna yep i closed the game uh, <laughs> uh let me reopen delta run real quick and we are back let me check the recording let me just do 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 okay yep recording seems fine i understand uh, i've never used obs before so i'm terrified of games closing in the middle of recording and whether that has an impact but yeah so that's what happens if you die before uh reaching Ralsei. it doesn't give you the typical game over screen 
Um, it's very interesting. Um, I feel like there's such a dark moroseness to this game. And I think it's very interesting that the title screen music starts off being very dark and somber and then transitions into that faint piano of Undertale. Uh, it very much makes it feel like this game is tied to Undertale. And not just because it has the same characters, but because it, like, I feel like there's a some sort of important connection. Like the idea of Deltarune being a prequel to Undertale like, I don't buy the idea... They're parallel stories. They're in different worlds. But the idea that, you know, maybe Sans flees this reality and goes to a different... Uh, flees to Undertale to escape the angel and its time loop um, is an idea that I've played with in my head quite a bit. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. It's like, I haven't brought it up on the channel yet just because it, it's... I don't know. It's probably something that everyone's discussed at length before. <laughs> and I don't want to, you know, retread old Garound. Like, Th Sans is one of the most theorized about characters in this franchise. Um, so I don't want to, you know, double dip. In this land, only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. You know, this is just part of this puzzle. But it also feels like it's meant to mean something. Like, maybe it's just, a, you know, oh, it doesn't mean anything, it's to ignore it. But in this land, only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. So, it's saying that, hmm, if you look at this through the lens of the shadow crystal theory, then this makes a lot of sense, actually. Because Jevil and Spamton have seen the darkness of the roaring, of the angel's heaven, of its time loop, and it's only because they've seen that, that they can see the truth, um, that they can see the reality of their world. So while others think they're mad and foolish, uh, in reality, they're the only ones who aren't blind. Um, and it was by putting their eye up and looking through a terrifying crystal. Um, only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. <laughs> And this could absolutely factor into the Ralsei theory somehow. Just the fact that you can only see the way, you can only see the truth of Ralsei by acknowledge, like by blinding yourself with the horror of the Azrael is dead theory. <laughs> and if you, yeah, you could totally interpret it that because I mean it's basically fact that the characters who seem to understand the lore of this world are the characters who are very much seem to have discovered some dark truth. And I think that that's what that line mostly references. Um, it's funny. Oh, one moment. It's funny because uh, this button right here is a total bait. It just makes it harder to complete the puzzle. Um, you can just hit the middle one and then this one and then it solves. Boom. blacked out eyes filled with darkness terrifying and here's the glass the famous glass i mean this isn't the invisible glass that appears when you walk over a spot you're not supposed to this is this is intended glass although it does raise the question who put this puzzle here it's pretty blatant and pretty clear that this was not made by rules card who makes all the other puzzles so who made this that's actually a question I've never considered before. Who made this? This isn't some, like, desolate wasteland. This is an engineered puzzle. Who put this here? The only answer I can think of, like, I don't think Lancer built this, and, and even if he had, he wouldn't have put a note like this. So I think this can only be Rousse. I think Rousse had to have made this. The only question is why. Hmm. I don't know. Very mysterious. Let's progress. More holes in the wall. It's too dark to see anything. Eyes bleeding. Black liquid. Guys, this game is going to be so dark. I'm pretty sure this game is going to be horrifying uh, in, its, in its conclusion when we reach the end. All right. Let's see what happens when we click on one of these. It makes a weird coughing sound. It shouldn't do that. 
that is not a sound that a like a pile of dust should make. A pile of dust shouldn't be breathing, and a pile of dust shouldn't cough when you disperse it. Yeah, I can't believe these are anything except Ralse or Azriel. Oh, there was Susie. Yeah, it, it almost sounds similar to the sound. Oh, and this is interesting. This implies Susie found her own way down through some other path. Hmm. All these piles of... Oh, excuse me one moment. I just noticed what Susie's voice clicks or voice clip sounds like um, when you actually listen to her talk when her her text is scrolling on screen you can actually hear the sound bite that represents Susie's voice uh, every character every major character gets this um, I should have pointed this out back in the classroom when I had op uh, examples to show but like Noel and Birdly they all have unique voice clips um, but characters like Snowy and Monster Kid uh, and Temmy, they all have the generic voice clip, so they don't have a unique voice. Whereas these are meant to represent the the important characters get this. Like Sans has his famous like <laughs> sound effect, which is his, uh, you know, that's what his voice sounds like. It's meant to kind of give us a, it's sort of like a me talk or, a, or like sim talk, like the sims or animal crossing talk where they're not actually talking, but it gives you an idea of their voice, of like what tone to imagine. And I'm just, the reason I bring it up is that I just noticed that Susie's voice is a lot higher pitched than you would expect. Yeah, you hear that? It's like, it's a higher decibel than you, you not decibel. I'm pretending I know words. Uh, Chris, phew. Don't scare me like that. Unless you want to get clocked in the face. Uh -huh. Anyway, enough screwing around. We gotta find a way out of here. Um, where is here anyway? God bless Susie. Uh, I just I don't have to talk about her. It's such a relief. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to find lore in every little piece, and it's like with, with Susie, she's all figured out. She's just she's Susie. Lead the way, Chris. If you sprint. <laughs> she says this. Uh, I just thought I'd show that off because in most Let's Plays, they walk, and then Susie's like, oh, you're so slow, and then she leaves. But if you sprint, she gets irritated that you're trying to uh, outrun her, and she bails on you to because you've made it a race. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh, I'm such a moron. I should have... Oh no! I actually just missed something. Okay, I'm gonna be right back. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut ahead. All right. Um, I went ahead and reset to my previous save in order to get back to this moment because there's actually some missable content right here, um, specifically um, in the menu. Um, nothing to note here. But Susie is in our menu in our party very temporarily. So this is only this is the first time you're able to see this. Um, that's Susie. She has four more attack, and notably, she has magic. And I think that's interesting. I've mentioned before that I think a big part of this being a big part of my in analysis of the Delta Rune timeline and of the how it differs from Undertale and uh, how why there's not magic in the light world, and yet Susie has magic here, um, is pointed out here. Uh, humans still don't have magic. Um, People actually pointed out that at the start of Undertale, you can actually see like a moment where it almost looks like they're using some sort of, that the humans are using some sort of magic when they create the barrier, uh, like even a magic staff or something. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I think that they were just using determination. They're just using soul power. Um, and it just manifested in a way that looks kind of flashy. Uh, we know that determination can do that. There's uh, fundamentally, it does a very similar thing. And we know that the barrier is maintained by soul power. So um, I think that the intro of Undertale, it does not contradict that. Um, point is, Susie has magic, Chris does not. Um, and that's interesting because Susie is not a very magical character. Like, she does learn magic over the chapters, but it's not a main part of her character. Her main gimmick is, me hit things really hard. Um, uh, she is very brutish in that regard. Uh, beginner's axe formed from the mane of a dragon whelp. There's so much to unpack here. One, 
what did she have on her person that transformed into an axe? Well, we just gotta look at it logically. If the other thing was like with Chris's uh, weapon, it's like a wooden practice blade with carbon for score. It's like that's that's fancy talk for a pencil. So this is forged from the mane, and a mane is hair. Um, huh. So this is some sort of hair blade hair axe or is it or or by mane does it mean that it's like the frills of a dragon either way the fact that it's made from some sort of biological material suggests that it like did Susie have like some of her own hair in her pocket and it turned into a weapon <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that Although it says dragon whelp. Like, that's not a metaphor. Unless it's talking about Susie being a dragon whelp. So. There are dragon monsters in, in this game. So maybe that stands for something. Maybe she's friends with one. Or maybe that's what Susie is. Is Susie a dragon? Huh. I mean, I know people have commented that she's a dinosaur, aside from the, the, the memes or whatever surrounding her being a horse, but is this actually hinting that Susie's a dragon? Like a dragon monster? Huh. That's interesting. Then there's the power. Level 1 mean girl. Won't do anything but fight. Attack 14. Rudeness and crudeness are maxed out, and she actually has more guts than Chris. Interesting. Um, in Undertale, the purple soul represented perseverance. Um, so Susie being purple doesn't actually reflect courage, but neither does Chris being blue. So guts being one of their core stats is interesting. Because it kind of implies that even though their outer outer shells may imply that they have certain characteristics, um, their inner attribute is that they are actually just very brave. Hmm. Mean girl won't do anything but fine. Deals moderate rude elemental damage to one foe. Depends on attack and magic. Rude elemental damage. I don't think there's any lore there. I think that's literally just a meme. Um... But regarding her being a dragon, that's fascinating. That's a fan theory I don't think I've seen anyone suggest. So, yeah. Um, I expect 20 piles of fan art of, Dr of Susie being, like, a dragon on my desk by tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that is a joke. Please do not feel obligated to do anything on my behalf. Okay, so I just wanted to show that because the next time we see her, um, it will actually be a different stat. We, we, we won't have the same... Like, we won't have that option to look at that in our party. She, she leaves our party almost immediately. Uh, and by the time we see her again, it actually says something different. So her, her title will change into something else. I think it becomes a, she becomes a dark knight. So you'll see that. Okay, now we can proceed with the plot. Oh, here, I'll do the slow version since I did the, yeah. Oh my god, never mind. You walk way too slow. So, yeah. She bails no matter what. There's another case of our choices not battering. <laughs> um, okay. Here's this part. You can actually die to Lancer right here, by the way. You have to really work at it. It's not easy. Um, you have to let yourself get hit a lot. Uh, and nothing special happens. I've tried it. There's someone up there waving at us. Any idea what they want? Hi, Lancer. And, you know, I see why people made comparisons between Lancer and Sans. Because they're both cloaked in shadow initially. And then when you actually... And they, they seem threatening. And then when you actually encounter them and they talk, you're like, oh, you're just a goofball. So, you know, I don't know if it's actually true that they have anything in common. Um, but the idea of... But I can see the, the similarities in that regard. Oh, yeah, you actually auto-sprint in this section. 
can I get through here without? And uh, yeah, I love how in, in cutscenes like this, you can see like characters can just unleash a barrage of attacks. Like, look how many of these he's throwing. It's insane. Like, can you just imagine him up there going, just yeeting all these spades at us? It's just like Undyne. It's like, you can... These monsters, like, in the, the battle sequences don't really do them justice. Like, they're a lot more powerful than you'd expect. Um, sorry, I'm just pausing here to look at these pillars in the background. I was wondering if those might mean something, or maybe they just, like, form some sort of shape. Like, it almost looks like a pattern, right? Like... But I don't know if it means anything. Those might just be cliffs, like more cliffs. Hmm. Not sure. Uh, you have your force to go down that slide right away. You can't actually turn back. Chris walks whether you would like him to or them to or not. Oh, oh. Oh yeah, the hole. I was like, why can't I click on the hole? But the hole's not here yet. Something about this portion looks really interesting. Like, um, I might show it on screen right here, but like the upper portions of this look like, oh, it's the detailed cliffs. But then when you get down a little bit lower, it seems to transition where it goes from these highly detailed and well-shaded cliffs into this almost abstract representation of what a cliff looks like about what a like what the ground looks like as we get we transition from the question like like i just remember that uh, i should have pointed this out earlier but that whole area is labeled as question mark it's like a series of question marks we don't know what it is um and then once we transition into the castle town everything looks different um even this floor here and i'm gonna put it on screen right here hopefully hopefully editing me does it but it reminds me of this one section in earthbound where you go to this sort of negative place or like this alternate world where everything's kind of like neon and almost and it just reminds me of that in a lot of ways so i wouldn't be surprised if that's the inspiration for toby in that regard oh there's that mysterious music like ralph say it's way too much mysterious music associated with him for him to not be a lore character Susie blocks away. Notably, there's no path down to where we get back into the light world, which is very interesting because, like, in the card kingdom, we are able to escape that way. Huh. We, we escape the card kingdom because we steal the fountain, but then why isn't this here? And you can't even interact. I wouldn't... I would... <laughs> you know, I'm inclined to think this might actually be another manipulation by Ralse. Like, I think this might actually be meant to, like, Ralse knows that we need to go on a magical adventure in order to become friends and have, you know, be happy as people to have our character arcs. And so he blocks off this segment. He uses some sort of magic or something uh, in order to block it off. And that way, whenever he tells us that the only way to get back to the light world is to go to the east, uh, he's telling the truth. But it's only the truth because he's blocked off the actual way out of here. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting, actually. Um, oh, you're not dead, sweet. See, Susie cares about us. She doesn't want us to be dead. And I, I joke, but she was actually like sincerely yelling at us to like get out of the way, get down, you know, run. Um, like she does actually care. She's not heartless. And, yeah, I know what the heck this place is. Me neither. Wonder if there's anyone in that building up there. Hey, this place is an abandoned theme park. You see, that's interesting because you know, Jevil is clearly a clown you'd expect in a theme park. And then when you fight Spam to Neo, it's on a roller coaster, and there's like a theme park in the background. Like, there's a lot of strange, like carnival theme park elements going on. This sort of fun house concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, where are the rides then? <laughs> right? The rides. Yeah, we won't see the rides until the, uh, oh, what's it called? The thing that, the, the carousel. The carousel that Jevil is on and the roller coaster that Spampton's on. So, maybe they abandoned it because there weren't any. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. 
Uh, notably, you can only actually interact with one of these and then it stops working. It'll just say there's no one inside. So it'll be like, you know, it's in a house of some kind and a shop of some kind. Uh, and then an inn of some kind, and then afterwards it'll give the same thing. So like, if I click on this, it looks like a shop, but the door's locked and no one's inside. It's locked. And then if I go and click on this, it will only say it's locked. And I'll say that for all of them now. Um, it's not a very important dialogue. But it is interesting, because it's like there's these fake... Like, oh, I can even click on the door from behind. It's like these houses aren't real. They're fake. And they're arrow shaped. You notice that? And like the buildings are all arrow shaped. There's something distinct. Oh, and like they they're like two dimensional. You can see that. It's like Ralsei drew this place. Like it's like he. <laughs> huh. Oh, and you'll notice that the whole castle looks like Ralsei's castle. Literally looks like the the Delta Room. On the left and the right, you can see the wings, and in the middle. You can see uh, the little circle and the three triangles. In fact, this actually reminds me of the sigil, or like the weird shape above the core in Undertale. I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and put that on screen and put it on side by side for com for comparison. Hopefully, <laughs> if editing me doesn't betray us. But uh, yeah, it actually reminds me of that. Gosh, I don't know what this. There's so much. Uh, like, I, it's there's sometimes like people think I read too much into things, and that's fair. But a castle looms beneath the empty town. There's so many ways to read that because, like, you can tell the staircase leading to Ralsei's castle is it, the it's it's like a perspective thing. It's meant to imply that Ralsei's castle is go you go down some stairs in order to reach it, and so it's actually farther deeper underground than even the rest of the castle town, um, which is the opposite of how things work in the real world. In the real world, the castle is higher up than the town below it, but in this town, it's the opposite which could be a commentary on how it's the Dark World and everything's kind of op opposite and topsy-turvy. But it could also be a comment on Ralsei because he's... And honestly, this is true with, like, the entire Dreamer family in every timeline. But, like, they, they even though they're, in theory, the leaders and the rulers and the kings and the princes, they put themselves on the same level as everyone else. They or it may, they, they treat themselves as civil servants to the rest of, of society. So even though they, they treat their role as being one where they're helping everyone rather than controlling everyone. Um, <laughs> and, you know, another case of me reading into things. A black geyser emerges from it, piercing endlessly into the sky. Beautiful wording. Uh, and... But yeah, people say, you know, I read too much into things. The power of this place shines within you. And people say I too, read too much into things, and that's totally fair. Um, but it's just that so much of this game is designed to be read into. Like, and both games, Undertale and Deltarune. They're like, a throwaway line, a throwaway joke is going to be a joke, but it can also be something important for a character's history and their lore. It can be important for their personality for understanding the greater narrative surrounding them and it can also be very important for understanding the themes of the game so even though these like lines they may not they may not be super meaningful some lines are just jokes some lines are just fluff but there's also plenty of stuff that i sincerely believe has at least two meanings possibly more in some cases so even though i may seem like i'm reading into too much and in many of these cases i might be in many cases, I'm probably reading into things that should be read into. Um, like, if you were to make a list of everything I read into in this video and then put it in a spreadsheet and then come back in 20,000 years when this game is finished and then see how many of my, you know, reading into things were correct, most of them will probably be wrong. But a decent chunk are going to be right. Or at least some are going to be right. And some of them were, like, you should have read into it. So, yeah. Oh, and you notice the green... I never even noticed that before. There's this, like, grass, or moss, or mold, or bushes. What is that? You see that? It lines the sides of this town. Another evidence, perhaps, that Ralsei had the green crayon and was using it? It definitely feels like he drew this world. It doesn't feel three-dimensional. It feels two-dimensional. This whole area. Sorry, I'm just taking another look, because, like, there's this, like, long... 
path leading up to a, a hole. Hmm. Alright, we should progress. This video is going to be so long when I meander about so much. I'm going to have to cut out so much. A castle. Why the hell is there a castle? Oh, and I almost forgot. Uh, the alternative reading of that save point was a castle looms beneath the empty town. It's like, is that a commentary on Chris viewing the town above, the, the hometown, as being empty? Does Chris, like, is that what that's saying? Because if that's true, then that definitely works its way into my other theories. The idea that, you know, Chris is depressed and sees, is, feels like life is hollow after Asriel's demise. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, why is there a closet, or a castle inside a supply closet? Welcome, heroes. You'll notice that right here there's no voice clip, and that Ralph say, mm -hmm. Who's there? Do not be alarmed. I am not your enemy. Please come forward, both of you. Um, and there's Rose, standing on the Delta Rune. Standing above the Delta Rune, in fact. Um, that might have some significance. Um, it's interesting. And some people are uh, something I mean, uh, people are trying to figure out where the Shadow Mantle is because Shaum had it, but it's gone. Um, and one possibility is that Ralse has it right here. <laughs> I would not be utterly surprised if Ralse gives us the Shadow Mantle at some point, or if maybe Ralse hides the Shadow Mantle in a place for us to find it in Chapter Three, um, and tries to cover up the fact that he's the one who found who took it. Um, I wouldn't put it past it because uh, whenever he takes off this cloak, it vanishes. Um, and you wouldn't be able to tell if this cloak was the Shadow Mantle because the Shadow Crystals are invisible, so. Uh, welcome, I am the Prince of this Kingdom. This is all dialogue that is very reminiscent of Flowey because Flowey also calls himself the Prince of this world, and guess what? Ralsei is the Prince of this Dark World. Uh, just like Flowey was the Prince of the Monster World. The Kingdom of Darkness. Hmm. <laughs> That's a pretty broad statement, because it's not just him saying he's the prince of the castle town. It's him saying he's the prince of the kingdom of darkness. So, like, the entire dark kingdom, not just the individual dark worlds, but all dark worlds, he's the prince of? That's interesting. And it's just the interesting, because, like, we meet a king ruling a world, we meet a queen, and we meet a prince. So, and yet the prince seems to know more than either king or queen, so it's interesting. And if he's the only one here, why doesn't he call himself a king? It's interesting. Chris, Susie, there is an important line. Uh, Ralse knows our names. How does Ralse know our names? You see, with my Ralse theory, or my, yeah, my Ralse theory, uh, that he is the remains of Asriel that have been reanimated, um, it makes sense that he would have memories of Chris. Um, and thus, knowing Chris's name makes perfect sense, because he's Ralse, he's, he's Asriel in a way. Um, just like how Fly inherited Asriel's memories without actually really being Asriel, um, Ralse isn't really Asriel, but he's inherited his memories nonetheless. Um, and so him knowing chris makes sense but him knowing susie makes no sense chris and susie had no relation susie seemed to have no connection to um to their family beyond admiring toriel from afar and in fact in chapter two susie goes out of her way to say that she's never met asriel and that seems a little interesting it feels like that's important like toby fox put in that line for a reason because why would they need to go out of their way to make it clear that Susie does not know Asriel, unless Asriel's past and Asriel's memories play a role in this narrative. So the fact that that Ralsei knows Susie mean it can't be coming from his him being Asriel. It has to come from somewhere else. So how does he know about the Light World? How does he know about Susie? Um, well, excluding some mysterious power that allows him to. Um, tr 
traverse the light world or somehow, which seems to be canon. Uh, it doesn't make sense for him to not be able to traverse the light world. But even if he could traverse the light world, he doesn't say that he has. He says that he's been stuck here forever. So that implies that he hasn't gone to the light world. Because if he could, he probably would. Um, but he doesn't. So that's interesting. Um, so it, it can't be that he left to go meet them and saw Susie from afar. So the only option is the shadow crystal, as far as I can tell. Because the shadow crystal lets you see visions. So I'm thinking that Rousse has a shadow crystal or possibly a pure crystal. Um, it may be that that's why he has the shadow mantle. Maybe he wanted it or maybe thought they'd need it. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, either way, I think having a shadow crystal might be the only currently deducible evidence or uh, explanation for him knowing who Susie is. Um, and him knowing who Susie is is just one of the many things that makes sense. So it's suddenly explained by the shadow crystals showing what they do, uh, and specifically showing the previous time loops. Um, there is a legend in this land. And it's interesting because I don't think Krause has the type to lie to us. I don't think he would bother. I think Ralsei may lie by exemption. Like, he might avoid telling the truth. Or rather, I don't think he lies outright. And I know I'm kind of fanboying over Ralsei, but I'm really truly thinking that's the kind of person he is. I don't think he would lie. I think he would uh, lie by omission, by just not mentioning something. But I don't think he'd lie outright. Um, so I don't think he's lying when he says there's a legend in this land. I think that this... I mentioned in my Child Crystal Theory that I think he tells Susie and Chris this in order to give them hope. Um, and I still believe that. I think that's still a factor. I think that's what motivates him to say this. But I think it also... I think it's not just something he made up. I think it doesn't make sense. So... Or I think it makes more sense that this exists. And especially since Lancer knows about this. Um, Chris, Susie, there's a legend in this land. Where did the legend come from? I mean, the legend would make sense if there's shadow crystals, and the shadow crystals let you see the past time loops. And you would be able to see the future in effect, thanks to the time loop. So the legend could have easily been created by some oracle, or just someone who had a, who just, in reality, was just someone who had a shadow crystal. So this legend existing could absolutely be explained that way. Hmm. Interesting. A legend that one day two heroes of light will arrive and fulfill the ancient prophecy foretold by time and space. Yeah. The thing is, time and space can't talk. So how did they foretell anything? And it's an ancient prophecy. So this is something that has existed for a long time, and it may exist have it may be ancient because it's existed for countless time loops. Please, heroes, listen to my tale. So I'm not going to do this sequence twice because it's a huge hassle, but if you choose no, then Lancer comes in and says, hey, don't you know who I am? And it's a funny sequence. So I recommend you go looking it up. But the main thing to point out is that he points out that he is a teardrop shape. He is the teardrop shaped darkener from the prophecy. And we're going to see that in a moment. Um, but just the fact that, that that proves that the prophecy is something that multiple people know about. Um, even though it's ancient, uh, there's, it's, there's still a prophecy. Um, and the only people to talk about this prophecy are, are Rousey, or not Rousey, 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 um, Rousey and Lancer. They're the only ones who ever talk about this prophecy, um, which is very strange. Um, you could argue that the king semi-talks about it indirectly or like references it in some ways, but he doesn't outright address it, I don't think. Um, Sean might talk about it too. I'm not certain. I might be misremembering, but I th it's it's a, for such an important prophecy. It's not discussed as much as you'd expect. Also, I'm trying to remember. Let me take a glance at something real quick. But that that uh that symbol below Ralph say the the Delta rune. Are the triangles flipped? Like, are the triangles oriented the way that they're normally f oriented? I'm going to look that up real quick. 
Okay, yeah, I was right. So the version that is above Toriel's door is... Yeah, it's specifically the, the one above Toriel's door that's inverted. Not... Okay, weird. I wonder why that is. Maybe it's like a, some sort of like protection charm in their culture, like... Kind of like how in Catholicism, like, a priest will come and bless the corners of your house in order to bless your family. So maybe that's a thing in the angel religion where they put a the inverted version of the triangles above your door in order to safeguard you. Or something like that. Um, all right, listen. Very well, then. Once upon a time, a legend was whispered among shadows. It was a legend of hope. It was a legend of dreams. This feels like a reference to Undertale. It was a legend of light and dark. Hopes and dreams. That, that's interesting. This is a legend of Deltarune. Two triangles pointing up, one triangle pointing down. There's the teardrop-shaped Lancer that Lancer... Or, teardrop-shaped Darkner that Lancer claims he is. Represented by the moon, curiously. But if this harmony were to shatter, a terrible calamity would occur in the form of the roaring, presumably. The sky will run black with terror, presumably caused by the darkness of the dark fountains, and the land will crack with fear. Maybe because the land is coming to life in the form of the titans? Maybe that's why the earth cracks? The earth will draw her final breath? That's interesting. It's personifying the earth as a living creature. Three peers appear at world's edge. The plural use of worlds there is interesting, as if it's implying that it's at the edge of multiple worlds. And a prince from the dark. And Rousey looks like, yeah, the prince from the dark looks like he's surrounded by, like, little floating fire, just like how the dreamers use. And banish the angel's heaven. Only then will balance be restored. The world saved from destruction. Today, the fountain of darkness. The geyser that gives this land form. Stands tall at the center of the kingdom. But recently, another fountain has been arisen. This is interesting because it shows that Ralsei can actually see physically the fountains in the distance. And we don't know if that's because the Card Kingdom and the um, the uh, Card Kingdom and the Castle Town are physically adjacent. It might be because they are just, uh, just it might just be because th that's why. But it might also be because they're all in this, like the dark worlds exist in a, the, sa the same plane of existence. So it's possible that when the Cyber World Dark Fountain was created, Ralsei could like see it on the horizon, just like he saw the Castle Town or the, the Card Kingdom Dark Fountain. Chris, Susie, thank you for listening to my long tale. Um, gonna be right back. I have to go get my family food, so I'm gonna. All right, and I'm back. I actually paused the recording right there for like several hours, hilariously. Uh, back to the game. Chris, Susie, thank you for listening to my long tale. I deeply believe you two are the heroes of the legend. Like, I think Ralsei's text sound right here is actually using the generic sound right now. So, I mean, if anything, I'll have to hear his voice again in a moment and compare and contrast. Um, but if that's true, then uh, characters like Father Alvin not having the uh, unique voice could just be a just a thing characters could do. I mean, we know the characters like Sans can talk without using a voice clip or change their font, so it's entirely possible that that's not that the, the lack or presence of a voice clip may not be important. It may just be a bait. That despite whatever enemies you may face, you two have the courage to save the world. phone that was my phone making a noise ignore that uh you two have the courage to save the world that's hilarious no no it's not it's not hilarious it's interesting because both of them have guts in the menu so the fact that ralsei is placing emphasis on courage is interesting delta warriors please want to accept your destiny <laughs> yeah that's an interesting line within the context of the time loop 
Please, won't you accept your destiny? Hmm. I guess Ralsei's logic here is that he wants them to come to terms with their fate. He wants them to accept their destiny rather than fruitlessly rebelling against it. And instead just enjoy the time they have rather than wasting it being upset. So that's interesting. And Delta Warriors. Like, we've never really discussed this. The idea of what does Delta mean and Delta Rune. Um, like, I'm pretty sure the Delta, the word Delta is connected to triangles. Um, I don't have the information right in front of me, so don't quote me on that. So that makes sense, given the Delta Rune includes several triangles. So, but beyond that, it's, I'm uncertain what the significance of that is. Well, what's important about triangles? Why are monsters and... Uh, such represented by triangles instead of anything else. Hmm. I wonder. Let me check something. Okay. I was just checking one more time to make sure that the uh, that the uh, triangle symbols are c consistent between Deltarune and Undertale. Because I wasn't sure. But yeah, the symbols seems to be consistent in that regard. No. Yeah, and uh, I think that's pretty hard foreshadowing, too. I don't think, when it's revealed the nature of the time loop, I think Ralph, or, uh, Susie's going to rebel harder than anyone else against it. I don't think she'll be uh, cool with that. In fact, if anything, I expect she'll be the one to flip out at uh, Ralph Say over keeping it a secret, um, despite his good intentions. Um Something interesting, I'm just going to point this out now before I forget, but if you look at the text box, look look at the corners of the text box, uh, you'll notice that in the light world, the text box is just that, it's just a box, it's nothing special. But here, the corners have these emblazoned, like, wing shapes, or something. It's unclear what that represents, but it also has these little color, these little colored uh, diamonds that are shifting between a variety of colors. And I wonder what that means. I'd have to, if I took that into an editing program and then copied all the colors and to see what colors it's flashing, that might be interesting. It might mean something, it might mean nothing, but it is interesting. What? <laughs> I noticed that the, that Ralph says cloak is sweating. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Me, some kind of hero or something? You've got the wrong person. Yeah, Susie doesn't think highly of herself. But Susie, without you, the world will... So what if the world gets destroyed? It's none of my business. Might even be kind of fun, honestly. Very edgy teen thing to say. and it all, But it also reflects on the fact that Susie's just not a very happy person. Um, she's been kicked around by life, and uh, she's not... Not in a good place mentally. Uh, I think, I think all three of these characters need each other really badly. <laughs> like Ralse is just like desperately lonely. Chris is, hor both Chris and Susie are pretty horrifically traumatized. I'm pretty sure from their various histories. Uh, Chris, if Chris is Frisk, or like if Chris is the Delta version of Frisk, and my theories on Frisk are correct, then I suspect Chris may have had a decent chunk of trauma before even being adopted by the dreamers so uh throw on the asriel death and chris is a walking pile of misery same as uh susie so i do notice that susie actually has orange uh accents on her design so her being so brave makes sense because orange was the color of uh brave of the of the of the bravery soul uh in in Undertale, uh, which reminds me, I, I've, I've often wondered if I should do a video going through the characters and the worlds and settings and seeing if the color theory, like if the idea of the soul colors accurately reflect people and places and personalities uh, consistently, like was the art design of this entire franchise built around the colors meaning something? Um, I don't know if that's true. I, I'd have to do some research, but uh, it might be an interesting topic for a video. So let me know if that sounds interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Chris, if you want to play pretend with this weirdo, 
Stick around. I'm going to find a way out. I'm going to find a way out of here. Um, yeah, and she even has a heart belt, if you notice. Her belt looks like it's roughly orange heart-shaped, in addition to the orange spikes and the orange accents on her boots. Huh. You know, having spikes makes so much sense if she's a dragon. Like, that, like of course a dragon would have spikes. And of course a dragon would have sharp teeth. Like, that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, anyway. Susie, wait. It's the boy. It's the mad lad himself. Uh, Lancer. Um, ho, ho, ho. I, I, I'm not going to have much theory crafting material to give about Lancer. Uh, I guess I'll point out that the, the hole in the center of his face, where his eyes should be, it's shaped like a shaped like a spade, and I really just have no idea what kind of biology he has. Uh, it's very strange. The heroes are already running away, and they didn't even know I was here. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, if you th remember that Lancer is a playing card, and this is the form that manifested from that card, it's like, man. These characters get, these Darkeners get radical designs. Like, whatever power is bringing them to life and giving them these forms is very creative and also very random. Uh, like, why does one playing card look like Lancer and another playing card looks like Clover and another playing card looks like uh, Jevil? It's like there's not a ton of consistency in terms of what cards become what. It's, it's interesting. But, what does it mean? Who the hell are you? I'm... The bad guy. You know, that little moment where he flips, there's actually a moment where he goes completely 2D and he's just like, disappears. That might be a hint at the fact that he's a playing card. Um, you clowns want to steal our dark fountain, huh? You know... The term clown takes a lot more significance within the context of Jevil and the fact that Spamton hates clowns. Hmm. And just the whole, you know, circus uh, and amusement park theme makes clowns a more interesting concept. Save the world from eternal darkness. East. Hmm. It's your only way home. Why is it our only way home? Why does why do the darkners have why do the lightners, why do the heroes have to go seal the dark fountain in the card kingdom in order to get home? Why can't they seal this fountain? It's right in front of them. And it's far less well defended. <laughs> they just sort of take this on word. Or take this sentiment on faith. Yeah, Susie being a dragon makes her kind of a lot more intimidating. It would also explain her weird nostrils, because, like, it's almost crocodile-esque or lizard-esque. I mean, dinosaur-esque is the most common concept, but I don't know. I, I just think, you know, her being a dragon is so much cooler than her being a dinosaur. Lancer busts in. All right, this is the first combat sequence. Act, which is not magic, as we've established. Check, warning, compliment. Flow shirt. Sell at shops. Act. Um, I guess we'll warn him first. There won't be much for me to discuss in combat situations. Yeah, Susie doesn't know how she got an axe. Um, I actually missed what Lancer said just then. 
he said his bike is powered by something. Okay, he just says his bike is fueled by victory. For a second there, I thought he said it was fueled by justice, which would have further tied into my Gerson theory, but oh well. Um, okay, I've won Lancer. Um, I'll go ahead and show off that you can use the Glow Shard in battle. Um, it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, <laughs> I love to get thrashed. Just kidding, that's you. Um, let's see. <sighs> Lance's attack and defense is actually really low compared to us, but his health in the game files is actually ridiculously high. Um, but his health also changes between fights. So that implies that, at least in the Dark World, your stats, or at least the stats of Darkners, are variable and are tied to their state of mind. So that's fascinating. Not to call a spade a spade, but he's a spade. I don't know if to ride a motorcycle, so he says back on fire. What are you guys doing after this? Bike that's on fire. You tell Lancer he can't tell the difference between his clothes and his body. He seems flattered. His attack power went down. Um, I was just looking at the files <laughs> on Lancer, and apparently if you compliment him twice, he'll see it as insincere, and his attack power will go up. And then if you compliment him three times, he'll be confused, and his attack power will go sideways. So that's hilarious. Mike's running out of fuel. Alright, you punkaroos. You had the luck of the draw this time, but next time, the losers will be you. Ha 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 ha, bye losers. I gotta get home before dinner. Come on. Are you two okay? Let me introduce myself more properly. I am... Okay, here's the part we gotta listen to his text sound, see if it changes between him taking off his cloak or not. Jeez, can you take off that hood? I can barely hear you under there. Yep, it definitely changes. Um, uh, so there you go. There's the facts. Although I guess I guess the in universe explanation for that is that he had a hood on, and that's why his voice sounded different, and Susie couldn't hear him properly. So I guess there was an in universe explanation for the voice change. It wasn't just a meta thing. Um, also, you'll notice this cloak just completely vanished. You could say that's just a game choice. It doesn't mean anything. Or it could be because it turned invisible because it's made of shadow crystals, and therefore it's the shadow mantle. Hello, everyone. I'm Ralph Say. Chris Susie, it's ever so wonderful to meet you. I'm certain that we're going to be great friends, and um, best way to leave the strength. Yes, that's where we'll... Got it. See, it's cool, Chris. Uh, we're good characters. I really like these people. I suppose it's just the two of us, then. Chris, I'm a prince, but I currently don't have any subjects. And just the fact that Ralsei calls himself a prince is so suspect. Because <laughs> if he was his own character with no connection to Asriel, he would call himself a king. It doesn't make sense for him to not have... Uh, for him to be a prince, unless he is literally referring to the fact that he is Asriel, or he was made from Asriel, and Asriel is the son, the younger son of a king and queen uh, of sorts. Um, unless we're implying that Ralsei has a king-queen parents that just don't exist, uh, and that he never brings up. Um, so, yeah, the whole situation is very suspect. And you'll notice that in his character sprite, uh, his glasses are 
Well, well and his horns poke up through his hat, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And he has glasses on. And, like, this is another character design where it's, like, in this game, it looks very much like that area from Earthbound that I showed earlier, or I hopefully showed, where it's, like, it's this, like, outline that's meant to be more, like, abstract rather than a fully detailed character sprite or a dialogue portrait, for that matter. Um, so that's just another case. And, of course, he, that changes once he takes off his hat. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, my whole life for you two to arrive. So I'm really happy to meet you. Oh, and that was Rousey saying that, you know, uh, he's been waiting his whole life for the, those two to arrive. Um, so, yeah, that works super well in my shower crystal theory because it's like, yeah, it, he, of course he has. He's been watching, he's basically watching television versions of them. I mean, not really television, but like it's the equivalent of watching someone's live play out over and over and over again and wanting to be a part of that and wanting to be friends with them and wanting to just matter because <laughs> his life is pretty empty and hollow here um so the fact that he finally gets to meet us and finally gets to be part of a real story and have a real life is probably really important to him hope we can be good friends chris you never said how you know our names oh and then you'll notice there that ralsei has a black hole in the center of his chest um, and yet, despite clearly being designed after Asriel, a monster with an upside-down heart, uh, Ralph says the heart-shaped hole in the center of his chest is not that of a is not that of a monster. It's that of a human, uh, which, in my opinion, seems to imply the connection between him and the soul that he lost, um, namely the fact that his soul ended up inside of a human instead of being. Um, instead of being its own thing so um and like i explained earlier uh i think that asriel's soul wasn't just like it's not just knocking about inside of chris i think it literally got integrated into his soul dissolved or fused together with uh chris's soul i think i said i think i accidentally called chris a he my bad uh their soul um uh <laughs> I don't know. I might have apologized in the intro for any accidental mispronouning of uh, the characters, but uh, if I didn't, then I'll, I'll just apologize that of a time. But uh, moving on. Uh, yeah, I think that character design of Railsay's having that black hole in the center of his chest is very interesting and very. I mean, that for like it, it just ties back into my this game is Kingdom Hearts because <laughs> he's just like a heartless, or to be more precise, he's a nobody. But uh, but yeah, the the Kingdom Hearts connections they rain a plenty. <laughs> to be clear, the Kingdom Hearts connection is me kind of just pointing out the irony. I don't actually think Toby Fox references Kingdom Hearts in any way, shape, or form, which is probably for the best. <laughs> um, she must be the sound southeast. You can lead the way, Chris. It's interesting. And then there's this line. I really think we should catch up with Susie. We can come back here after our adventure is over. And like I think this is hinting at the fact that and then I can make you a yummy cake. Perhaps we should save the world first. Like Chris is like Ralsei or Ralsei uh, knows that one dark fountain isn't going to destroy the world. So I think he's intentionally playing up the threat in order to um, make us stop trying to go into his castle and seeing the rooms that he's already designed for us. Um, I'm gonna turn down the music real quick. It seems a bit important. Yeah, um, let me just, I can actually do that here. There, there we go. That's probably good. Um, nah, it's still a bit loud. But yeah, so that's all interesting and all. I think uh, Rasa is a very fascinating character. Um, just seeing the Delta Rune everywhere is so sus. I just think, see it, and I'm like, oh god. Oh, and let's see what the new save file says. Now say the lonely prince is now your ally. The power of fluffy boys shines within you. Uh, 
Are y'all ready to see how high this number is about to go up? It's going to be ridiculous. Woo! <laughs> the breaks between my recording sessions are a little absurd. Um, let's see if I can show off this little detail in case y'all haven't noticed. Is this might be close enough? Can't tell. Mm. Oh, yep, there it goes. So if you stand really close to where I'll say while your sprites are in this direction uh, or facing left or right. If you're facing up or down, this won't work. But if you're doing it sideways, then Rousse will blush. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. I don't actually buy into the whole, oh, they're romancing each other thing. Uh, I think Rousse is literally never been around another living thing, much less uh, someone <laughs> who he wants to be friends with and has admired from afar. So I think the idea that there's anything romantic going on in this game is some... It's some projection. Like, you've seen how Toby Fox handles romance in these games. Like, Alphys and Undyne were not subtle. There wasn't, like, subtlety building up to their relationship. Um, there wasn't subtlety in Noelle's relationship with Susie. Like, even in this chapter, there's overt, I want to be with that person. And even with, like, Asgore desperately wanting to be back with Toriel, it's like, when romance occurs... Toby Fox makes sure you know it's occurring. Uh, hugging someone is not an inherently romantic thing. Chris is hugged multiple times in just the intro of this game, and it is not romantic. So, don't get me wrong, I will defend Ralsei's honor to the death and insist that he is, in fact, a good fluffy boy. Um, <laughs> I regret saying that instantly, but uh, uh, that he is, in fact, a good human. No, he's not human. I can't speak. I, I'm... Um, I give up. Point is, uh, I don't buy the romance angle. I don't think that really... I think that's some copium uh, on the on behalf of the fans. Um, hello, and I'm back from another break. Let us continue. Um, I think... Let's see. I think we already looked at that, so... Let us progress. Does Rousey say anything if we step on these? It looks like a shop, but the door is locked and no one's inside. It's locked. Okay. Nothing of note from Rouse. If we go that way... Come to think of it, how did Lancer get up there? Hmm. Spody rode his bike up the side of the cliff? Yeah, Lancer seems to have Looney Tunes powers, so I would not put it past him. Now, next up here is this tutorial sequence, and it's interesting because there is a comical amount of, like, oh, should have. Should have muted my phone. Um, there is a comical amount of extra dialogue in this intro sequence or in this uh tutorial fight that happens if you do various things like if you attack the dummy a bunch he'll say some stuff if you defend a bunch he'll say some stuff. If you hug him too much he'll say so much uh, if you attack repeatedly but keep missing your attack he'll have different dialogue uh, and of course he has the dialogue he says if you uh <laughs> if you just do what he says and every option you can do he has unique dialogue for and it's interesting eventually though he will if you repeat an action too many times he'll just say uh i've reached the limit of what i think i can teach you today and he'll end the tutorial battle so um i recommend looking it up it's pretty funny um well, great just prepare for the enemy would you like me to teach you how to fight yeah go ahead okay get ready Chris. See that heart, Chris? Oh, here comes the Flowey dialogue. That's your soul, the culmination of your being. This is a direct quote from Flowey, so further tying uh, Ralse to Flowey is interesting. Then it holds your will, your compassion, and the fate of the world. <laughs> interesting. You and your friends will lo lose HP. It is interesting that Chris is... Chris's soul taking damage affects the whole party, but I can only assume that's just a gameplay um, choice. Like it doesn't—it probably doesn't have any lore implications. 
Like, like Chris's soul probably isn't physically or like spiritually tied to those in their party or anything like that. I think it's a gameplay concession, is what you would call it. Zero, we'll lose the battle. I think it's interesting that he says we'll lose the battle, not that we'll die. Uh, might mean nothing, but it might mean something. So please take care and avoid the enemy's attack. Ready? Let's try dodging. You can choose to get hit here, and he says some a different line. I'm just gonna do the. I'm gonna play it out normally. I will point out there is some interesting um, special dialogue. The fighting is unnecessary in this world. There's no harm in a thorough lesson. So yeah, establishing early on Ralsei's pacifist tendencies, um, which he likely inha inherited from. Uh, Azrael, um, in many ways, um, I would assume. Anyway, maybe that's just who Ralsei is. It might, uh, it might be a mix of both. Um, <laughs> it's a little shared, but nothing happened. You found an item. I figured items are self-explanatory, so let's skip over them for now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting if you choose to attack. Oh, whoops, I missed. <laughs> oh, sorry, Chris, I forgot to mention. When you're attacking, press X again when the cursor goes in the box. Huh. It's using the controller tutorial? And weird, you'd think it would say Z instead of X, since I'm playing on PC. Whatever. Um, it is interesting because... Uh, <laughs> wow, Chris, that was an amazing attack. Have you done this before or something? Oof. Like, if Chris actually stabbed their brother to death, then this is a raw line to, uh... To say to, uh... To say this to Chris. Like, that's pretty rough. And it feels like a meta line as well because of the player, but... Um... I think just the implication that Chris... May have a history of violence is very fascinating. Um... Something of note is that if you attack the doll, or the pup, or whatever this thing is called, the dummy, if you attack this dummy over and over and over again, Ralsei will start getting uncomfortable, but then he'll say that if you want to hit him on your journey instead, that he'd be fine with that. And it's like, oh no. <laughs> it's one of those things that's like, that's, mm, that's not healthy. <laughs> uh... Uh, and I think it ties into some of Rousey's character, like he's so desperate for friends that he'd even let them abuse him just to have company, just to have someone. Um, and it also speaks to the Shadow Crystal theory in that Rousey is completely unwilling to um, oppose Chris and Susie. Um, like he, he, he'll talk to them, he'll recommend against or for certain actions, but he won't command them to do anything. He won't force them to do anything. Even when they're acting horrible, he will allow that. Just because he doesn't want to, one, endanger their friendship. But also, two, doesn't want to um, take away what little agency they have. Um, next, let's try defending. Simple blank. Any attack, enemies attacks will hurt you less. Not only that, but you'll gather TP. Watch the orange bar on the left. I'll explain it next. Oh, that's the wrong thing. It's been a second. Great job, Chris. And I've gathered TP. How about throwing that TP on some of my spells? Because he didn't mean enough. It got tired. Now, if you use my pacify spell on it, they'll fall asleep and we'll win peacefully. This is interesting because in Undertale, you won by sparing. And while you can do that in this game, uh, some enemies you can't spare. Some enemies you have to pacify. Um, which is interesting from a philosophical standpoint because the game, the core theme of Undertale was the idea of violence be and pacifism. The, the whole appeal is you can complete the game without killing a single enemy. Um, however, even though you could complete the game without killing anyone, you couldn't complete the game without hitting someone. You still had to use violence. You had to complete at least one neutral route to get to your happy ending. So violence was necessary in Undertale, despite it emphasizing pacifism so much. Um, by contrast, in this game, you really don't actually need to use violence. 
Like, so far, at least. We're only two chapters in. But so far, you can go the entire game without using the attack button once. Whereas, that's not the truth. That's not how it works in Undertale. Also, the dummy's already low on... Oh, I attacked it. <laughs> I forgot. I was like, I didn't attack it. I would never. I said cast pacify. Great, Chris. We would have won the battle by now. I right, just a little more to teach you. Acting. Though this... Through this, even though most violent enemies... Oh, even... Yeah, even yeah, most of our enemies can be defeated through various acts of kindness. Um, Chris, though it's just a dummy, why not give it a hug? And of course, you know, gotta hug Rouse because he is a good boy. Um, Chris, uh, I don't think um, I know what you're supposed to be doing, but <laughs> uh, man. You hug the dummy? Ah, uh, that's great, Chris. Sounds well. The enemy is it. That means you can defeat it by sparing. We can spare all the enemies we meet. We'll never have to fight. But yeah, it's interesting that in a game that is so devoted to the idea that your choices don't matter, it also means that they don't bother forcing you in any particular way, when, at least when it comes to battle. Um, like, you don't have to like there's certain enemies you can't spare but you can always pacify them so i don't know that's interesting it also raises some questions on like what qualifies as ethical self-defense like is using violence in self-defense ethical is what chris or frisk did to asgore is that ethical it's a it's an interesting question um Spared, Chris spared dummies. Yeah, and if you'll notice that when Chris uh, acts or spares, uh, they point their finger and hearts come out. It's a very brief animation, so I actually didn't notice that uh, for a long time, but it's interesting. I wonder what the pattern is on Chris's cloak. Because if you actually look at the cloak that's billowing on Chris's back, it's not just pure red. It actually looks like it has a pattern of some sort, but it's so pixelated that you can't tell what it is. Huh. That's one of the downsides of not having the old uh, Undertale battle system. Um, is that you don't get these detailed, zoomed-in uh, renditions of the characters. Um, which is a shame. It's one of the few, I don't know if I call it like a downgrade, but it's kind of like a side grade. Like, the, 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 they've made it to where these particular sprites, these overworld sprites, they're more expressive to accommodate for the fact that we don't have the in-battle sprites anymore. But at the same time, we don't have the in-battle sprites anymore. And so, I don't know, it's interesting. In most ways, Delta is a straight upgrade to uh, Undertale in terms of mechanics. Um... Or at least the straight progression. Uh, but in that particular regard, when it comes to getting high high resolution renders of the characters, uh, we don't get as many choices there. Although they do compensate for that sometimes, especially with certain uh, important characters, like big bosses. Like uh, Queen, we only get her normal sprite, but she turns into Giga Queen, which is in many ways like a you know, higher resolution depiction of her. And with Spampton, you know, he gets a zoomed in giant form that gives us the equivalent, a high resolution uh, depiction of him. Uh, so there's still the ways that they kind of work around the limitations of this system. But it definitely, it's, it's definitely a case of like, this is a sacrifice that had to be made in order to accommodate the multi-party system. Because it, in Undertale, you didn't need to see Frisk because they were, uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, they were, you know, what's to show. Um, you know, it's just, they just stood for you. You didn't need to worry about what they were doing on screen. Um, but in this game, you have a whole party of other characters that you need to be able to see. And so there's the only way really to accommodate that was to completely reshape the battle system. Or at least reshape how the battle system is displayed. Um, Rousey's calling us a wonderful student. That's ironic, considering Chris 
actively sleeps through class most of the time. Um, but they're also still the third highest in the class, despite the fact that they sleep through class. So, maybe that's true. In case you need a fresher, I wrote a manual for you and Susie. Press trial to open the menu and use it in your items. You got the manual. Something interesting about this, the manual specifically, it's just a dummy. Um, I gotta talk about the dummy in a second, but first, the manual. In the game files, there's actually, like, unused, uh, like... An, an unused version of the manual where you actually get some art and the last page is like a doodle of uh Rousse saying um i look forward to meeting you and what's interesting about that is that in the undertale demo like the undertale demo um not the deltarune one uh there was a booklet that came with it, like a demo booklet or something like that an instruction manual type thing and at the end of th and that booklet featured flowey and at the end of that f uh, booklet it had a picture of flowey saying that he can't wait to meet us in the full game so it's another like that's an obscure freaking uh reference that once again ties rousey and flowey together so that's fascinating also, you notice that, uh, I just noticed, but, like, Rousey is entirely green, except for this random, uh, scarf that he, that he's wearing. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the same color of red or pink that, uh, Chris is wearing. Which is interesting. It makes me wonder if that's meant to be hinting at their connection. Possibly. Oh, and then there's the dummy. Um, the dummy is uh, very similar in design. And it's more obvious when the dummy loses its clothing in Chapter 2, but it's very similar in design to the dummies that you see in Undertale, uh, namely the tutorial dummy that you fight in the ruins. Um, but also, to a limited degree, it looks like the, the mad dummy and glad dummies. Um, so... That's interesting. However, despite my best efforts, uh, there doesn't seem to be any hint or indication that this means anything beyond the fact that it's another dummy. Um, like, this dummy doesn't even imply that it's alive to any extent, from what I can tell. Um, whereas the dummy in Undertale was hinted to be alive and then later confirmed to be alive because it had a ghost inside it. Oh, I just remembered. We should look at Ralsei. Ralsei has a red scarf. Uh, a basic scarf made of lightly f magical fiber. So it's just some sort of cloth. Um, and unlike the rest of Ralsei's design, which is like up for debate what part of it is like important to his character, um, this is probably important. It was probably one of the items that was used to make Ralsei. And so it's made of lightly magical fiber, which is interesting. Fiber. I wonder if that's implying it was made from Azriel's fur? Hmm. The fact that it's red is a little spooky. Although Chris's pencil or sword doesn't look the same color as a regular pencil, so I suppose the color doesn't mean anything. Um, very interesting, though. I wonder what this represents in the real world. Maybe it's some sort of scrap of clothing they mentioned that uh, Azriel's track uh, jacket or whatever has is a tear in it so maybe this red scarf is a piece of that outfit hmm you'll notice that Rousey has a gargantuan amount of magic like way more than anyone else Chris had zero Susie had one and Rousey has seven which is huge um, Rousey is an intensely magical entity, um, which is interesting. Uh, Rousey has the same amount of defense and slightly less attack. Um, whether this has any significance beyond the fact that he's a mage, I'm not sure. Um, and then there's... Oh, and you'll see that Chris's description has changed. They are now not a level 1 human. Uh, body contains a human soul. They are now a level 1 leader. Uh, who commands the party with various acts. 
Um, and this only happens after encountering Rouse. So that's interesting. Oh, okay, and there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, looking at his stats first, uh, kindness is maxed out um, with a little smiley face next to it. Uh, <laughs> Which, you know, you could very easily point out that uh, that, that simple-looking smiley face is very, very reminiscent of Flowey's simple-looking smiley face. Although, you know, uh, that's, that's my, that might be a stretch. Uh, even so, um, it's pretty well established in the Undertale and Deltarune games that uh, smiling is often a bad thing. <laughs> Uh, the bad guys, the people trying to kill you, often smile a lot. Whereas it's usually when they stop smiling that the fight starts to wind down and things start to get less violent. Um, fluffiness is another attribute. And guts. He, uh, he has the guts stat, even though he... Oh, did it say dogginess for a second? The, uh, the, that, that's a Easter egg that you can actually get in here. Oh, I... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to slow down the footage and oh ah Come on, come on, come on. Boo! I, I can't, I keep just like skipping past it. But yeah, you can randomly get the dog on... Oh, I keep missing. I'm done. I'm not looking at it anymore. You can randomly get the dog, which is just a reference. It's just a... Any, the annoying dog is a joke. It is not lore relevant in any context. Um... So, beyond that, uh, he's fluffy, he's kind, and he has a gut stat, but he hasn't built it up yet. And that's interesting, because over the course of the game, and I think over the course of maybe Chapter 2, but especially Chapter 1, Ralsei has to learn to kind of assert himself a little. He's very... <laughs> he's very inclined to be subservient to the will of those around him, which is my way of trying to avoid the use of a word that uh, people freaked out about in the comments <laughs> to, <laughs> because they're degenerates. Um, moving on to his description. Uh, lonely prince. Dark world being has no subjects. Uh, it's debatable if you can be a prince if you are not in possession of subjects, which further supports the idea that his princeliness comes from not, not from being in a dark world prince, but from being a light world prince in the form of Asriel. Um, the fact that he's called a dark world being is also something that I discussed at length before, just because it's strange that they don't just call him a darkener. Why don't they call him that? Why is he called a dark world being? It implies that that's somehow different from a darkener, which is interesting. And then we get, we oh yeah, we got the, we got the tips and tricks. You tried to read the manual, but it was so dense it made your head spin. Unlucky. Okay, here comes the grand doors. These doors are unnecessarily intricate. It's kind of crazy. Oh my, the great door is opened. Um, it is interesting. I mean, I guess it makes sense that this door would be so huge and fancy because it's literally the door between dark worlds. Like... If dark worlds have their own separate, like this is the point in when these two dark fountains touch and intermingle. So it makes sense that it would create a pretty fancy uh, door, it create or just a fancy, crazy looking point of contact. Uh, no Lancer was able to come through. Although this does raise an interesting question because this implies that it wasn't Lancer that opened the door. It implies that someone else opened it. And we know the Grand Door exists regardless of whether the, the uh, Card Kingdom exists, because this door is still here in Chapter 2. So, that would seem to imply that someone either got into Rousey's castle town without him knowing and opened this door, or 
someone opened it from the other side. I guess the point I'm getting at is that the implication that I would assume is being given here is that the knight is the one who opened this door. Um, which is interesting. <laughs> Makes you wonder why. What's the goal here? Why? Oh, well, I guess the logic would be that the knight told the king to defend the fountain against the lightners. And the fact that Lancer showed up here, how did Lancer know that the, the, the Delta warriors were arriving in Rousey's castle town? Someone had to tell him that. So it was probably the knight who told Lancer or told the king and Lancer that they that the heroes would come from the west and that they needed to go there to cut cut them off at the head uh, or cut them off at the pass I guess um, would be the correct turn of phrase and so the knight is probably the one who opened these doors and then cuz they they wanted to try and take them out early huh Yeah, I think that's the only way that this makes sense. It would have to be. I don't, I, like, there's other ways of looking at it, but I don't think any other way like makes as much sense in the greater narrative as just saying that the knight is the one who clued them in and helped them arrange this ambush in Rousey's castle town. Once we pass through this door... It's interesting, because it feels like the, Rousey had a moment there where he gave dot, 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 and I wonder if he was thinking about the Roaring Knight whenever. And then once he started thinking about the Roaring Knight, it made him think of something that he wanted to tell Chris. Our adventure will really begin, because now we're in the realm of the night. Um, a journey foretold exactly by the prophecy. The, prof the prophecy of the Shadow Crystals, perhaps? Um, hmm. Journey foretold exactly by the prophecy. Chris. Interesting. So he immediately follows up. Like, he knows that there's something that's about to unfold and that it has been foretold and that is playing out exactly as it's been foretold. In other words, he's saying, you know, fate is predetermined. That's what he's saying here. And then he's. This line is him saying. That even though he acknowledges that, he still believes that your choices are important. So even though your choices don't... Even though your choices won't affect the outcome, that doesn't mean they're not important. That's what Rousey believes. That's his philosophy. Hmm. He is very much in a, of the opinion that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Your life isn't defined by how you die. Or the, and it's not defined by, how, by the fact that you die. Your death doesn't define you, it's your life that defines you and the choices you make in that life. That is the attitude that he has. This world is full of like, all kinds of people, Chris. If Ralsei has been looking into that shadow crystal and seeing all sorts of stories playing out in various dark worlds and various peoples lightners darkeners the knight the angel it makes a lot of sense that he would know yeah there's lots of kinds of people in the end how we treat them makes all the difference so yeah again his philosophy is that it's all about the friends we made along the way <laughs> which is a joke but it's also the truth um when it comes to this worldview, it's just that it's not about um, it's not about what happens at the end. It's about you and the people you make and the relationships you build, the bridges you build, the bridges you burn. Your choices and how you interact with those people defines your life. It makes all the difference, even if the ending doesn't change. So I think that's what his philosophy is here. So let's try to get by. Do our let's try our best to get by without fighting. So yeah, he's still once again a, a pacifist. He sincerely believes that the happiest life, the happiest outcome that Chris can have, will be resulted, uh, will be produced.
from a pacifist playthrough. That's what Rousey believes. Flat out. That is just what he believes. Um, and given our experience in Undertale, we have no reason to doubt that. But it is interesting. If we can manage to do that, I believe this tale may have a happy ending. <laughs> That's interesting. It makes It just makes you wonder, does he think that the time loop can be broken? Or is this saying that the ending will be happy, not because you changed the ending, but because you have your friends there with you. That you've built a community of good, kind, happy people who care for one another. And so even though you can't actually change the outcome, at least you won't be alone at that ending. So I'm, I'm inclined to think that's the interpretation. But I also would not put it past Rousey to be a little hopeful that there might be a slim chance of breaking the loop. Um, but I think I think uh, Rousey's outlook, like what he represents compared to the other Shadow Crystal wielders, is like with with Jevil he shows, um, oh what's the word? It means pursuing your own pleasure and gratification above all else. Um, one moment. Uh, Jevil is a hedonist, is what he is. Um. <laughs> yeah, so that's what Jevil... Jevil shows the path of hedonism, um, which is to say that he chooses his own happiness, his own pleasure and satisfaction, and, and his own fun above all else. That was his reaction to discovering the truth of the angel. Uh, Spamton chose... lived in denial... And he desperately searched for the power to defy that fate. Um, which is part of why I think Spamton hates Jevil so much. It's because Jevil is at peace with his reality, whereas Spamton has never been able to accept his reality. Um, they, are, they are the opposites, philosophically speaking. Um, and then there's Ralsei, who... Rousse is sort of like the ethical version of Jevil, where even though he do, he's at peace with this path, he doesn't just because you can't. He doesn't believe that our lives don't matter just because we can't control the ending. He thinks they still have worth and meaning and significance even without that. And that's what makes Rousse's philosophy unique: is that he is the optimist. He is the he is. He's sort of like the anti-nihilist, is what he is. He uh, he insists, even in the face of all contrary evidence, that things matter. That there is intrinsic worth in things, even if evidence seems to contradict that. So, that's interesting. Otherwise, I fear that you may not find the result favorable. And this is very interesting wording, because... <laughs> He's not saying it'll be an unhappy ending or a, a, a bad ending. He's just saying you just might not like it. He's not even saying it'll be like a full Kara genocide route type thing. He's just saying you won't like it. It just won't be fun. It won't be a good time. Um. <laughs> but once again, he's not saying you shouldn't do it or can't do it. He's just saying if you do do it, you might not have a good time. Uh, and he wants Chris to have a good time. That's why he's saying all this. Is that too much? Effort? And there you go. Even now, he's very, very hesitant to put any pressure on Chris or on Susie, for that matter. Um, he does not want to feel like he does not want them to feel like he is inhibiting their agency at all. I can handle it. Chris, I knew you were a hero the moment I saw you. Hmm. Interesting. It's funny, because in my theory, the first time he saw Chris would have been in the crystal. So... This, in many ways, seems like Rousey finally giving himself, like, or just Rousey finally 
embrace like being gratified like he wanted to believe that chris was a hero um just from their visions or his the visions that he saw in the crystals and this is the moment where he feels gratified and he feels like uh re reassured that his faith in chris was well placed let's try our best all right Whew. can i go back mm. okay Hmm. <laughs> yep. I don't know why I bothered. I've used this cell phone in every room before, and it never does anything. If it did anything, people wouldn't know about it by now. Alright, here we go. There's that Delta Rune again. That Delta Rune is everywhere. Like, it was... It's everywhere. It's obscene how everywhere it is. This is very much meant to be the angel's realm or it, <laughs> or at least it feels like it like this feels like a place branded by this angel you can't even interact with this door interesting with the door closed behind you your adventure will truly begin the power of adventure shines within you oh and the fact that it doesn't say the, po adve the power of adventure fills you with determination. That, that just says, the power of blank sh shines within you, or bl the blank fills you with power. Um, it has people theorizing that this may be a non-determination-related power. Um, I don't entirely agree with that. Um, like... I think what this is referencing is the fact that in the dark world, levels and experience and stuff, they don't work the same way as they do in the light world, and they don't work the same way that they do in Undertale. In Undertale, L level or level violence, or L levels and uh, EXP just represented level violence and execution points. It was a subversion of, um, that, of, that, of what that normally represents. Uh, your LV and your EXP being high in the real world, in the light world, and in Undertale um, is a bad thing. It means you're probably a bad person. Uh, by contrast, in Deltarune, in, specifically in the dark world, your level is completely separate from your light world level. Um, and you get your level goes up and your, your stats go up independent of your choices you can choose you do gain strength in like the chapter two if you go down the snow grave route um, you do get your stats do go up from killing enemies but your stats also go up and your level goes up between chapters regardless of what path you take um, regardless if you're pacifist or violent um, which is very interesting because that shows that whatever power system, whatever leveling system, whatever magic system is at play in the dark world is utterly different from whatever is functioning in the light world. Um, and there is some evidence to support that whatever this power is, it has to do with your, um, you know, being exposed to things. Like Chris going to new places and meeting new people and building bonds is what fills them with power. Um, and that also would explain why dark... Like, you, you might think it's just a lightener quirk that their stats increase no matter what they do or where they go. But even the darkeners work the same way. Not only does Ralsei's stats increase, but Lancer's stats in-game change between his various battles. By the time he fights Susie one-on-one, -on -one, his health is through the roof. It's like in the thousands. Um, actually, let me double check that real quick. Yeah, uh, I was right. So when you first fight him in Ralsei's Castle Town, uh, Lancer only has 540 health. Which is still huge. Like, it's still a gargantuan amount of health. Um, <laughs> um, like, to compare for context. Um, yeah, Chris has only... Uh, Chris has 90 health, and Ralsei has 70. Susie has, uh, I think, more than either of them. But 
either way, even Lancer at his weakest had like several times more health than I than anyone in the in the fun gang. <laughs> um, and then when you fight Lancer later in the forest, his health is all the way up to eight hundred. And when you fight Lancer even later in the car castle, when uh, Susie fights him one on one, his health is up to two thousand four hundred. Like there's very few characters in this game uh, that have health in the thousands. Like, for context, when you fight Spampton the first time, his health, I believe, is only, like, in... Like, it's less than Lancer's, I think. Let me double check to make sure I'm, I'm correct on that. Yeah, when you fight Lancer the first time, he only has 600 health. Um, so he literally is weaker than both the second and third forms of Lancer. Um... Or at least, you know, in terms of health. Um, so that's interesting. So that just goes to show that it's possible for a Darkner and a Lightner's stats to change wildly um, while within the Dark World. Um, and that's fascinating because that implies there's some fundamental um element some sort of power that can be accumulated just by existing which is fascinating um and it's also just to talk about the knight like it's heavily implied that the knight is by far the most powerful entity in this game franchise or at least in the dark world um specifically like the it's established that the various, uh, um, like the butlers in chapter two point out that Queen is believed to be weaker than the knight. And Queen, just in her base form, had 1,510 HP. So it just goes to show that, you know, Queen was really tough and really powerful just in her normal form. Um, and that was without her shields. Like her acid shields were several hundred HP each. And in her giga form, she has 4,500 HP. So. The queen was a monster. The only other character thus far in Deltarune to have more health than Queen is Spamton Neo, who had 4,809 HP. Um, but the implication is that the knight's more powerful than all of them, so it's like, no wonder people bow down and worship at the shrine of the knight when they encounter it, because it's an entity that defies logic. It is an entity with power beyond power. Which definitely inclines me to think that this that this this knight, the roaring knight, may have absorbed the soul of a lightner, because it's hard to imagine being that much more powerful than all these other characters without some sort of unique ability. <laughs> Side note, I noticed that it does the music track on screen right there. Does it do that in every area? Because I always notice it in the field of hopes and dreams, but enemies said you're gonna die, I sent Lancer. Thanks, Lancer. It always does. I notice it here, but I don't know if it does it everywhere else. It probably does. I just don't remember it. Um, here's <laughs> there's something funny with this fight. I'll probably end up cutting out most fights because, I mean, there's very little for me to tell you about the deep lore of Rudin or the deep lore of, you know, <laughs> of these random generic enemies. Um, not to call them generic, but you know what I mean. It's like they they don't have names. They don't have backstories. Um, Rune, attack six, defense zero. This ambivalent diamond isn't any girl's best friend. Ha ha ha. Long live the guy who pays us. The only thing that's kind of neat about uh, Rune, and I'll show it to you in a second. Um, oh, here's something funny. Uh, I think you can do it with Rune, but if you read the manual, and then I think this will work. Read the manual. Rudin was bored to tears. <laughs> I'll say cast pacify. So that's something funny you can do. Um, yeah, most of these fights I probably won't have much lore depth to give you there because they're just whatever. They're just throwaway enemies that don't matter that much. However, there is one thing. This particular Rudin does actually have some extra dialogue that you can miss. Or not miss, but it's interesting nonetheless. So right here, 
a different Rudin from the last time drew near. So that text right there is what varies from Rudin to Rudin. Um, so that's interesting. And it, it, like every time you come back, it actually says different text, depending on how many times you've encountered this Rudin. Um, actually, what am I doing? It's far more efficient to convince and then spare. That gets us more money. Quit fighting. It was utterly swayed. I'll say spare Druden. You won. And then if you come back and fight it again, assumedly another different Druden appeared. <laughs> It, it's like that only, I'm pretty sure this only occurs if you do it to this specific Rudin like um, no other Rudin uh, has this property uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, no other enemy I don't think has this like extra dialogue uh, if you fight them over and over again A different route in from last time drew near. Yeah, etc. It, it does. I think the, the narrator or whatever gets a little tired of it after a while. Um, oops. Finally took a hit. Smells like jewelry. What does that even mean? Oh, what am I doing? Uh, I'm just farming money. That's what I'm doing. Or dark dollars or whatever. But yeah, most of this, uh, most of the fights, I'm probably gonna cut out, and I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll just show out, I'll just show the fights whenever they, anything interesting or unique, happens. Yeah, nothing special. Um, you can't actually run away in Delta Rune. I just noticed. You could used to be able to run away. That's not an option in this game. Hmm. Okay, let's progress. If you're reading this, I guess you're dead. <laughs> the answer's funny. It makes you wonder what these trees are supposed to represent. Because these trees show up in the rooms with the Eggman. <laughs> Not not that Eggman. The, the man who gives you eggs. The, the mystery man. Uh, even in the cyber world, one of these trees occurs. And there's no obvious thing on the floor of the unused classroom to show what these trees represent. And if you look at their trunks, they actually look very similar to the art style used in Ralsei's Castle Town. That sort of like neon outline, like if you compare the tree trunk to Rousey's sprite, it, it, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, so I wonder if that's supposed to mean that these are just sort of a, these are just indicative of the dark world in general. Like these are like just dark world plants of some kind. Hey, don't read the sign. It's a work in progress. Hi, <laughs> Lancer. Hi, Lancer. Is in my two favorite people. Psych, you guys aren't even in my top five. Lancer, where's Susie? I love that angry Ralsei sprite. It's just... <laughs> just... He's so mad. He has he has big... He has angry puppy energy, and it's adorable. You mean the purple girl? Ho ho ho. You fools, you're too late to stop me. What did you do? Ha ha ha. It was so simple. She beat me up, so I ran away. <laughs> oh, Susie. Although, you know, Lancer has so much health that she could beat him up for a while before he suffered any meaningful amount of damage. And I love this, like, simplified, like, wet face, like, version of Rousey, where the art style gets, like, super primitive. And that's hilarious. I do I do sympathize with people who prefer this version of Rousey to the, you know, more Asriel-esque sprites that we get in Chapter 2. Uh, so are you just going to stand there? I thought you would at least run to the right. Why? The purple girl's over there. Yeah. Not much to say on that. 
Another thing that kind of interests me, I forget which songs have Gaster's leitmotif in it. These don't contain an item that can heal you. Whatever you do, don't check the tree and use triangle to open your menu. You got it. Sign Lancer. Yeah, it's weird. I'm not sure why it's showing the... Uh... Yeah, it's showing... Oh, yeah, it's like using like a PlayStation controller to explain the gate, like the controls. How strange. But yeah, you'll notice that this tree is different from the trees up here. Um, and I don't think these trees appear anywhere else. They just appear in the, the card kingdom, which makes sense because these are supposed to be like erasers, these candies. The two objects hanging from the tree. Take one. Yes, you got the dark candy. And you'll notice that they're like flashing slightly in the tree. Take one. Yes. There's nothing hanging low enough to take. This whole area feels like you could totally have a secret here. Um, heals 40 HP. A red and black star that tastes like marshmallows. So yeah, this is meant to be a reference to the erasers in the dark, in the light world. Um, let me pull up. Uh, I'm going to try, uh, throughout this playthrough, I'm going to try and tell you what the character reactions are to different items. Um... Like, dark candy. Just because, you know, might as well give you the full experience. Um, if you give it to Susie, she says, oh, she says, yeah, that's good. Uh, if you give it to Rousey, he says, yummy, marshmallows. Uh, <laughs> in Chapter 2, when you use the dark candy on Rousey, um, so Susie r says, hey, feed me. Oh, wait, no, sorry. I take that back. That's just when Susie and Rousey are at the party. Um, I, I misread Susie's Noel for some reason. Um, and if you give it to Noel in Chapter 2, uh, she says, Oh, it's sticky? <laughs> uh, because I guess they're like marshmallows. Um, although, I guess... You, huh, are they erasers? Oh, yeah, actually, reading it now, yeah, they're sticky because they're stickers, not because they're marshmallows. And it's a star. It's a star sticker. And in the light world, if you have any of these in the ball of junk, it says they smell that the ball of junk smells like a scratch and sniff marshmallow stickers. So, yeah, okay. So that's what the dark candies actually represent. They are literally scratch and sniff snickers. So when you see them as being two-dimensional on the tree here, that's intentional. Huh. Interesting. Hey, if you head that way, my troops will thrash you. Is that a threat? I prefer to think of it as an invitation. And if I talk to you again, are you just going to stand there? Nope. Uh, get me out of here. Another enemy? A necklace of rudens blocks your path. I love that. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, different groups of animals have different terms to describe what a group of them is so a necklace of like you know how like with a flock of birds you would say it's a flock of birds you wouldn't say a flock of cows or a flock of you know humans um you, you use it with birds and so with the rudens it's a necklace of rudens uh in real life uh crows uh you don't actually call them a, a flock of crows you call them a murder of crows like like the word murder, like M U R D E R, like I'm going to kill you, murder, which is hilarious. Um, all right, I'm just gonna take care of these guys real quick. I will, I will show you if there's anything interesting. Here is Top Hat, or Top Chef, excuse me. Mama Miba, my latest cake worked me to exhaustion. So I took a little nap, but Mama Miba, a scary noise woke me up. Yeah, the I just noticed that the voice sound clip for Top Chef here is very quiet. I guess that's because I turned down the master sound. I pressed it with water and hissed and ran off, but my wonderful cake is... Chris, that sounds like Susie. Unless we're going the right way. I can't out of any more trouble. 
My Meshiva. You know that beast? Please don't come back. So I, I can only assume that this guy is supposed to be a top, like a spinning top in the light world. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. Remains of the cake are still smoldering. Take a piece. Yes. Broken cake was added to your key items. And then if we go into our key items. Though broken, it seethes with power. A master smith could fix it. That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> I don't have any lore for you there. That's just funny. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that they decided to put this wall here. Like, have you ever noticed this wall? Like, why isn't it just more blackness? Like, more of this black void. Why is there a wall? Why go that extra mile for that? Hmm. I guess it's just to, to spice up the, the the aesthetic. Oh, here's our first Hathi. So, I guess I... Yeah. Um, these are all characters meant to represent playing cards. You know, Hathi's a heart card and uh, runes a um, whatchamacallit a uh, diamond check defend take seven I am a little kiss I don't know what that means is that a reference to the candy like the kiss chocolates or Also, Hathi can't talk, I don't think. So, who is saying this? Why is it highlighted yellow? I'm actually very confused. Smells like a soft kiss. Is it just because she's a heart? And therefore... Therefore... She's associated with kisses? He called Hathi a sweetheart. We began to think about this. Or is Hathi another gender neutral entity? I just I just always called her a hair, but now that I'm now that I'm recording, I need to pay a little more attention. Uh, not that I think anyone cares if I misgender Hathi, but um, Still, I, I should try and use the correct terms. It smells like a soft kiss. Um, before we do that, let's see if... X flatter, what does that do? You would rather say to flatter all the enemies. I'm making tea later on, would you like any? Long live the guys who pay us. This combo of enemies is comically easy to fight. Hathi has a little secret. What, ha what secret do you have? You told Hathi it has cool tentacles? And he can't think about this? Whispering a lovely spell. So Hathi's a magic user. You told Hathi its teeth look like knives. I began to think about this. It's interesting how when you you complete a round with max uh, TP, you get 83 dark dollars. It's such a random number. I guess it varies from enemy to enemy. Here's some more dark candies. Shake the clock. and we solve this puzzle, we'll have to hurry. Hmm. I wonder if this is hinting that it's like noon by this point in the adventure. I've often wondered if time flows at a different pace in the dark world, so I wonder if that's hinting that it's around noon in the light world right now. Probably not. 
Behold the maze of death. Prepare to get lost, clowns, said Lancer. I think we can go a little bit farther. Feeling lost yet? You must be utterly helpless among these twists and turns. Your sense of direction won't save you now. I was going to point out earlier that uh, I think, if I recall correctly, this song, the Field of Hope and Dreams, might have Gaster's theme in it, but I might be I might be mistaken. And even if that was true, I'm not convinced that means much. I'm not, or like I don't know what that means if it does mean anything. Some sort of enemy. It looks like they got clobbered. Rip. Hey, wait. Where am I? Help! Oh, somebody help! I'm lost. Lancer is funny. You open the treasure chest. Inside was white whip ribbon. You put the white ribbon in your armors. That ribbon is armor, Chris. It increases defense. Why don't you try wearing it in the equipment menu? I think it'd look great on you. Let me just check something real quick. Uh, I think he gives different. He gives a different response depending on who you equip it to. Interesting. So, if you uh, start Chapter 2 without a Chapter 1 save file, it actually auto, like, Ralsei's default armor item is the White Ribbon. Um, so, I guess you could argue that proves that canonically, Ralsei is given the item. Um, we're going to hold off on giving it to him just yet, because apparently he has some unique dialogue if you give it to um him when Susie's in the party for the first time. So like if you give the first time you give Ralsei someone the white ribbon, Ralsei has a comment. Uh, if you give it to Chris, Ralsei says that it looks great on them or something like that. Uh, and if you give it to Ralsei, he asks if he looks cute. Um, and he'll say that to Chris, but Chris obviously doesn't respond. But if you're a lot, but if you have Susie, he'll actually say it to Susie. So uh, she might have some sort of funny dialogue. So we'll see. We'll see that when Susie comes around. Um, but interesting point is that. It says a crinkly hair ribbon that slightly increases your defense. The crinkly part is interesting because normally a ribbon wouldn't be crinkly. That makes it sound like it's paper. And if you look in here, the chest is empty. Well, except for some paper scraps. So this is kind of implying that this hair ribbon isn't actually anything. It's not a real hair ribbon. It's like a, it's like a, a hair ribbon made from paper. So it's like a, it's like an arts and crafts item, like something you'd make at school, which makes sense given this is an unused classroom uh, for children. Um, if you try to equip it to Susie, she says, "Nope, not in first grade anymore." And Susie, of course, is so this like hints that yeah, she doesn't just she's not just saying that because she just doesn't she just doesn't want to wear hair ribbons. She's saying that because it's literally an item that children made like almost preschoolers made like in arts and crafts class uh and if you try to equip it to her in chapter two she says i said no come on already uh rouse asks if he looks cute um if you equip it to rouse in chapter two he says it's nice being dressed up uh, and if you equip it to noelle she says dot 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 feels familiar so that seems to pretty heavily imply um that this ribbon was something that noelle made um when she was a child at the school and uh therefore um that confirms that noelle has at least some connection to this classroom and therefore you could argue that proves she's connected to this dark world whether that means anything for the lore i don't know but um i hope you're pleased with that <laughs> what's the item called the uh the white ribbon Hope you're pleased with the white ribbon lore that you didn't know you needed. <laughs> um, whoa, wait a minute. Even if you're my enemy, I've got to warn you. A purple beast is roaming, clobbering anyone who dares block her way. Sob, we didn't even like fighting. The king left us no choice. Oh, Chris, we need to stop Susie quick. Hey, why aren't you afraid? Yeah, um, not much lore to dissect there. Uh, the king is not popular. The king took power by force and is ruling as a tyrant. Um... However, it is interesting to point out that uh, this Jigsari disparages both Susie and the Spade King in the same sentiment. 
So it's yet again pointing out that uh, uh, another parallel between Susie and the king, uh, which is interesting. Hey, don't look. The sense private. Uh, sorry, Lancer. Oh, it's just this way, said Lancer. Ho oh, ho ho, so now you should ride the maze. Don't count your blessings before they hatch. <laughs> Let's see how you fare against this team. Three Hathies blocked the way. Interesting, they don't give Hathies any sort of special uh, group name, like a Murder of Crows or a Necklace of Rudens. Um... <laughs> hmm, I wonder if using the manual here does anything. Uh, let's just do a X flatter. Or I'll say to flatter all the enemies. Out of anyone, I'm glad we randomly encountered all of you. Nothing too interesting. Get some TP. Hey, why aren't you guys thrashed? You're totally outnumbered. I mean, a team purely of support enemies. Their bullet patterns aren't balanced at all. Here's another instance of Ralsei having far more knowledge than he should. Ralsei has never met another living soul, much less commanded them into a battle organization. Like, and knowing bullet patterns and things like that. So how does he know this? How does he know more about this than Lancer, someone who's actually had minions? <laughs> it's another case where Ralsei knows stuff that he shouldn't. Um, and I think this particular knowledge is another product of uh, the Dark Crystal, or Shadow Crystal. Um, because it does not make sense for him to have that information otherwise. It's like a dinner made out of three glasses of milk. And that's um, unusual somehow? Why don't we talk about this after the battle? Notice how uh, <laughs> Ralsei is so polite to Lancer. <laughs> it's pretty adorable. Oh, that's interesting. Let me just point this out. I, I've, I've almost forgotten to mention this, uh, but watch what happens when the soul emerges from Chris during the battle sequence. And watch what happens when the soul re goes back into Chris during when the battle sequence ends. Uh, all right, watch Chris. Oh, there it goes. And watch when he goes back in. In both times, it's the same animation. It's several uh, rings. It's several uh, heart shapes radiating outwards, with it being a red heart shape followed by a white heart shape over and over as it bursts out. Um, and it just goes to show, like, that's, you know, that's another piece of evidence that could be hinting at the fact that, yeah, Chris has a monster soul inside them in addition to their own soul. Uh, or rather, their one red soul is a has been infused with a monster soul. So that's an interesting little detail. Um, spare. <laughs> Lancer. Sup. I thought you were running away. Yeah, I finished. Yeah. Lancer's funny. It's a shame that Lancer's such just a joke character, because he doesn't really matter in the plot moving forward. Which is a shame, because I, I like him. But uh, I get a very distinct... Um, oh, I don't know how to... I don't know what a comparison would be. But I get a very distinct vibe from Lancer that he's never going to be important in the story. Or, like, he's never going to be a serious character. Which is fine. He doesn't have to be, I guess. But it does mean that I have a hard time talking about him in this video. It's like, what am I going to say about... Oh, well, he's gone. Well, it's like, what am I going to say about him? Like, oh, he's funny. 
Like, there's not anything lore there. Like, he's just a he's just a goofer. He's just a goober. Hey, there's Caesar. Open up your stupid door. And there's the Delta Rune symbol again. <laughs> Going through this game with your eyes open, looking for Delta Rune symbols, you start to realize, dang, they are everywhere. It's sort of like looking for American flags when you live in the USA. It's like you don't notice how many there are until you start looking, and then you're like, "Wow, there's just they're just everywhere." <laughs> um, how do you get past those spikes before walk through them? Susie is very tough because she's a dragon, um, but this door sucks. That's my new favorite theory that I've made up in this video: is that Susie's a dragon. I I. I I will continue to believe she is a dragon until someone insists otherwise. Um, it'll open after we solve this puzzle over there. Nice. Tell me when you finish it. Uh, Susie, we need you to finish it. Sometimes proceeding will take all three of us. Furthermore, only Chris can seal the Dark Fountain. Okay, here's an interesting bit of lore. Why? Why can Chris seal the Dark Fountain? Why only Chris can seal the Dark Fountain? That is fascinating. It might be because they're human. It might be because they're a human and a monster, and therefore they're more than any other lightener. But what's but we know that it's tied to determination and therefore to the soul. But that raises an interesting question. It's like, if anyone can create a Dark Fountain, including Birdly and Noel, why is it that only Chris can seal them? Um I touch on this in my in some of my other theory videos, but it's just, it, it seems incredibly likely that the reason is that Chris just has way more determination and way more soul power than, uh, than anyone else. And that's why, uh, it, it's like I said in the, uh, magic video, uh, it, it's easy to pop up, put, to poke a hole in a balloon. It's a lot harder to patch a hole in a balloon. So it takes a lot more power to, reinstate this barrier between light and dark than it takes to uh you know tear it down any random lightner can poke a hole in this barrier and it only takes a couple dark fountains to cause the entire barrier to collapse and yet it takes a monumental amount of soul power in order to fix one hole so how much soul power do you need in order to create this entire barrier between light and dark Logically speaking, you must require quite a few souls worth, and therefore, it seems incredible. Like the evidence seems to imply that it had to be the angel that created that barrier that between light and dark. Um, so that's interesting. If you don't accompany us, you won't make us home. Yeah, one of the other pieces of evidence that heavily argues against the idea of Chris being the knight is just the fact that they've sealed every dark fountain thus far. Um, and it's like, they're not very good at their job if they're going to keep sealing all their fountains. Like, that's not, that's not productive to your evil plan, Chris. Like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah, I, I don't buy that Chris is the knight. You won't make it home. If you don't accompany us, you won't make it home. So you're saying I have to stick with you guys. Yep. Let's just get this over with. Yahoo! Susie's back on the team. Cue the fanfare. I'm just going to take a drink while this plays up. Love that Susie sprite. God bless. That dialogue portrait. Hilarious. And Chris automatically turns to face the screen. Like, <laughs> it reminds me of like Sans going, ha ha ha, and looking at the screen. Can't interact with that. Is Susie in our party yet? Oh, she is! Even though she's not on screen right now, she is actually in the party. Um, her stats have not changed. She's still rude and crude and gutsy. 
mean girl won't do anything but fight. Okay, so she's still just a mean girl. She hasn't leveled up to uh, a Dark Knight yet. Interesting. Okay, now that Susie's in the party, let's equip that thing to Rousse. Uh Do I look cute? Hmm. Oh, I didn't say anything special. Maybe I have to be back at that one spot. Oh, you know what? I think I messed it up. You have to. You probably have to have just gotten the the ribbon, and have Susie in your party. That's probably what it is. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, you probably like. You probably have to not open that chest up till here, and then once you get Susie, you have to run all the way back, and then it gives special dialogue. Um, darn. Oh well, you can probably imagine what Susie says. She's probably like, why are you asking me? Or, or no, or I don't care, or something like that. Oh Chris, I just realized Susie missed the tutorial. Next battle, we should show her how to act. I think she might really enjoy that. Oh yeah, um, I'll go ahead and equip this to Ralsei. Uh, not only is it like lore canon that Ralsei wears this ribbon, um, but it's also just wise to give Ralsei the defensive item since he has very low HP. Look at this cute guy. I love C round. <laughs> I need to. I want to check him, but I need to warn him. I don't want Susie hitting him. Oh, I forgot. It doesn't understand human speech. <laughs> so we don't accidentally hurt it? <laughs> Hurting it's the point, you moron. <laughs> <laughs> Susie's hilarious. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, I think my audio might be peeking out in OBS. I'm gonna go ahead and lower that a little bit. <laughs> oh, ho, 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 ho. Okay. Don't think it's peeking out anymore. Um, <laughs> it attacked us, so it dies. Simple, right? <laughs> it's that's pretty good point on Susie's part. Um, is that you know they attacked us? In fact, that's the that that's the strongest argument for not going pacifist in Undertale. Is that you know the the monsters are all cool and quirky and and cool, you know and nice people and all when they're not trying to kill you, but most monsters show up and try to murder you. Like, they can and will kill you. Like, even if you argue that they're doing it on accident, they're still trying to kill you. Like, your life is in danger. So, if like if we were discussing, like, a real-world situation, it would be completely reasonable to, to stop uh, to, to, or to use violence against them. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm a pacifist. So, <laughs> I, uh, you know, most people who have, you know more neutral approach to violence and self-defense uh, would agree with Susie about this. This is actually like Susie, what Susie's saying right here is the common point of view amongst most people. But Susie, what if the enemy might be um nice? Okay, yeah, there's a word for that. Oh, what is it? Striking first. <laughs> Urgh, you idiots, it got away. <laughs> wow, that was close, Chris. Maybe I should talk to her. Okay, so uh, K round in its norm or C round is is barely cognizant, which means it's actually able to heed our warning. And if you don't warn it, then it does get attacked by Susie. Uh, sorry, I'm very distracted. Um, 
Oh my god. I'm never gonna look at Susie the same again. I never thought of her a dragon until this playthrough, and now I will never unsee it. As heroes, we have the power to make a peaceful future. Mm. So from now on, let's try to avoid fighting, okay? Um, what if you just took it easy on them? If you weaken an enemy, I can use my pacify spell, which can put an exhausted people to sleep. Yawn, yeah, you're, you, you, you're, you talking is already doing that. Well, um, just think about it. You might have warn enemies about her, Chris. Oh, here comes the king. Here, here comes the god king of lore. Or <laughs> the violent tormentor is now your ally. The power of mean girls shines within you. I mean, I forget how much I love this game until I'm playing it again. And I just, I still love this game. Even now. Um, something of note is that you'll notice that Shom's little shop is sewn into the wall. Uh, like, it's sewn into the darkness. Which, I don't know if that has any lore implications, but it is pretty radical. Like, that's pretty intense. Um... Also, has anyone else noticed that uh, it kind of looks like a wig? Like the shop entrance? Like the like there's these arches on the side that branch up into um, in over to the top of the head with the hair. And then like in the top left, you see that button and that's like a hairpin. And then there's these two sh like these two uh, like bandana or hair band or hair ribbons like draped over the front. <laughs> anyway. All right, here is the mad lad whose gender has not been confirmed. Uh, hilariously, we don't actually know what Shum's pronouns are because no one, they only exist in the shop, so no one ever talks about them or to them. There's never any back and forth. Um, it's just Shum. Uh, and similarly, the, the only one time outside the shop that Shum is referenced, and it's by, I think, Mr. Society? Uh, or Mr. Elegance, one of them, the horsey, the knight, uh, he mentions that uh, he asked Shom to come uh, congratulate the heroes after you defeat King, but there was no interest. But even that one time, they don't actually use any pronouns. So we don't actually know Shom's gender. Um, I personally assume he's a he, because he looks like he has a beard, and uh, he's got a radical scar. Like, I don't know. Those are very masculine traits. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to call him a he uh, until further notice. If, uh, if, it's, if it's confirmed in a later chapter that he is not a he, then I apologize in advance. Um, but yeah. So, he he, welcome travelers. Um, dark candy. Mysterious hamburger. Hamburger card. Spook sword. So, no, we don't need any of those. Let's get one Dark Burger. Let's get one Amber Card. And let's get one Spooky Sword. So, we do not need this many Dark Candies. Although we don't need to sell anything, really. Ain't like it's better spent. That's another case of his nihilism showing through. Is like he, he sincerely just thinks, like, you know... No need to rush, since there's nothing important in this world. And don't have anything better to do. Uh, once again, pretty nihilistic. Um, about yourself. Name Sham. Pronounce Sham. Even that line it hints at his greater lore knowledge, just because he's, he's literally making a joke that you can't make in real life, it, you, it only makes sense in written form. So how does he know to make this joke? Um, so that's funny. Uh, also, I like how he clarifies how to pronounce his name, but doesn't use, it doesn't give us any pronouns to work with. <laughs> it's very inconvenient. Um, it's interesting. And actually, while, while we're talking to Sham, I just want to point out how straightforward he speaks. Like, like uh, in my in my dark, Shadow Crystal video, there was a lot of people arguing that Sham is this tricksy trickster who speaks in riddles, and you can't take his words literally. And it's 
I'm gonna be honest, like, by the time this video comes out, I'll probably be over it, but right now, I'm still, like, a, a low-key triggered <laughs> about it. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but I thought reading... I thought Sean was a pretty straight shooter when it came to how he talks and explains things. Like, he's like, here's my name, here's a specific clarification on how it's pronounced. And then, a joke. It's like, he's been very straightforward so far. Over the years, I collected odds and ends. Again, very straightforward. <laughs> Of course, I have no attachment to any of it. It's just a hobby of mine. Like, nothing about this is mysterious or riddly. It's just, yep, I own a shop. I collect things. Don't really care about the stuff, though. Around here, you learn to find ways to pass the time or go mad like everyone else. It's interesting. And this very much feels like a reference to uh, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> like, because I think the Cheshire Cats has a line along the similar lines where it's like, uh, everyone's a little mad in wonderland or he says something similar um and sham is very cheshire cat-esque in a lot of ways um around here you learn ways to find the best of time or you go mad like everyone else uh, and that's interesting it's like who is he referring to when he says who's gone mad is he implying that everyone down here has gone mad is he referring to the king and jevil is he referring to the lightners like wh what's he referring to and what's interesting is that uh most darkeners recognize the lightners as being lightners on site um it and presumably so does sham uh but he doesn't actually draw attention to that fact just, like he's not even impressed by the fact that you're lightners um he's just like totally un apathetic about it um lightners yeah there we go long ago the darkeners lived in harmony with the lightners and this is the thing about sham without sham we would have like 70 percent less lore because he tells us everything about this world in this chapter and the next chapter like without him there's no lore <laughs> that's a slight exaggeration but you get my point he gives us so much lore and he's so straightforward about it long ago the darkeners lived in harmony with the lightners that's a pretty straightforward sentence they were like gods to us, our protectors, our creators, those who gave us purpose. Pretty straightforward so far. Um, kind of makes you wonder what they were protecting them from, though. Hmm. I mean, I understand that these are like inanimate objects that have been brought to life. So it makes sense that he would refer to the Lightners as creators and as gods and the ones who give them purpose. Yeah, it's like if you're a stuffed animal like Shamas, you were created by the Lightners and you were given the purpose of, you know entertaining children or whatever um and you're basically a god to them because you're a higher dimensional being effectively but then the protectors part it's like what are you protecting them from that part's a little confusing i mean you could just argue that you're you know like you protect the darkness just the same way that you protect any of your possessions like the way i protect my computer or whatever then one day we were all locked away in this prison and the lightners never returned again this is all pretty straightforward like Lots of other darkeners say similar things. Embittered, the king took up arms and aims to take revenge upon the lightners that left us behind. Thank you for the backstory on the motivation of the main antagonist of the game. <laughs> um, of course, even among his troops, some still distantly hope the lightners will return. Wow, Sham, you sure do not speak in riddles and are very straightforward and give us tons of lore dumps. Thank you. Historically, this land was ruled by the four kings from Card Castle to the east. Oh, and he's a historian as well, so he's even spitting historical facts in addition to current events facts. <laughs> uh, historically, this land was ruled by the four kings from the Card Castle to the east. Um, yeah, not much lore here. Recently, a strange knight appeared, and three of the kings were locked away. So, yeah, this ties into the fact that um, it's specifically the Spade King who is bitter against the Lightners and wants revenge. And presumably it is that attribute that encouraged the knight to choose the Spade King to be his, his minion. Um, he knew that he would be useful for fighting the Lightners because no one else, none of the other kings would probably have been willing to, uh, um, to fight against the Lightners because, I mean, these are their gods. They worshipped them. They were everything to them. Um... So it was probably pretty rare to find a light, a darkener as willing and eager to use violence, deadly violence, against their own creators. So it makes sense that that's why the knight chose the Spade King. Um, oh, and here's this cursed line. Uh, like, this is the only line that, like... 
even if you want to argue this is th like this isn't Jevil speaking in riddles. This is Jevil just using poor sentence structure. <laughs> I mean, it's not even a terrible sentence structure. Like out of in context, out of context, like it's 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 a fairly straightforward sentence structure. The king put him and his strange son into power. Like the most logical interpretation of this is that the Spade King put himself and his strange son Lancer into power. You could also argue, but like Rules Card hasn't been part of this conversation yet, so it's probably not Rules Card being referenced here. The only characters who have been referenced are the uh, the knight. So you could argue that saying that the reigning king put the knight and the remaining king's strange son. So the reigning king is the knight, or, or is uh, the spade king. And then the him is the knight, and then the strange son is Lancer. And it's saying that the reigning king put his strange son Lancer into power. Also, by the way, he put the knight into power. Like, that's probably more or less the gist of it. I don't think this line is meant to be confusing. I don't think it's meant to be giving us secret lore. I think it's just like... If you squint at it, you realize there's a lot of different ways you can interpret it. Uh, even though there's one clear, obvious uh, interpretation. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say this can be used as evidence against my interpretation of his Shadow Crystal dialogue. Because uh, they're very different. And the Shadow Crystal line was a lot more simple than this. And even this is a very simple line. And the alternatives to what I'm to the basic interpretation of this line are pretty insane and aren't really logical. The most straightforward interpretation of Shams' dialogue is always the most likely interpretation to be true, um, in my opinion. Uh, this land hasn't seen this much chaos since. <laughs> well, you don't need to know about that. Uh, this is interesting because it kind of this is obviously referencing Jevil. Um, and it's interesting because this kind of showcases how you don't actually uh, find out about um, the secret bosses. Almost, like, I mentioned this in my Shadow Crystal video. You don't actually find out about them until you stumble across them. Like, you have to, like, uh, like, Sean hints at Spamton's existence here. Um, and there are, like, one or two, like, hints at the existence of Spamton. Or, I might have just said that sentence wrong. Sham hints at Jevil's existence, and there are like one or two characters who hint at Spamton's existence, but the hints are so vague. Like, this does not hint to you, at, like, this doesn't reveal anything to you about Jevil at all. Like, in retrospect, you can be like, oh, Jevil's associated with chaos, but even that's like not much. Um, and with Spamton, like, the only thing you hear ahead of time is like, he wants the, the sweet cap and cakes to sneak into the castle, and he wants, uh, he didn't like clowns. It's like, realistically, even in the chapters where they hint at the, the secret boss ahead of time, um, the hints are useless. Like, you can't actually use those hints. Like, if you only had that this this hint here about Jevil, you would not be able to deduce almost anything about him. And same thing with this stuff about Spamton. Um, so, it, so... <laughs> Uh, point I'm getting at is that the secret boss that you need the Shadow Mantle to defeat is almost certainly uh, you, there's like nothing that we could possibly know about him uh, at this point in time. Uh, the Mike character that everyone's obsessed about, Mike, <laughs> that Spamton talks about, that that's probably the main antagonist of Chapter 3. Uh, it's almost certainly not the secret boss. Uh, Mike is probably the queen-king equivalent for Chapter 3. But I digress. We're legendary. <laughs> so you're the heroes who are going to seal our fountain. So this shows, once again, that the legend of the Delta Warriors is something that's common knowledge. Um, or, uh, at the very least, uh, actually, no, I take it back. This doesn't actually prove that it's common knowledge. Because Lancer knew about it, but Lancer likely had contact with the knight. And Shom knows about it, but Shom had contact with Jevil and has a lot of lore. Like, he is the master of lore. Shom knowing something does not mean it's common knowledge. Shom knows a lot of things that are not common knowledge. So, um, that's interesting. <laughs> and also, he's, he's very dubious of the word heroes here. <laughs> he, <laughs> that's interesting. He's not even convinced that we're necessarily the good guys. <laughs> Good luck. It makes no difference to me. 
yeah, he just doesn't care. He has no interest in this situation. Like he's not on the king's side. He's not on the darkness side. He's not on the lightner side. Yeah, he just doesn't care anymore. And like he's old. He's tattered. And this kind of hints at the fact that you know objects wear down. Like things like playing cards, things like stuffed animals, they will eventually fall apart. And so that means that, you know, even though darkeners probably can live a lot longer than humans, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can live forever. Um, and, and depending on the darkener, some darkeners probably can't live for a meaningful amount of time at all. So some darkeners probably live a lot less longer than humans. So it's interesting. Although you could also argue that when he says a darkener in my condition, he just means a darkener with his nihilistic view, w worldview. So. Thank you, Sean. Oh, before I leave, there's another Delta rune in the top left. Um, and if we look at his store's items, um, dark candy, dark burger, amber sword, spooky sword, uh, or amber card, um, and you actually compare that to the background, you notice that none of it's there. Um, also, I just noticed that Shom actually shifts to the left when you go into the menu. That's kind of funny. Um, like, it, uh, just above the right, you can see, like, a sword. I don't know what that is. Like, a curtain? Like, a, a poster? Or is that, like, a... Is that a shield? Or just a sign? Not sure what that is. It's a sword shape, but that's not what the spooky sword looks like, I don't think. Um... And then below that, you see some boxes or maybe some letters. And then to the left, you can see what looks like a ring. Um, is that ring important? Is that a reference to the Thorn Ring? Is that a commemorative ring? Did Spamton give Sham a commemorative ring? Did he sell him a commemorative ring? Um, on the top left, you can see a potion, several potions. You can see the Tammy Chang doll. Um, on the far left there, it looks almost like a miniature oven on the top shelf. I'm not sure what that is. It's hard to make out. It might just be another strange container. Um, and then on the bottom shelf, you see a crystal ball and what looks like a dumbbell or some other object. Like maybe, and then there's a bowl, like a cracked bowl. The cracked bowl reminds me of like the Lord Vessel from Dark Souls, but beyond that, it's like, what is it? What, what, is, what are we even looking at? Um, yeah, it's like, typically there's not lore hidden in the background of shopkeeper places, but it is, I figured I'd point it out just because it's interesting. See you again, or not. Yeah, God bless Shom. Shom is the source of all lore in this franchise. Um... Spooky sword. Spookiness up. Increases our attack by uh, a fair bit. Um, if you try to give it to Ralsei, he says, Oh, it's too scary. A black and orange sword with a bat hilt. So, you know, it's a it's a, it's a pencil with bats on it, and it's orange and black. Um, and if you try to give it to Susie, she says, Ugh, it's too small. Um, and if you try to give it to Noel, let me find out real quick. Nope, not, not Twisted Sword, Spooky Sword. Okay, some people think that the, the, the sword in the background of Shaman's shop is, is actually the Spooky Sword, but it specifically says that it's a black and orange sword. And the Sham, uh, I guess that could be the Spooky Sword. Hmm. Oh, whatever. Um... Oh, if you try to give the pencil to Noelle, she says it's kind of cool. So, oh, and you know what that is? It's referencing the fact that she likes scary things. Um, <laughs> and she likes Susie because she's scary. She likes uh, she likes the feeling of being scared. She associates it with her childhood. So. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, the only the only reason I wouldn't argue that this is the yeah, like 
just to go back into Shump's spot for a moment, is like, the it says that the hilt is that of a bat. But I don't really, like, I don't think that hilt on the sword in the background there looks like, looks like a bat. I mean, I, like, if you want to get really abstract, you could say it's bat-like, but I don't really buy it. Um, but yeah. Yay, mean girls. All right, I'm going to take a break here, and I'll catch back up with you guys after my break. All right. And I'm back. It's been a second since I was playing. For context, here's how much time it's been. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of just leave the game on in the background when I'm not playing. Uh, <laughs> um, this has been going a bit slowly, so let's try. I'm going to try and get to cast to the card castle this place this uh, this recording session. Um, hey, kid, you want to buy a tutorial? <laughs> Play fifty dark dollars. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> it's Jigsaw Joe, the most likely candidate to be the Roaring Knight. Did you know that? It's true. Really? I really buy it? Right this way, gentle nurse. We're sorry, we're normally puzzle guys, but we've been forced to do tutorials just to make ends meet. When the king got power, he fired everyone and replaced all puzzle makers with him. Rules card, lord of the puzzles, the roaring knight, be careful. Rules card being the Roaring Knight is still just... It's either my greatest contribution to the community or my worst. I'm not sure. Didn't even give us severance pay. What a monster. His son just gave us all beanies. Itchy beanies. <laughs> That's enough. Donation hole. If you like our tourists, please throw money in the hole. Yeah. Dollar in the hole. The hole became full. Hole is filled to the brim with cash. Mm. Whole goals. One dollar monthly tutorial weekly. Ten dollar weekly tutorial monthly. A hundred dollars stop making tutorials. I, I can I can empathize. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god, I hate how their face moves about. That's weird. Uh, I guess it's not that weird. Uh, didn't I think Temmy does that in the Tem shop in Undertale? I'm Chris, Master. Ask me about Chris's. You see, it's interesting because it doesn't really make sense for these things to know anything about Chris or about Susie or Ralsei or anything like that. It's really utterly outside their realm of expertise, but they know it, and I have to assume this isn't lore relevant. I mean, it's possible this is lore. Uh, it's not. It's not as overtly a joke, but it feels like this is another gameplay concession. Um, reviving. When HP goes negative, your friends fall down. But bringing them back is easy town. Pain, plain foods and spells work like a charm, and with a mint, you can cure all harm. Even normal items and spells can revive people, huh? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Actually, that, sent that, that sentiment was not actually very revealing about Chris. So maybe this is lore. Like, this is fact. Like, it's not just a gameplay concession. And maybe it's just that they don't actually know anything. <laughs> it's a good idea to give us bucks. I'll make you. It'll make you happy and fill you with lux. Over there is our donation hole. We had a box, but it got stole. That's one of my favorite little things. That's 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 so funny. Um, actually, yeah. So far, these uh, yeah, these this Chris facts are not very relevant to Chris at all. If you only act, you might start to think. Oh, sorry. If you only act, you might start to think. What about the guy with the scarf in pink? So it is a pink scarf. If you know acting will make the enemy friendly. Hmm. <laughs> Then you can ask me to spare on the same turn. Or cast Pacify if you don't look get tired. If you plan ahead, a lot can happen in one turn. Hey, who's the master here? Me or you? 
Well, Rousey actually has justification for his lore knowledge, whereas you know nothing. So yeah, so far... Yeah, so far, the, the, for, for being the Chris Master, this guy knows nothing about Chris. Later, kid. Yeah, this... Okay. So this isn't lore-breaking. This is just... They don't actually know anything. I'm Susie Master. Ask me about Susie's warning. When Chris uses warning, Susie can't hit. So make sure to... So there's no reason to use it. Unless... Unless it's, you wanted not to hurt. So there's no reason. I'm Susie Master. Okay, yeah. Nothing special if you say it again. Susie loves when you give us money. She will... Nope. Don't care. Did I say something funny? Yeah. Okay, so these guys don't actually know anything. The fact that they know our names is a little like, huh. Ha huh, ha. How do you know that? But it's not impossible for them to have heard, heard it through the grapevine, so to speak. Um, attack. Susie always attacks the foe on top. She'll smash them with a crushing chop. She always strikes at the first thing she sees. Oh no, oh no, she's looking at me. Oh, look at his face. <laughs> oh man. Later, kid. I'm Ralsei, Master. I'm about Ralsei's pacifier. Spells called pacify. Use it on babies before they cry. <laughs> like whiny baby hotline? You don't hear about the babies very often in this franchise. Huh. Which, you know, given how little we actually know about how monsters raise children and how like what the lifespan of monsters are um yeah we actually know so little about monsters like realistically in terms of their full lifespan um so i don't know that just, the, the babies thing just kind of made remind me of that what if a, it safely removes a tired enemy from combat what if you're fighting a baby fact when you give us money the fact on all of them is Give us money. That's the fact for all of the tutorial puzzle pieces. And call you honey. Hey, that's not true. You don't need money to get me to do that. Oh, Ralsei. Like, I know it's very easy to look at how nice Ralsei is and be like, this is suspicious. This is, this is, this is a little oh too over the top in terms of friendliness. And it's like, yeah, it is. But it's not because he's secretly not like insincere it's not like he's secretly evil it, it, he's over the top because he legitimately has no idea how to act like a normal person he's never had social activity before like <laughs> it's totally reasonable for him to be o a little over the top uh Rose is a spell that heals dude why use that when you can eat food because you won't have to use up an item i could have avoided all those empty calories relatable bye later kid I'm TP Master. It's about TP. What's TP? TP? What's TP? That's what lets you cast spells, see? When you can't see that orange bar, cast some spells when it's filled up far. TP. It's quite a caper. TP stands for toilet paper. No, it stands for tension points. What? Really? This is a little interesting because TP is clearly a different source of power from magic. Like even the name tension points. Uh, that implies that as the battle gets more intense, it pushes the characters to fight harder. Um, it's very, very similar in premise to the um, limit breaks from Final Fantasy, where it, a limit break isn't some supernatural ultra power that they can unlock. It's just the idea of... Oh, let me just mute my phone. Uh, it, yeah, limit breaks are, is, are just the idea of... Um, a character being put through so much pressure that they're forced to break past their own limits temporarily in order to succeed. It's very Dragon Ball Z in that regard, uh, or just Shonen in general. Um, and I think that's all the tension points are as well. I don't think it's any sort of supernatural power. Um, some people have argued that the tension points prove that Chris can use magic, but even when you do use tension points to fuel one of Chris's actions, they still have to use the act menu, and as we've shown... Oh, bye. And as we've shown... Act, it isn't magic. So, there you go. So even if Chris can use, like, strangely powerful moves, that's not 
magic. It's just them pushing past their own physical limits. And that's why whenever they use like an, a superpower tension fueled uh, act, it's either um, just a normal like a super hard physical attack which isn't magic, or they use soul power in order to enhance their allies and allow them to attack more potently. Now, that alone is very fascinating, like for the lore implications, because it shows that Chris can somehow enhance the abilities of other people with the power of their soul, which is a totally new concept. Like that kind of gets overlooked in the lore discussions, but that was not a thing in Undertale. You couldn't just go, like, if you didn't, uh, you could, the only way to get soul power or to get enhanced by souls was to absorb a soul. You couldn't just have, like, someone shine the power of their soul on you. So the fact that Chris can do that is very unique. Um, I'd go so far as to say that it might even be hinting at the fact that Chris is not just a human. Um, that might be one of the many powers granted to Chris as a side effect of them absorbing a monster soul. Um... There's so many powers that I'm beginning to suspect have been granted by the monster soul fusion that Chris has undergone. Because we know that, you know, and, and you know, some people might argue, well, you can't just attribute every strange occurrence to being some new superpower that Chris has unlocked. But it makes a lot of sense in a lot of situations. And more importantly, if my theory was true, there'd be no reason to think that you, that Chris wouldn't get superpowers. Um, because, I mean, when monsters absorb human souls, they literally can turn into gods with infinite power. So that's already pushing it to the absolute extreme. So anything less than that is within the realm of feasibility when it comes to soul power. Um, so if Chris can absorb the soul of, or if Chris has absorbed the soul of a boss monster, which is already going to be the most powerful kind of monster soul you can absorb, then it stands to reason that they would get at least some benefit. Um, I don't think they'd get the same benefit that a monster absorbing a human soul gets, because it takes all of the souls of monsters to equal the power of one human soul. But it makes sense that they would get at least a few niche extra abilities. Um... I think the fact that they can remove their soul is one of those niche abilities. I think the and I think the ability to use tension points to shine their soul's power on other people and enhance their powers is also a side effect of them being um, uh, is just another one of their powers that they've acquired because it's it's not an incredible power. It's very niche, but and and they can't even use it without tension points. So they have to be pushed to the limit in order to even access that power. But it's still something. It's more than what Frisk had. Um, and of course, I think that's why their stats in the overworld are so high. It's because, you know, they're, they're more than human. Um, I digress. Uh, we'll, we'll continue discussing that more. There's other powers that I think the soul has granted Chris, and we'll discuss them when they come up. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, you get TP when you defend, protect yourself, then cast spells, friend. You can also you also get TP by getting close to bullets. Look for the heart outline when you get close to bullets. You run bullets with bullets because it's important. I wonder what color the heart outline is when you get close to bullets. Like, is it red or is it white? Because if it's white, then that further fuels my Chris has fused with Azriel's soul theory. Secret. TP only lasts inside a fight. Once you win, it's out of sight. Having extra feels unbearable. No point in saving, it's straight up terrible. But leftover TP turns into extra money at the end of battle. That's another... Okay, that's a, that's what I think... That right there, I think, is a gameplay mechanic. I, I don't think that has lore implications. I don't think you can just manifest your anxiety and stress from battle into money. <laughs> like, imagine that. Imagine, like, fighting someone to the death and then just purging all your built-up tension into a stack of cash. Like, that is... <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious, but it's definitely not real. I don't think that's an actual in-universe, like, lore thing. I don't think that matters in the lore. I think that's another gameplay concession. I envy people who love games that are simpler than Undertale and Deltarune. <laughs> like, I, I envy people who get to animalize, er, animalize? Uh, who get to analyze stuff like Zelda. Like... God, you don't when when Link picks up a ruby, you don't have to spend an entire discussion 
theorizing about whether or not that ruby is a gameplay mechanic or whether it has implications in the lore. <laughs> it's just, yep, there's rubies all over the place and people trade them for stuff. And it's like, that's the bottom line. And <laughs> I envy such people. Um, or maybe I don't. Um, I, maybe I'm... Maybe I'm just grateful that I, have, I, I, I get to be a fan of a series that's so well-written that even the idea of the most basic mechanics having relevance in the lore is a valid possibility. Hmm. <laughs> I digress. You mean I only should have been using one square? Oh, that's a toilet paper joke. I see. It took me a second. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> What do you mean one square? Uh, for a second, I thought he was making of like a Fire Emblem reference, where they have like that that bar on the side. But I think that's not even that. That's like their health. So maybe it'd be like a Mega Man reference. But it's neither of those. He's making a toilet paper reference. Um, yeah, I overthink things. It's a long, a lone door frame. But for some reason, you can't see through it. Yeah, these things are suspicious. We'll talk about them again when, when they light up. Well, flip my flapjacks. Uh, the clowns are back in town. The clowns are back in town. Anyway, since you last saw me several minutes ago, I've created a brand new fighting team ready to stop you. Not even the purple girl can stop me now. Ho, ho, ho. Are you ready to be... Stop. Stop talking. Ho, ho, ho. What is that? Why are you saying that? Ho oh, ho. It's my evil laugh. Scary, right? You sound like baby Santa Claus. Uh, you mean like in a badass? <laughs> uh, I just want to see a baby Santa Claus with like, but like in the Doom poster with a shotgun and a chainsaw. <laughs> Shut up. Pardon me, excuse me. Really think you know how to be scary? Oh man, Susie's theme is so raw. I love Susie's theme. Oh, and oh, I can't wait for her fight with Lancer. The theme in that is one of my favorite songs in Deltarune. It's so good. Versus Lancer or versus Susie? I forget what it's called. I think it's versus Susie, and it's mm, Chef's Kiss. I wrong. Man, wannabe tough guys like you really piss me off. So that's two things we know that piss Susie off. She hates, she hates quiet people, but she also hates wannabe tough guys. Oof! Uh, I just thought of the lore implications of that sentence. Is she talking about her dad? Ugh. That's rough. Oof. Yeah, if she's talking about her dad there, then that that feels bad. You wouldn't know scary if it picked you up and bit your face off. That's not true. Oh, really? Why don't we prove it? We'll start with the part where your face gets bit off. <laughs> Oof, look at that Susie sprite. I mean, she does look very draconic right there, doesn't she? I'm still on that. I'm still on that. Uh, you know, for you guys, you're like, man, he keeps bringing up the draconic thing, the dragon thing. It's like, for me, it's been like uh, 24 hours since I've said anything about it. <laughs> also, are Susie's eyes yellow? I just noticed that on her sprite. Huh. I, I'm sad I moved past it. That's interesting. Um, thanks, it was kind of you to teach me how to be scary with an evil laugh. Hey, I wasn't... And now... Lancer is kind of... He's gutsy. Like, he stared her down and he was un... Like, I mean, part of it's his naivete. But he's also just not cowered, cowed by anything. Like, he's not... Like, he, he, he took Susie being terrifying way better than Chris took it. Um... <laughs> Merry Christmas... God bless Lancer. I guess that's kind of an improvement. Oh, here's something interesting. Um, yeah, I, I talked about this earlier when talking about Noel, and uh, this is another thing that I found interesting in the Andrew Cunningham video on the narrator. But the parentheses here, it's like, is this in Sus is this in Susie's head? Is this her thoughts? 
Or is this her talking under her breath? Like, is it quiet speaking? And it, it, the interesting thing is that if it's her talking under her breath, that's one thing. But if it's her th- thinking, then how are we hearing her thoughts? And it's like, does this imply that Chris is hearing her thoughts? It's an interesting concept. Um, and if, if we are able to hear her thoughts, then why don't we hear people's thoughts all the time? Why can't we just consistently hear thoughts from people? So it's one of those things where it's like, it's, I don't blame Cunningham for, or Andrew, I don't know, I don't know what to refer to him as. Uh, I don't blame him for dismissing parentheses uh, because, yeah, they're, they're kind of a nightmare. A board of jigsaws blocked the way. <laughs> the jigsaws who are sorry and they're also, they, they're, they're, their group name is a board. That's fun. Um, gotta warn them. That's Susie, everyone went on guard. But yeah, if Susie really does have... Oh, I'm bad at this. I forgot how hard that is. Um, if Susie has yellow eyes, that's interesting. Because yellow eyes are typically possessed by scary characters. Like, um... Undyne, I think, has yellow eyes. Am I remembering that wrong? I might be remembering that wrong. But I think she has yellow eyes. Sans, uh, his eye turns yellow um, when it's not turning blue. Um, lots of characters with yellow eyes. It's interesting. Um, I guess we should check them. At attack 5, digital defense, this mouse... Mouse scenario. Oh, and it's also part mouse. <laughs> it's only fighting to make ends meet. I have a rent payment to make. Fair enough, man. Oh, God. Fighting three of these things is actually kind of hard. It's wish it could quit its job. Um, you barely lifted a finger and... Alright, you win. Let's be friends. Wow, they're all... They're all already... Uh, I always wanted a friend like you. Yeah. Oh, it's so much easier when there's only two. And I get hit anyway. I'm terrible. Oh, I don't look forward to Jevil. I'm going to lose so hardcore to Jevil. It's not even funny. Is there anything else I need to show in this battle? How cute. Ooh! <laughs> Here's the, uh, one of the most important little pieces of rules card is the Roaring Knight evidence pieces. Um, another puzzle. Oh no. Let's read the instructions. Huh? The instructions are vandalized. It says, Thou'st fools, thou will never figure it out now. Ruining instructions. That's definitely against the rules. Then it um, says, P.S. I make my own rules. R.K. There you go. R.K. as in rules card or roaring night. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that explains that. Oh, I just remember there's some really funny dialogue here, actually, that a lot of people miss. Um, because I'm going to be getting paled and die? Cool. I'll work on that and you do the puzzles. Um, try your best, Chris. Oh, Susie. I just noticed that, that she's cool with, like, getting impaled and dying. Stop that, Susie. Stop being so depressed. Um, it should be simple, Chris. Press the box on the switches with X. Wait, who the hell is X? <laughs> That's so good. Or you can, you know, just use your hands. Oh, that's so funny. That's so good. The puzzle de- description has been smashed and graffitied. But the graffiti is written in, in overwrought gothic cal- calligraphy. That's so funny. Don't look at me, Chris. Puzzles are your job. Along with everything else I don't want to do. Man, 
I love Susie's design. I love the orange spikes. It's so good. <laughs> All right, here's some of the hilarious. There's some hilarious dialogue in here. It Great job, Chris. I think you're onto something. Hey, Chris, give up whenever you feel like it. It's all good. Um, and then if you step onto it, Chris, you can't solve it by stepping on the switch. You aren't a box. <laughs> Chris, don't listen to him. You can be a box. I was a box for Halloween once. <laughs> oh, Susie. Oh, she makes me sad. Um, just a box? Well, it's not like I can dress up as a monster. <laughs> oh, no. Susie comes from a poor, broken home. I hate it. I mean, I love it, because it makes for some juicy drama, but it still makes me sad. <laughs> I'm Chris. I don't think that's... Great job, Chris. I think you're on to something. <laughs> Susie is an agent of chaos, and I love it. Well, I'm gonna take it off again. Let's, uh, yeah, okay. That might be all the dialogue. Yeah, I think that might be it. Hmm. Nothing happened. Um, are they still part of my inventory? Or not, or not my inventory, my party. That's interesting. What happens if I try to leave? Can you really not figure it out, Chris? Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, there's so much extra dialogue in here. It's great. I'm just checking. Okay. Wahoo! You did it, or waho? <laughs> Jesus. Damn. Didn't get to impale myself. Oh well. Come on, chumps. Good job, Chris. It won't move anymore. And now I can go back this way. Yeah, and the party follows. Does this change? It won't move anymore. Who? How did it reset? Oh, whatever. I wonder what these symbols are on the sides of these pillars. I just noticed that. Are those supposed to be eyes? Or bats? Huh. Really emphasizing that's impossible if you haven't been there. Well, Spade is at the top. I think it's like something like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember if there's special dialogue if you do it ahead of time, but. Uh, inside was broken QC. You put the broken QC in your key items. The chest is empty. Interesting. I actually forgot that that was what was there. I was just thinking about Newbert. My man. Oh yeah, look at that. The uh, the uh, outline for when you get close to bullets is in fact, it actually varies between red and white. Interesting. Is this metaphor? When you step into the light, you'll return to where you were before. That's also true when you step into the light in Ralsei's Castle Town in Chapter 2. It sends you back up to the surface. 
However, since this was probably made as a puzzle thing, I doubt it has any grander significance in the story or the lore. So this is the part of the empty classroom that has the chessboard. I guess I'll look at the pawn man just once. Warning. I like how the pawn men, despite being simple entities, um, are still capable of understanding you. I mean, it makes sense since they're, you know, they're pawns. They're supposed to follow the orders of the king or the player or whoever. But it just kind of reminds me of the fact that the pawns are somehow more cognizant of the things you say than the C round, the, the checker piece. And, uh, and I wonder if that's a comment on how even the most simple chess piece is smarter than checkers because checkers is a simpler game. Uh, oh, and here's this. I forgot about this. So Rasse actually sings, if I'm correct, he he's singing different parts of the um, of the the legend, the the song that plays during his uh, his backstory. Uh, exposition dump at the start of chapter one the, the part where it's like it was a legend of hopes and dreams uh, and stuff like that fell asleep Susie fell asleep the enemies became tired It's nucleus doubles as an eye spot. Oh, weird. So the implication is that that is not like their eyeball. It's actually like, it's like a basic organism and that's its nucleus. Like it's like a cell. Weird. That's kind of horrifying actually. I'm not sure I'm on board with that. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. I'm terrible at this game. Um, good night. You whispered goodnight to Pawn Man. It fell asleep. I don't know. Chris whispering goodnight to someone sounds incredibly threatening. I'm going to be honest. Also, I just noticed that the Z's uh, beneath Susie's... Like, look at Susie's icon. It's all Z's. They're, they look very similar to the Z's from the Sands boss fight in Undertale. I don't have them up right in front of me, but they that's what they remind me of. Oh, uh, th that does remind me, though. I should point out more about this. Yeah, it's more of that. Um... Lullaby. Yeah, he, he just goes back and forth. I think. I think that's all that is. Yeah, that's all that does. Um... Uh, oh, I, what I was going to point out is that in my last video, I pointed out, I showed a, vi a, a picture on screen of Ralse singing to the lyrics, uh, Don't Forget, uh, which is a reference to the song that plays in the credits of this game. Um, and if you're wondering, that is actually like an official Undertale sticker. So that is, that was made by Toby Fox, or made by... The Undertale team, the, the the folks that Toby Fox is part of, um, they've said that those stickers aren't canon, um, but I don't know about that. I think when they say it's not canon, they might, because normally I'd be like, okay, they're not canon, and then I would ignore them, but, um, but one of the other stickers shows Noel looking terrified and being like like this isn't like you and like that and that was out before Snowgrave before chapter 2 so like that was some heavy foreshadowing of stuff like th even if that specific scene never happens and therefore is not canon um it is still foreshadowed something that was canon so I think that's probably what's going on with the Ralse singing, is that even though we may never actually see Ralse singing that song, it's uh, oh, it's Dark Lancer. Notice how he's shaded. Uh, but yeah, even though Ralse will never sing that uh, song, it, it's still 
hinting. It, it's not canon, but it's probably hinting at something that's canon. Um, so you've begun to cross the Great Board. The halfway point to our castle. Hmm, impressive. So, it's a shame. You won't make it a step further, because my guys are about to smash you into blood. Okay. Oh, and here's where the discussion first begins on blood. Do monsters have blood? Did they have blood in Undertale? Do they have blood in Deltarune? What's the deal? It's a little bit of an annoying discussion because there's no confirmation on it. And it's like, Sans bleeds, but as many have pointed out, it's possible that's not blood, it's just ketchup. So what about the other monsters? Do they bleed? And if they do, why don't we see anything? Is it because the blood is black? What's the deal there? Um, or is Lancer just talking to Chris and saying that they're just going to smash Chris into blood? So, like, what's the deal there? Um, the whole discussion on blood is splooshing blood very gross and bad. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, does this mean anything? Is this canon? Is this true? And if so, is it important? Because later on, that monster child will say... What's it like to be made of blood? And it's like, okay, is that, what does that mean? <laughs> so yeah, oh wow, I just noticed the lightning strike. Oh, and with the lightning strike, Lancer, uh, Lancer went from Shadow Lancer into regular Lancer. Does that mean Lancer can summon lightning? Is that one of his powers? Is Lancer the most powerful character in this franchise? <laughs> Lancer could one-shot Azrael confirmed. Hyper God of Death status. Why are you asking me? Because you're really cool at being terrifying. I want to be as scary as you. Yeah. Lancer and Susie's relationship is really wholesome. And it kind of t paints an interesting picture. Because it kind of makes it clear that Susie's almost certainly a single child. Because... A lot of times in abusive households, um, the eldest ends up maturing faster than they normally would because they need to in order to take care of their younger siblings. They basically have to step in as a parent, effectively. Um, and Susie's clearly never had to do that before. She's never had to be responsible. She's never had to stand, stand for someone. And I think her relationship with Lancer is very sibling-esque. Um, she very much seems to treat him as like, I mean, as a friend, obviously, but it definitely has younger brother vibes <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. Um, you want to be like me? Yeah. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> Susie does not think very highly of herself. But um, the new life isn't as awful. And saying you turn us into blood is uh, cool. What's with the bucket, though? Oh, Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe is... A toxin in my brain I will never look at buckets the same um, it's to put the blood in <laughs> oh yeah I'm not I'm not uh, supposed to make a mess anyway thanks for your feedback I'm really feeling scary man he f oh. I've had to say thanks for feedback so much on my channel that like even seeing the word is like whoa <laughs> it already means something completely different to me than it did even like a few months ago. No problem, I guess. So are your guys gonna attack us or? Oh yeah, I was so excited I forgot to bring any guys. The next time it'll be the end for, hey, I've just been calling you guys clowns. Does your team have an official name or something? So uh, I do not trust any yellow text that Lancer has. Like with other characters like Ralph Say, if he has yellow text, it might mean something. With with Lancer, I don't think it means anything. We should come up with a name. No, we shouldn't. That's decided. Everyone puts a name in the bucket. Alright, everyone's put in their entries. Blue person, you can choose. Since you look like you don't care. <laughs> that's interesting. Like that's one of the few times we hear someone describing Chris's expression and uh, appearance and personality um and it just sort of shows that either as a consequence of our control over them or a consequence of them just being a pretty apathetic person in general uh that chris just doesn't really 
have much investment in the world around them. And part of why they might be apathetic and maybe nihilistic is because of what happened to Azrael. So there's the crumpled paper, which is Susie's, where she swears. Um, and then there's the Lancer one, where Lancer calls you the... Uh, I think he, he calls you the Lancer fan club. But we're just going to go with... Uh, we're just going to go with Ralsei, because... I mean, we have to... St I, I've, I've made the stance. I will stand Ralsei on this channel. Uh, you open it up. Legendary Heroes, the Herald of Fun and Friendship. <laughs> oh... Ralsei has, like, a Teletubbies level comprehension of, like, interpersonal relationships. And it's, it's, I mean, it's as sad as it is adorable. See, I think it's the perfect name. Because we're all friends that like to have a lot of fun. Okay, first, geez, that's a mouthful, dude. Second, what are our enemies going to think? That we're going to be buddies with them? Let's change it to something short, intimidating. Susie, I don't think you've gotten the memo. This is this is this is Deltarune. We this is part of the Undertale franchise. We spare and befriend our adversaries. Adversaries, <laughs> something punchy, something badass. Like what? Well, uh, you know, for starters, how about just a uh, the fun gang? Even Susie, <laughs> even Susie has reservations. It's perfect. Well, see ya, fun gang. I've got to osmose my afternoon mu milk. I choose to believe that you consume milk the same way a normal living thing consumes milk, Lancer, and I refuse to believe you consume it through osmosis. I'm sorry. That is a, that is a canon that I do not wish to support. The power of the fun gang shines within you. Yeah, like, I don't think... I can't imagine that the whole, the power of whatever shines within you. Because, like, in Undertale, it wasn't that the your surroundings actually granted you power. It's just that Frisk was filled with determination. Like, the more they saw, the more determined they became. It was a very simple psychological thing that happened to tie into the cosmic power that is determination. But with this, it's not really the same. It's, it's literally saying the power of the fun gang shines within you. Like, you literally are deriving power from your relationships. And, I mean, aside from being very Kingdom Hearts, um, it also just doesn't feel very in line with the established power system in undertale like even when undyne resurrected as undyne the undying she she was saying how she could like feel the heartbeats of all monster kind and all humankind beating as one which sounds very similar in some ways to this but i always interpreted that just to be like it was her anime-esque like flashback sequence to give her that final boost of determination needed to resurrect herself and fight you one more time so like even then even though that was also a relationship and like memory and like environment based power boost it was still tied to determination not to whatever this is um hmm it could be implying because i've seen some people argue that soul power and determination aren't necessarily the same thing because, like, Flowey had tons of determination, but he didn't have a soul. So does he really have soul power? Or is determination independent of soul power, and it just happens to dwell inside of your soul? And if so, how does that work? It, so maybe this is what you're getting? You're Because Chris is more than human, they are gaining power? I don't know, man. They're, this this feels... Uh, what's the word? Dubious dubious how long did y'all have to wait for me to use that word in this video what's up let's see if we can skip past the pawn man i don't feel like fighting him oh so close i wonder if speedrunners are able to get past that 
Oh man, I didn't even discuss the lore implications of the lullaby, the lullaby working on Susie. It's like, oof. Is it because she didn't have a mother? And so like anything soft and sweet has a profound impact on her? Or is it, or is it say implication that she's just so exhausted from her disruptive home life that she doesn't actually get enough sleep? It kind of makes me think that Chris would probably fall asleep too if we weren't forcing them to keep going. Because Chris obviously is sleep deprived as well. Hmm. Oh, it's the boys. Pond men are scary, but all they're doing is following the king. Us on the board used to have our own boss. Those in were peaceful times. But now, even the boss has been reduced to the king's payout. Man, I love how they made the knight, like, the, the, the entity that is supposed to be, like, a person riding a horse. They made the chess piece act like a cowboy. Like, how hilarious is that? Um, also, yes, that's what this guy is. He is a, he's a knight chess piece. So, I think any theory that the king has something to do with, uh knights is uh knight chess piece is probably not the case unless he's the black knight piece because you don't actually fight any of the black chess pieces in this game uh, now that i think about it it's all white chess pieces and this guy he actually mentions mr elegance haha and these these are not my these are my nostrils not my eyes you can still see out of them though it's interesting because he says that the king their king as in the white chess king, um, is subservient to the spade king. But if I'm recalling correctly, we never encounter the white chess piece. That entity never shows up. We never have to fight it. So is that implying that the Roaring Knight took some darkeners with him when he left? Like, did he take the black chess pieces with him to go you know, create some other dark fountain? Did he take the white chess king with him to create other fountains? Is that what's being implied here? Fear not. We, unlike the simple pawn men, possess full faculty over our actions. I, Mr. Society, am far too intelligent to ever bow down to such a tyrant. Unless he asks me. He's very scary, you see. What, you think you possess the power to topple that brute? Yes, yes, I'm sure everyone will support you. Go for it. Just as long as I don't have to participate. Yeah. These are... <laughs> I can't believe I talked about these two in my video. Uh, well, step on my boots. If it isn't the friendly fun gang, you boys or girls had better turn back while you can. Is this Lancer confirming that Chris is not non-binary? Is that what this line is? I, I, I probably shouldn't even bother talking about this, but I mean, <laughs> with the there's so little concrete confirmation of LGBT characters in Deltarune and Undertale. Like there's lots of subtext, but outside of Undyne and Alphys, there is not much rock solid confirmation. And like, I wish there was more, or I wish there was either less subtext or outright confirmation. Because this, like, will they, won't they uncertainty on whether certain characters or certain genders is really annoying. Um, it, 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 it just makes the whole discussion surrounding the pronouns really obnoxious. Because if it was canon, then okay, everyone knows what's true. But it's not confirmed, but it's, but it's implied, but it's not hard implied. So it's like... People get mad about things that might not even be canon, and then people get mad at them for being mad about things that might not even be canon, and it's just a big circle of uh, obnoxiousness. Uh, so, yeah, boys or girls, <laughs> take that line how you will. Lancer, what is it this time? Oh, I'm simply warning you. Something extremely dangerous is lying ahead. 
Oh, ho, ho, it's actually really inconvenient. Huh, I can't go home at all because I'm so scared. What? What is it? Oh, hey, little guy. Hmm. I like the idea that the checker pieces, even though they're very basic creatures, are very powerful, and that makes them intimidating. Mm -hmm. That? That's what you're afraid of? Wow, Purple Gold, you aren't scared? <laughs> Why would I be? What's it going to do? Hmm, well, normally... <laughs> so apparently this thing has done this before it crushes people to death so this is not the first time that someone has been murdered by this thing so that's terrifying uh, also for those who don't know um this is just a hodgepodge of references but uh the sound it made when it grew larger was very, very blatantly a mario reference but more importantly the uh the rule in checkers is that when you get to the end of the board um with a checker uh you king the checker and it becomes you put a second checker piece on it and it becomes larger so that's what this is referencing the uh checker piece got to the end of the board and so it got larger and buffer and he got super it did not skip leg day clearly it skipped arm day um <laughs> i don't even think it can conceive of arm day but uh oh i love that they gave this thing its own music oh, here it comes check there's no point warning it because uh it can't actually understand you um something about gaining this much power has made it to where it can't understand language anymore it's uh it's interesting attack nine defense three check that's chess not checkers oh okay that's a great joke um you'll notice that it's a k round now because the king not just a regular checker um it says check question mark that's chess not checkers because we just checked the enemy and so it's making a pun on how you're not supposed to check uh, a checker piece because check is something you do in chess. <laughs> um, although I am a little curious now. Give me one moment. I'll just let the music play. Because um, it's good music. But I'm curious about the health of this thing. Like, how much health does it have? dang okay as c round as it's just like little form it has 10 health so it's actually comically weak as a regular checker um but as k round it has 1300 hp this thing is like it, it goes from one of the weakest enemies in the game, like in the, in the, in the entire dark world, to being one of the strongest. That's a like that's some Dragon Ball Super Saiyan transformation nonsense. Like that's insane. That's an obscene power up. Um, oh, and in terms of its attack, and oh, I should play the game instead of looking at the wiki page. Um, shovels furiously. <laughs> Um, in terms of its other stats, um, it, uh, it has 5 attack as C round, and it gets upgraded to 7.5. Um, as K round. Is 0 defense as C round, upgraded 3 as, uh, as K round. It actually lies to you, it tells you a stat that's wrong, and it's not the correct stat in the game files. So that's interesting. Um, I guess we'll warn it just for fun. You explained to K-Round about the importance of dodging Susie's attacks, but it didn't seem to understand. 103. So Susie's only doing, like, roughly, like, 1 13th of K-Round's health. So, yeah, no wonder it's impossible to beat this thing with violence. Um, Deep Bow. Oh. 
<laughs> Practice self-care. I, I wonder how much its attack goes up with each... Um, uh, with each uh, attack boost. Because I just noticed that its attack actually gets um, boosted by... Um, Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, yeah, its its attack can be increased up to a maximum of eight of ten, so, which is nothing to sneeze at. Like I'm pretty sure Spamton is only like had like thirteen or fourteen attack. Spamton Neo, so ten attack is nothing to sneeze at. Um, all right. Oh. It's been a while since I had to fight this thing. Um, and... Not much lore to discuss here. It has like a doge face on it, so... Oh, dang. So you could argue that this thing is meant to be one big meme. <laughs> um, which it very much is. <laughs> we did it. Wow, you clowns really are heroes. You saved the next 20 minutes of my life. Yeah, yeah, I am pretty great, huh? Um, Susie, not to downplay your contributions, but you didn't actually help at all. You only made everything worse by attacking it. If you just acted nice to it in the first place, we could have avoided that entire battle. Are you for real? That thing was bloodthirsty. To be fair, it has crushed people to death in the past, so she's not completely wrong. The only thing keeping it at bay was my axe. And earlier, you terrorized those troops? Those guys were enemies. Therefore, terrorizing. Yeah, she's right. <laughs> Lancer, stop it. You're a bad influence. Before that, you ate an innocent person's cake. Cakes are also my enemy. <laughs> uh, oh, I, that little face Rel they made was funny. Um, Susie, whether you like it or not, you're a hero. <laughs> you know, Rel little smile, like you can't see it, but if you had just that, just the, the two eyes and the smiley face, like separate from the rest of his sprite, it would look eerily similar to the smiley faces you see on Flowey and on the uh, computer monitor, the computer monitors regarding Flowey in the True Lab in Undertale. Um, just the thing I'd point out, thought I'd point out. Uh, one with the power to bring peace to the future. Could you please start acting like one? Oof. Are you acting like one? Yeah. It's interesting, because this is like when Rousey starts to put his foot down a little bit. I mean, he's being incredibly nice about it. And he's still, he's not even ordering her. He's hes still just asking her to act reasonable. So still not trying to infringe on their agency. Um, but Susie doesn't take the shame very well. I mean, I don't like that. Like, she's already thinks poorly of herself. Been a pretty bad hero, haven't I? All right, Rousey. Oh, I skipped that dialogue. Um, oh well, probably wasn't important. I won't be such a rotten hero anymore. <laughs> I'll just be one of the bad guys instead. Yeah. <laughs> Susie's a rebel. Really? Are you gonna be on my team? Yeah, sounds way easier, honestly. Susie, you can't just... Quiet, toothpaste boy. Susie is my comrade now. I don't understand that, the toothpaste boy. I don't understand that nickname. Like, is it because his head, it looks kind of like a toothpaste dispenser tube? 
Is that the joke? Like his hat? Is that like what 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 Lancer's making fun of? I don't get it. Is it cause he's green? Like I I don't understand that joke. Toothpaste. Is it because toothpaste is used to clean your teeth? Is I don't get it. Uh, maybe you guys can help me on that one, because I don't actually understand that joke. Yeah, toothpaste boy. We're going to have monogram track jackets. Yeah. And sleepovers, where we tell each other secrets. Uh, yeah? <laughs> anyway, uh, see you guys never. Haha, <laughs> if you can even last that long. I love that Lancer just skates backwards. Is Lancer wearing like wheelies or like, is that what they're called? Like the heelies? Or, like those shoes that have wheels in the heels? That absolutely seems like something Lancer would canonically wear. Perhaps I shouldn't have been so hard on her. Or I'll say you asked her politely to not assault people. I mean, I don't think you are being hard on her. But I just worry that if Susie's too eager to fight, then, well, let's just be kind to her, okay, Chris? Uh, it's interesting. What thought did he just cut off? He's worried that if Susie is too eager to fight, then what? What What is he worried will happen? What outcome is he concerned about? Like, from an Undertale perspective, it's like, sure, we understand what he's... Like, from a purely meta perspective, we can go, oh, yeah, because fighting leads to a... It means you can't get the happy ending in Undertale. But in this context, what is Ralsei's logic? What is he afraid of? It's interesting. Is he afraid of Snowgrave? Has he seen the Snowgrave route and is worried about it? Hey, it's your boy. Hey, kid, we managed to fix up this old thingamajig for you. It's some kind of door. It can take you anywhere you want in the world. As long as that's one of two locations. Anywho, we'll keep working on it. Anything to help you out, kid? Where does the door come from? Don't know. Don't think it. I've never seen it before. Okay. Hmm. There's a lot to discuss here. Okay, for one... Uh, he said something initially that I kind of glossed over. Well, let's see if I can reset his text. I think I glossed over something. We managed to fix up this old thingamajig for you. It's some kind of door. It can take you anywhere you want in the world. As long as it's one of two locations. Anyway, we'll keep on it. It'll be okay. Cool. Okay, never mind. The, the first thing wasn't important. Um, it, these doors are weird. They, they, they're not normal. They're not supposed to be here. They showed up recently. Why? Who put them here? Is this something the knight created? And then, of course, I can't even begin to discuss them without pointing out the connection to Sans. This looks exactly like what Sans' door does. Sans in Undertale has flames under his door. This is a blatant connection to that. <sighs> so, someone put this door here. And it took the aid of these lightners, or, or darkeners, excuse me, to make the door functional. But it wasn't until that, the blocky foliage grows thick above your head, the power of the forest shines within you. What does that mean? What does that mean? Um, what is the point of this door? Like, what does this represent? Okay, so, it's connected to sand. Sands can teleport. Sands... It can prank you across time and space, according to Papyrus. So clear, and these doors clearly teleport you. So, what is that? Who made them? Is this a? I refuse to attribute anything to Gaster. I'm just gonna go ahead and say that now. I'm going to assume Gaster has nothing to do with this plot. Uh, I know that's not popular, but I think Gaster. I don't trust any implication. Like, I assume that Gaster has nothing to do with anything unless someone intense, intentionally draws attention to him. Because I, I, I can't just attribute every tiny mystery to Gaster. I'm sorry. Um, so, is this a knight thing? To the Roaring Knight? 
put these doors here? Are these one of his creations? Because something some people point out was the idea that maybe Rasse has access to something, some sort of similar technology, and that's what allows him to teleport. Or maybe it's not technology, maybe it's magic. Whatever it is, and maybe that's what allows Rasse to teleport between dark worlds. Um, or, and yeah, and so maybe, I'm not saying Rasse put this door here, but maybe, I, but according to my theory, Oberon Smog, the knight, the roaring knight, is a, an entity very similar to Rasse. Um, so it's possible that he's the one who utilizes these doors. Hard to say, though. What does Mr. Horsey have to say? Oh, this is interesting. Um, fun fact, if you use violence, um, this dialogue changes, and it does not... Uh, he, Mr. Society doesn't help. Uh, it, Mr. Society only helps the door if you are a pacifist, so... Um, and I think that's interesting. I mean, I don't want to bring too much attention to Mr. Society and Mr. Uh, Elegance here, because they almost certainly don't matter, but... Um, I mean, it's just kind of interesting that Toby Fox would bother to give these characters these extra little bits of detail. That, like, Mr. Society refused to help someone who uses violence, so that's interesting. Since it was just the three of us, it should work without any issues. Oh, yeah, and this line changes, because if it's just the two of them, it's he says something like, oh, it might not work correctly, or it might be, like, damaged in some way. So it's, it's interesting. Um, anyhow, haha, <laughs> hope it'll help you deal with the king. Now, don't tell anyone Mr. Society helped. He doesn't want none of that. I'm watching you now. With my nostrils. And then you can actually... It's a door. Where will you go? The door opened. Amazingly, you are already there. Shut the... Stupid... Narrator is making fun of me. I wonder where that door sound appears elsewhere in the game. Like, I wonder if that's a unique door sound. I think I already saved my file. Yeah, blocky foliage. All right, let's keep going. We're going to try and get to, uh, at least to the thrash machine fight. Um, oh, oh, hello. Rabbit slithered in the way. So what's interesting about this, actually, is this actually is somewhat relevant to the lore. Um, a attack, defense one. This dusty bunny needs a bit of spring cleaning. So, like, this is a dust bunny that's been brought to life. So why does this pile of dust look like this? But the dust in Rousey's castle town becomes these creepy, breathing blobs. Why is there that difference? I can only assume it's because the dust that makes them up is different. Um... Hmm. Let me just check something real quick. Okay. Never mind. Uh, sorry, I was checking something. Uh, yeah, and it's just weird that... Uh, that this pile of dust acts differently than the dust in Rousey's Castle Town. And I think it's because this dust was made from normal dust, whereas the dust in Rousey's Castle Town was made from Azrael. So I think that's some evidence there. Meow. Oh, wow. Oh my god. I'm terrible at the video game. Oh, I can't believe I've taken this long to address this, but Ralsei uses heal prayer? I didn't even address this. In Undertale, um... Characters using healing magic wasn't super common. Um, it was a thing, but it wasn't super common. Um, but the one of the only characters who uses it, it maybe the only character, I don't remember right now, was Toriel. Um, and so it's interesting that Ralse, who is obviously connected to Azrael, um, also uses healing magic. And both, you know, and Toriel was also a very religious woman in... Uh, yeah, or she is in Undertale. I don't know if she... Or she is in Deltarune. I don't know if... It's not really confirmed whether there was a religion of the angel in the Deltarune... Or in the Undertale timeline. Uh, people cared about that stuff, but it's unclear if there was a full-blown religion. If there was, 
then the fact that Toriel wore the robes of uh, the angel of the Delta Rune in Undertale could be implying that when she left Asgore, she kind of she kind of like ran away to a convent. Like that's the ed or like that's kind of the essence of it is that she decided to devote herself to religion and forsake relationships at least for a while um or then again it's also the sigil of the monster kingdom and she is the queen of the monster kingdom so maybe it doesn't have any religious significance in undertale but back on topic the fact that Ralsei uses prayer is very interesting it makes you wonder it's like who is he praying to is he praying to the angel if so why or is it, and if he's not praying to the angel then who is he praying to? A soft and clean boy. Can't fool me this time, rabbit. Rabbic. And it's a musty groan. Actually, I'm curious. No, nope, doesn't change. But yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, and like, whenever you cast on someone, it says it like bathes them in healing light. Actually, let me look at that in the menu. Heavenly Light restores a little HP to one party member. Like, that's strange. Heavenly Light. What does Ralsei have to do with Heaven? It does make you wonder if Ralsei is somehow serving the Angel, or is tied to the Angel in some way. Because he's trying to prevent the Roaring, right, Ralsei? And... If my theory on the angel's motivations are correct, uh, namely that the angel uh, is trying to prevent the war between humans and monsters, um, then it could be that the angel assigns someone to help guide humanity and monster kind towards peace and away from the roaring, and that's Azrael's job. Um, at least that's one possibility. But then again... Maybe this heavenly light and this healing prayer, maybe that's just like a side effect of him inheriting power from Azrael. And Azrael in the overworld is, in the light world, is a, a religious person. And it, if magic did, if magic existed in the light world, uh, Azrael would probably have healing magic, just like his mom. So maybe this isn't proof that Az Ralse has anything to do with the angel. Maybe this is just further evidence of his tie to or his being connected to Azrael. Interesting. Susie, Lancer. Uh, <laughs> well, if it isn't the so-called heroes, we're finally ready to see what happens when you try to act soft against a team that crushes anyone in their way. Dark Jack Lancer. Is this implying that Lancer's name is Jack? Because I understand he's supposed to be like the Jack of spades, right? Like the prince, like he's, there's the king and the queen and there's the jack, and that's what Lance is. Lancer is, he's the jack of spades. <laughs> is Lancer's full name Dark Jack Lancer, or is it like, well, lose, no, I think the dark part must be, I don't know, uh, this is probably just a joke, but it's probably not important, but DJL, are, his, are those his initials? <laughs> Um, I just like the idea of Lancer's real name being Jack. <laughs> Violent Axe Susie. Hmm. Together we are the Ginyu Force. The Dark Fun Gang. <laughs> um. So yeah, there's that pose of Susie's. Um. I think she does something similar in, on her own. Like, it's not that Lance is creating that fire. I think that's just of her own magic. That, like, the kind of magic she uses when she casts Rude Buster. So, that's Susie gaining magical powers suddenly in the Dark World. Uh, so, what's your own evil plan, huh? 
Dude, we just formed our team. We haven't done anything past our intro yet. Have a little patience, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll say stop apologizing to the enemy. What? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> We're, I'm looking forward to the rest. Uh, well, you won't have to look forward for long. Starting now, we're going to work ceaselessly, unstoppably, to make an evil plan to thrash you clowns. Watch your backs. And your fronts. <laughs> Such silly characters. Hmm. I just noticed the mushrooms. Oh. That is the path towards progression. We don't want progression yet. Sorry, uh, I just noticed like a seam in my t monitor. Weird. Is that a... I don't think that... I doubt that's being caught on footage, but... Hmm. Weird. Don't let me, I'm on break. Say, help me, I need to get something for my friend Clover's birthday. They're foreshadowing Clover. Don't know if that means anything. Probably not. Her only interests are sports, cute boys, and trees. Maybe I'll just get her a card. Maybe I could put some money in the card? No, I need that. Sports, cute boys, and trees. How's the evil scheming going? Huh? Oh, that? Yeah, we got bored, so we're having a snack. I see. Come on, all I ate for breakfast was chalk. Oh, man. Yeah, Susie doesn't get fed because her home life sucks. And Lancer didn't eat anything because his home life probably isn't great either. Just a daily treasure I hid in the stump's orifice. Please don't use that word. That is. Feast for yourself, my main man. Chris, do you want to um, try it? Make Ralph say try it, try it, or decline. I'm just going to try it. There was a honey pot of salsa inside the stump. You ate some salsa. It recovered something. Not HP, just something. Mm, hey, what's in this? I don't know. <laughs> you guys are ridiculous. My power's lowered by my hunger right now. Once I eat something, you really shouldn't have pissed me off, man. It shouldn't have. Silence, you sweet basket of eggs. Our dark energy bends the rules of grammar. Uh, yeah, egg boy. <laughs> I think you're just making up words and just using random nonsense to... Insult Ralph Say. It's a stump with some kind of dinner hole in it. Well, has everyone had enough? Constantly. <laughs> uh, poor this, poor Susie. Oh wait. Oh sorry. Um, are these black pawns? Okay, maybe we do encounter black chess pieces in in this world. Huh. It looks just like a pawn. Yeah, that has to be what this is. And these are like the Jacks game, which I never played as a kid. You folks look like heroes. Take the scarf from this chest and defeat the king. Besides, it's old, ragged, and doesn't fit me anymore. That's what chests are for. It's kind of a hand-me-down situation in there. I used to work at the castle until af until the king fired all the staff. What was my job? Oh, I was the royal coat rack. <laughs> I'm just a little ball. I don't want to discuss anything. That's fair. Why do you have like a Wi-Fi signal thing on your head? <laughs> hmm. Fair enough. You open the treasure chest. Inside was Ragger. You put Ragger. In your weapons. The chest is empty. I don't think... Yeah. Ragged scarf that cuts enemies like a dagger. Yikes. 
A rugged scarf. Yeah. Let me just look up Ragger real quick. See if it's got anything interesting about it. He gives plus two attack. If you attempt to equip the ragger to Susie, she says, Ow, that can't be comfy. And if you uh, equip to Ralse, he says, Feels prickly. Nice. Uh, and if you try to equip it to Noelle, she says, Ouch, dot, dot, dot. Kind of nice. Okay, so it's a spectrum of responses. Uh, Susie's like, Ow, that's not comfortable. Uh, Ralse is like, Ooh, I like it, and says it's nice. But then Susie's like in between them, and or uh, Noelle is in between Rousey and, and Susie, and says, "Ouch!" But it's kind of nice. <laughs> um, interesting. Is that? Hmm. It's a yeah. It's a portmanteau of rag and dagger. Oh, that's funny. Um, if you take the contents of the chest um, before talking to the cat, ra the hat rack guy, he's like, "It's okay, it's a gift." Uh, but he also calls you like, <laughs> "What was the what was the exact phrasing?" Really energetic and potentially criminals. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um. Ragger goes takes away cuteness, but makes Rasai do more damage. I'm not going to do that because we're not planning to attack people. I used to work at the castle. Blah 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, these are definitely black pawns, which is interesting. Enter the password. No, did everyone forget the password? It's written at the top. Also, these signs look very reminiscent of the signs in Super Mario 64. I don't know if it's an intentional reference or it's just what it is. Then add a mustache over there. <laughs> like this? Yeah, that's perfect. How's the scheming coming along, you two? Hey, don't look. Spoilers, dude. Hey, Chris, that's just gonna, like, help me rip up my outfit so it looks all badass and renegade and stuff. Yes, I have some wavy scissors. Just saying, if you join our side, he can do yours too. Chris, if you stay on my side, I can, um, hem some floral patterns into your ascot. Ooh, can you hem some into me? No? <laughs> Wait, ascot? Is that what Chris is wearing? They're wearing an ascot? Oh my god. Hold up. An ascot scarf. Oh my god. That's what's around Chris's neck? I just looked it up. That's what this cloak thing that's like, the, the pink thing. The pink thing is an ascot. It's not a cape. <laughs> Why? That's, oh my god. I didn't realize he was rocking the Fred Jones from Scooby-Doo look. Oh my god, Chris. This is the most hilarious revelation of this video, I think. Well, oh well, look who it is. The sweet little peas we love to see. Hey, watch your language. Oh, sorry. Susie's so trying to get me to swear more. <laughs> also, I like how Susie's like, Hey, Chris, Lance can help me run my outfit. Sam, if you join our side, you can do yours too. It's like, even now, Susie's already warming up to Chris. Like, she wants Chris on their side. So that's sweet. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Easy peasy. 
<laughs> Thanks for doing the puzzle for us, losers. Haha, <laughs> thank you so much, losers. We were having we were having trouble. Uh, we uh, need this. Interesting. I don't actually remember what it is. Spade, diamond, something else. Ah. Uh, diamond. There we go. Bow bow, break the box for a bracelet. Bow bow, it will boost your defense. Your defense, excuse me. Bracelets are my favorite. So I'm not entirely certain what these things are supposed to be. Like, are they teeth? But they're not, because this. Oh, yeah, because his face looks like the letter B, I just noticed. It's like a letter B, but sideways. Okay, so these are like those like toy blocks with letters on them that you see in movies. You see, you usually see them in horror movies where they'll be like, you're look at, you'll look at the box, like the, the the letter blocks, and they'll spell out like murder or something. The king wants to eliminate lightners, but we didn't agree with that. We escaped, but the others were arrested. Don't worry about talking to my O associates here. Whenever Bow Bow talks, she always goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And on. No, 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 no. Oh, so it's a she. Interesting. And, uh, you open the treasure chest. Inside was dice brace. You put the dice brace in your armors. The chest is empty. Well, except for some vowels. <laughs> always double check the chests in these games. You'll usually get some, like you won't always get extra dialogue, but sometimes you will. The chest is empty except for some vowels. That's so. What's the joke there? Hmm. A E I O U and sometimes Y. I don't know. I think it's just a reference to the fact that these guys are letters as well. Oh, and wait, what did I just get? Dice brace? Dice brace. A brace made of various symbol inscribed cubes. Okay. It just increases defense. Oh, I forgot I had these amber cards. Oh, do I only have one? I really need to get more then. Anyway. Um, it says friendship, is what Ralph I just said. Um, let me check. Uh, let me look that up real quick. Dice. Brace. Uh, when you equip to Rousse, uh he says, It says friendship. When you equip it to Susie, it's, she just says, Okay. And then when you equip it to Noelle, she says, hey, you you, you jumbled it. And that's funny. Interesting. Okay. I'll just go ahead and equip it to Ralse since, you know, he has very low defense in general principle. And has very low health on general principle. I need to get a second Amber card, actually. Um, because you need at least two amber cards in order to forge the... Uh... Oh, wait. I want to fight you at least once. Oh, well. Uh, you need at least two amber cards in order to forge the... Is it the silver card in Chapter 2? I mean, I think you can buy more in Chapter 2, so it's not actually the end of the world, but might as well get them while we're here. Blocks are assembled. Okay, I should point out something interesting about this enemy. Um... This guy seems to be proof that a single darkener can be composed of multiple separate objects. Which is interesting. Because some people have theorized that, like, you know... Like, uh... That only... That darkeners are only made from a single object, and so Rousey has to be made from a single object as well. Um, but, like, Bloxers are made of several objects, linked together. Um, and if you really want to argue about it, like, the queen in Chapter 2 is a 
full-blown computer. Like, and that's tons of complicated individual components. Um, so I think the argument that like darkeners have to be a single object isn't super strong. I think there's examples of, of, of that not necessarily being the case. Nighting loves training, hates body being the wrong shape. <laughs> Interesting. Whew, you interrupted my training. <laughs> it follows Tetris rules. One moment. Oh. Is, is it X? Okay, is it C? Okay. The triangle is confusing me because it's like I'm not using a controller. Okay, there we go. Uh, Bloxer says some other dialogue if you mess up his body shape. Uh, I don't think it's anything interesting. Um, it's just funny. It's funny dialogue, but it's not lore relevant, I don't think. Ah, oh, I'm terrible. I'm just gonna... Radiates with the spirit of joy. I'm just gonna heal Rousey real quick. I'm gonna knock your block off. No! Phew. You won. Yay. It looks like it's supposed to be the solution to a puzzle. This is my device with a calligraphy pen. Okay, so, rules card. Oh, looks like the order of the symbols were red, black, red. Um, so, rules card, once again. Um... <laughs> <laughs> scrambled this. Although, did Susie and Lancer just run through the spikes again? I, I guess they must have, unless they met Rule's card on the way down. Oh god, terrifying. RK came by, what a hunk. He vandalized the puzzle to stop the lightners, but we know the answers. Oh, you want to get through? Of course, we'll tell you. Um, the first symbol is a heart. <laughs> just like left. Does that help? It's interesting. So, even though this thing has three heads with, um, <laughs> even though the three heads with three separate personalities, um, and you and different eye color, I think. Uh, simple puzzle. Why should we care? None of the symbols are clubs. Ugh, it's downright insulting. So that confirms that these things, the clover, is a cl they're a club card. Um, I'm not sure which club card they are, but they're a club. Um, well, I'm bad. And none of them are a club. So I need to do that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. Is that... Am I stupid? Yes, I am stupid. Um, first one's a heart. Second one is... Oh, that's a spade. I'm stupid. And then, there we go. So what's interesting, though, is, like, they refer to themselves as, like, that that one over there said we. Oh, wait, do they have different eye color? Or are they all just gray? Oh, they're all just gray. Never mind. Um, they call themselves we, but that other, sp that, uh, the, the uh, diamond guy from earlier who said they needed to get a birthday card for Clover referred to them as a she. So are they, <laughs> are they a plural entity or are they a singular entity? I'm going to report Toby Fox to the pronoun police. Um, stop and say hi, folks. Shut up. They, they don't deserve us. Hey, calm down, you two. Sorry about your birthday. Yeah, get ready to hurt. Oh, I'm sorry about this. <sighs> Look at Chris's ascot billowing in the breeze. Like, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was like a weird shoulder cape, but an ascot. That makes so much more sense. Oh my god, I feel stupid. Clover, attack 8, defense 2. Two heads are better than one. Three, maybe not. I'm just going to pull up Clover's page on the wiki real quick. Just in case there's any details that I'm forgetting. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be any major plot or like lore here that I'm missing out on.
Okay, here's something funny, uh, in case you didn't know. But there were some scrapped command topics. Because, like, with Clover... Here, I'll show you. Die, die, die. Please ignore them. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm the worst at video games. Um, is bickering with herself. I hate that. <laughs> so confusing. Um... Okay, so you can talk to them about different things. Um, some of the scrapped ideas in the game files include talking about religion, politics, gun control, kindness, ghosts, and games. I am so upset that there wasn't the ghosts option because there is the ghosts in Undertale and in Deltarune are the most infuriating thing when it comes to the lore because it's like... What are you? You're a ghost. Does that mean you're a monster? But you can't be hurt physically. And, like, Napsabluk ignored Hyper God of Death Azrael of destroying the timeline. He, Napsabluk just closed the blinds. How does he do that? Or they. I guess Napsabluk's a lay. Sorry. My mistake. Um... Like, how did they do that? How did they... Why... What What are ghosts? What, what, what is... What is going on with ghosts? How dare you take away the option to ask Clover about ghosts? Um... But yeah, so religion, politics, gun control, kindness, ghosts, and games. Um, although, funny enough, if you, <laughs> it, according to the game, the game files, one of her responses was, "I use a game pad to aim." So by gun control, they actually meant <laughs> asking them how they like to use their gun in video games. Like, do they use a controller? Do they use a game pad? Do they, <laughs> do they like uh, use like uh, inverted aiming? I used to use inverted aiming when I'd play Halo back in the day. Um, talk about... Boys. What kind of boys do you like? I like how Alsei puts them in quotation marks. Like, like just, he, like he doesn't even know what boys are. What, what is... Cute ones. Nice ones. None. Uh, I mean, all. <laughs> Clover is even more confusing. But yeah, Clover is meant to be like a representation of both the club, like the, the, the card of the like club house. Um, but they're also meant to be a representation of the Clover plant. Um, so that's interesting. Glasses are cute, I think. Fluffy glasses. That's it. And him? Uh, sure. So at least two of the heads are crushing on Ralse. So that's funny. Who's toothbrush? Who's relatable? Um, what was it they like? They like sports and trees, right? Um, sports? I want to eat a football. Sports, my favorite food. Oh, I love you too. Seems like Clover enjoyed talking about that. Spaghetti and tennis balls. That's genius. We really agree on it. Y'all are ridiculous. This attack is so hard in the Javel fight. Is whispering about cute boys. Um, can I just do that again? Um, oh, cute ones, nice ones. Oh. Can you really just talk to them about the same thing over and over again? I thought you had to talk to them about different things, but maybe you don't. Oh, okay, so you can tire them out if you talk about various other things. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the various things. What do you like for your birthday? Let's just have a nice chat. You idiot, ask for a gift. Just discuss our likes. I'm going to talk about something else. It's my birthday. What? No, it's my birthday. We're triplets. Do their attacks get faster if you talk about the wrong thing? Interesting. Didn't seem to care. Animals are kind of nasty. Just awful in concept. <laughs> I don't know why I found that so funny. I guess it's just ironic that like this terrifying Hydra abomination would 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 find regular animals disgusting. Talk trees. You brought up the topic. Oh, rainbow. Uh, the topic of although I don't think that's the colors that are in the rainbow. <laughs> I don't think cyan is a color. Uh, I don't know. It depends on the rainbow, I guess. Trees. Clover seemed happy. I love the smell of trees. Oh, me too. Pollen makes me uh, sure. Bear. 
very clever. Huzzah. The power of recurring bake sales shines within you. So like this feels like a meta reference to Undertale because there was recurring bake sales in Undertale. You encounter the first spider bake sale in the uh, in the uh, in the ruins near Toriel's place, and then you encounter Muffet later at her bake sale, um, and then there's this bake sale here. Um, but if you and you're supposed to have played Undertale before you play Deltarune, so it makes sense that this reference with land. But if this is meant to have an in canon explanation. Uh, the more basic option is that, uh, you know, Toriel seems like the kind of person who would probably throw a bake sale, so maybe Chris has been to them before. But an another option is that this is further evidence of the time loop theory that I've discussed, which is, you know, it's recurring because after you beat the game and come back here, it's a recurring bake sale. So, another little option. Um... I think I'm gonna take a break from here. I, I wanted to get to uh, I wanted to get through the forest before taking another break, but I I'm tired. So ugh, I'll see you guys in the next recording session.